equals success. Learn more at boe.ca.gov. Together, we're supporting our communities and funding a better quality of life. Are you planning on traveling out of the country soon? Finally taking that dream vacation? Or is your company sending you overseas on business? When traveling, a lot of us like to bring something home. Maybe a lot of things. But there is something you should know about your foreign purchases. You may owe use tax. Hand-carried items or purchases you ship into California could be subject to use tax. Use tax is similar to the sales tax you pay when making purchases in California. Typically, use tax is owed when you buy from out of state or online sellers where sales tax is not charged. Or when taking a trip abroad, it's easy to pay use tax. Just report and pay it on your state income tax return. The revenue collected from use tax helps pay for California services like public safety, health care, and schools. So, have a great time, but don't forget to keep track of what you buy because you may owe use tax. Now you're ready for that next big adventure. To learn more, visit boe.ca.gov. Paying your use tax. Good for you, good for California. It's easy to buy things online these days, but did you know you may need to pay tax on those items? Really? It's called use tax. And just like sales tax, the use tax you pay to California will help fund important services like public safety, healthcare, and schools. But how do you know if you owe use tax? When you buy things online, look to see if you were charged tax when you checked out. If you weren't, you may owe use tax. It's easy to figure out how little you may owe. For most purchases, you don't even have to save your receipts. Just use this convenient use tax table, available in your income tax instructions. Find your adjusted gross income to see how much you may owe, and enter that amount when preparing your state income taxes. It's that simple. No looking through files and no hassles. You've paid your use tax for the whole year. That was easy. Paying your use tax. Good for you. Good for California. We're committed to supporting our communities, teaming up with businesses large and small, improving our roads and schools, investing in law enforcement and our environment. Together, we're funding a better quality of life. We're the California State Board of Equalization. The BOE was created in 1879 to equalize property tax assessment practices throughout California. Our responsibility has grown quite a bit since then. Today, the BOE administers more than 30 taxes and fees that provide one-third of all the revenue generated in our great state. And we're efficient. More than 99% of the money you contribute supports services and programs that benefit all of us in California. When you drive down our many highways, see a police officer helping someone in need, or enjoy a walk along a pristine beach, think about what makes it possible. Whether you're a business owner, making a purchase, or just filling up your gas tank, your contributions are important to our state's economic health. And the greatest part, we're doing it together. We're ready to work with you. Take advantage of our free seminars, helpful classes, instructional videos, and mobile applications. Also, use our online services. It's easy to do business with us from anywhere, at any time. Our partnership equals success. Learn more at boe.ca.gov. Together, we're supporting our communities and funding a better quality of life.
All right, it looks like it's showtime. Welcome to the State Board of Equalization. Ms. Richmond, will you sp please call the roll? Chairwoman Harkey. Here. Ms. Ma. Here. Mr. Renner. Here. Mr. Horton. Here. Ms. Dowers. Here. Okay. Quorum's been mm -hmm. called. Um, and we are now called to order. We'll commence with the Pledge of Allegiance led by Sergeant Hawthorne Bunny, Bunny Clay. Ms. Clay served the Army National Guard in Los Alamitos and Long Beach. Ms. Clay is a veteran with 20 years of service. Please face the flag. Place your right hand over your heart. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you so much. Did I pronounce your first name properly? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yes. All right. Uh, Ms. Richmond, please introduce our first item. Our first item on this morning's agenda is item B, Corporate Franchise and Personal Income Tax Appeals Hearings. Item B1, Mario Catton, please come forward. Board Proceedings has received contribution disclosure forms for today's hearings from the parties, participants, and agents. All forms were properly completed and signed, and no disqualifying contributions were disclosed. All parties, participants, and agents are on the alpha listings provided to your office. Each person sitting at the table will be asked to introduce themselves and, if necessary, their affiliation with the taxpayer for the record. Ten minutes is allocated for the taxpayer's opening presentation, followed by ten minutes for the Franchise Tax Board or Department's presentation, and five minutes is allocated to the taxpayer for rebuttal. Chairwoman Harkey. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Johnson, in appeals, will you please introduce the issues in the case? Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the board. John Johnson with appeals. Uh, the issue before the board in this appeal is whether appellant abandoned his California domicile and residency in October of 2009. Thank you. <coughs> to the appellants, welcome to the State Board of Equalization. You have 10 minutes to make your initial presentation, and we will have another five minutes on rebuttal. Please introduce yourselves for the record. Good morning. I'm Jeffrey Helfer, H-E-L-F-E-R, and I'm here with Mr. Catan, Mario Catan my friend and my client. Um, we're here today because of uh, trying to hope that the board will listen to a set of facts that's quite different than um, many cases that I've dealt with before. Um, it's about family. Uh, Mario, who's my friend, uh, lost his wife. She had passed away several years ago, and she was from Taiwan. Um, she had asked Mario, uh, as one of her wishes, that he would take their child and at some point in time um, have him go to live with their grandparents in Taiwan, um, get educated, uh, know her culture. Uh, as a friend of Mario's, uh, also having a wife who had passed away from cancer with me having young children, we spent a good amount of time talking about what it would be like for his son, Neo, who's here today, uh, to relocate to live with the family in China. During the summer of 2009, the grandparents uh, met with Mario and Neo, Neo is spelled N-E-O, in Germany on a vacation. Um, after the summer, during the fall, the grandparents visited the United States and decided that the time was right to make a move to Taiwan. Uh, the grandparents purchased a one-way ticket for, Mr. for Mario and his son, Neo, and they decided to move in October of 2009, the grandparents with Mario, his son, and other family members boxed up their belongings and they began the, the journey to Taiwan. 
uh, Neo, who is here today, uh, they just flew in from Taiwan, um, I think, two days ago to be here at the hearing. They're leaving after the hearing, but we felt it was important that they be here today for any member of the board to ask them any questions about what took place. Um, they made the move in October, and uh, Mar Neo's birthday was at the end of October, and it was a very difficult period of time. Uh, Mario decided that the initial shock was a little bit too much, so they decided to go back to the United States for Neo's birthday, which was also at the end of October, the Thanksgiving holiday and Christmas, and then go back to Taiwan. The move, the relocation took place in October. Um, during the October trip, Mario had enrolled his son in school in Taiwan, and we presented documents to that effect. They also de-enrolled him from his school in Los Angeles in October. When they revisited the United States, Neo did not go back to school. He stayed with the family. Um, Mario and his son fortunately were able to live with the parents, the, the grandparents. They had a condominium in Taiwan and there was a guest condominium for Mario to stay at. Um, Neo was going to live in the home of the grandparents. Now Mario had come to the United States with his mother and sister um, many years ago and established some business relationships in, in Los Angeles. Um, the difficult part for Mario was that he was going to continue to support his mother, his sister, and the sister's children in Los Angeles while he was living in Taiwan. To do that, it was necessary for him to maintain his business in Los Angeles, to continue to support his mom, his sister, and children while he was in Taiwan. Um, it was a very hard for Mario to accomplish this because his mom is elderly and his sister had no business background. So although they moved in October, the intent was to continually support his family, his mom, his sister, and children in the U.S. So Neo began school in Taiwan and it was very difficult for him. The English the Chinese culture was difficult. It was also hard for Mario because the family business that his, his spouse had um, was just not something Mario wanted to do. And after several months, he made a decision that this just wasn't going to work out. Now, Neo, because his mother was Taiwanese, was able to get a, a Chinese passport. Because the spouse was deceased, Mario was not able to get a passport, a Chinese passport. It was necessary for Mario to get a work visa. A work visa is a visa that will require, that will allow someone to stay there for a certain period of time, and the process is implemented and executed by the company. Uh, Mario was told that the easiest way for the transition would, would be to get a tourist visa, so he'd be able to go to Taiwan for 60 days, then he would leave for a 24-hour period and then come back to Taiwan um, while this work visa application was being processed in Taiwan. Now the Franchise Tax Board has uh, been very professional and they've handled their position quite well, but unfortunately they're citing a case that they rely upon, a noble case, which if you look at the facts it is so significantly different because Taiwan is not the United States. And when people move to Taiwan, they don't get driver's licenses because they typically don't drive. Uh, where the family lived is not a cosmopolitan city. Uh, Mario established a bank account. Uh, Mario learned the business that the family over there had, but at the same time continually supported his parents, I mean his mom and his, sib and his sibling and children. So in 2010, Mario decided it was best for Neo to come back to the United States 
and they relocated back in 2010. Now, subsequently uh, to that date, Mario eventually bought a home in China, um, and he's had that home, I believe, since 2010, and he still has that home. Mario and Neo, uh, as Neo got a little bit older and became more emotionally ready, they did relocate out of the United States. It's been several years. Um, you know, we tried it to persuade the Franchise Tax Board that the facts are so different than these U.S. cases where people attempt to relocate to certain places, but they really aren't doing that, just like the Noble case. The Noble case is so significantly different, and I don't really think it's necessary to bore you with the facts, but it's a case where a husband and wife lived in Colorado, moved back to the United States, bought property in Colorado. Clearly, they didn't intend to be living in Colorado during a period when they sold certain stock and recognized uh, gain. Um, the issue here is whether Mr. Catan is responsible as a California resident when he sold stock in November of 2009. Uh, the move took place in October. Um, I, I asked them to fly in from Taiwan in case any of the board members wanted to talk directly to them about their experience and what happened because the facts as put together in the summary by the Franchise Tax Board, they're picking and choosing as advocates do what they need to to impress the board as to their position, but the reality here is that there's no facts similar to any cases that I've seen in California. Uh, this is a man who wanted to honor the wishes of his deceased spouse, moved Neo to Taiwan. They eventually established a home there, but in, at the time he was too, Neo was too young to be able to handle the emotional difficulty because when his wife passed away, Mario's mom and sister played a very big role in, in raising Neo and helping him through this tragedy, and the separation was just too difficult. Um, uh, um, I hope that the board can understand that these, these cases cited by the Franchise Tax Board where they list various elements of what it means to really uh, change domicile, um, uh, it, it, it doesn't happen when you move to another country as if it would be here in the United States. Um, in November of 2009, Mario had sold stock in which there was a capital gain. He paid his federal income tax, but since he was not living in the state of California, he was not required to report that to the state of California, and that's what this issue has been. Uh, we appreciate how the Franchise Tax Board has handled the case. They haven't been uh, difficult, and I'm sure that some of the persons I've spoken to were very empathetic to the, to the facts, but as advocates do, they, they try to prevail in cases, and, um, you know, here we have grandparents that are playing a big role in the life now of, of Neo, and they have been for many, many years since the death of their daughter. And in, in October, when the move took place, is when the domicile changed. And, you know, Mr. Catan is here if there are any questions, and, and also his son is here today. Um, and also would be open to answering any questions that the board may have. Thank you. We will now turn to the FTB for their presentation. Uh, you will have 10 minutes to make your presentation. We will return to the appellant for rebuttal. So please introduce yourselves for the record. Chairman Harkey, members of the board, good morning. My name is Ron Hofstell. Sitting with me is Jason Riley. Together we represent the Franchise Tax Board. On November 6, 2009, appellant awoke in his California home, saw his then nine-year-old son off the public elementary school he was attending, continued to use California addresses on all business and professional correspondence, including correspondence with banks and financial institutions, maintained his cell phone with an LA area code, operated his automobile, uh, operated his automobile and likely tended to his Southern California-based businesses, and importantly here, on November 6, 2009, sold publicly traded stock 
realizing a gain of approximately $2.3 million. As said earlier, it is this gain that's the subject of this appeal. And after allegedly becoming a non D resident and while physically present in California, the appellate renewed his California driver's license and formed Juicy Burger LLC. Juicy Burger opened its first store, opened its doors for the first time soon after appellate returned from his second trip in Taiwan in early 2010. On the other hand, despite allegedly planning a move to Taiwan for years, on November 6, 2009, other than the family that always existed in Taiwan, appellate had not established a single new connection to Taiwan. Appellant had not purchased or rented a home in Taiwan, obtain, obtained a Taiwanese bank account, personal cell phone, driver's license, or any type of government identification, and significantly, had not obtained the legal right to reside in Taiwan on a permanent basis from the Taiwanese government. It is undisputed that Appellant was a resident of California through October 10, 2009. Also, Appellate has taken the filing position that he was a resident of California for the entire 2010 tax year. Simply put, Appellate claims that he was a California non-resident from October 10, 2009 to December 31, 2009, a period of some 81 days. Specifically, at issue here is whether Appellate was a resident of California on November 6, 2009, the date he sold the stock. Since it's undisputed that appellate was physically present in California when the stock was sold, the gain would be subject to the California personal income tax if, on November 6, 2009, appellate was either domiciled in California or inside California for other than a temporary or transitory purpose. Domicile requires both physical presence in a particular locality and an intent to make it one's permanent abode. A change of domicile requires clear proof that appellate abandoned the old domicile and acquired a new one. Timing is important, especially in this case, that one may intend to move from California at some time in the future or is transitioning to move outside of California, does not make that person a domiciliary or resident of a place outside of California. Whether someone's in California for other than a temporary or transitory purpose is determined by weighing the taxpayer's connections with California against the taxpayer's connections with his alleged place of residence. Appellate claims that he became a non-resident on October 10, 2009 when, during a seven-day, six-night trip to Taiwan in which Appellate stayed in a hotel um, um, uh, and visited family, he was offered to work for his father-in-law at his Taiwanese co in the company. Appellate's actions are akin to visiting a family or family member outside of California, being offered an employment opportunity, asking the friend or family member if it would be okay to stay with them in the event you accept the job offer, then returning to California. These actions do not change my status as a California domiciliary and, re and resident, just like it did not change the appellate status as a California domiciliary and resident. <clears throat> as discussed previously, California law requires so much more to effectuate a change in domicile including the establishment of new permanent connections elsewhere and the abandonment of existing California connections. Respondent used his seven-day, six-night trip as transient in nature, especially in light of the fact that appellant gained no significant connections with Taiwan and failed to abandon any of his California connections with California. On November 6, 2009, appellate was physically present in California enjoying the benefits and protections of its laws and government. And at the same time, Appellate was not receiving any benefits or protections from Taiwan. Appellate remained domiciled in and a resident of California. By November 6, 2009, Appellate did not abandon any California connections, did not establish any significant connections with Taiwan, and importantly, while visiting Taiwan, Appellate's connections to California were always maintained at the ready. When we evaluate whether someone changes his domicile, the two words that are, more, that are most often associated with the change is permanent and abandoned. In this case, it's clear that Appellate's permanent connections, if not all his connections, are with California. As discussed above, his home was in California, his cars were registered in California, he renewed his California driver's license, his source of income was his California business interests, his contact information, whether it was his cell phone or mailing address, was California, and his son attended a California public elementary school and not a single California connection was abandoned by November 6, 2009. And in fact, all of his California connections were utilized by appellate throughout the time at issue. On the other hand, nothing about Taiwan was permanent. 
First, despite allegedly being in the works for years, appellate entered Taiwan on, November, on October 10, 2009 on a visa-exempted permit, which only allowed him to remain in Taiwan for 30 days and could not be renewed or adjusted. Then, on November 25, 2009, some three weeks after appellate sold the stock, Appellate received a Taiwanese visitor's visa from the Taiwanese offices in Los Angeles, which only allowed visits in increments of 60 days. Simply put, on November 6, 2009, Appellate did not even have the permission from the Taiwanese government to stay in Taiwan on a permanent basis. Further, his alleged five-month training period was a start, if at all, well after the November 6, 2009, and working in Taiwan would have likely been inconsistent with the permit issued by the appellate to, to, to the appellate by the Taiwanese the government. Likewise, while admitted to the Taiwanese school, appellate's son did not begin studying at that school until January 2010. Further, appellate never established a bank account, purchased or leased property, obtained a local personal cell phone and, and number, nor attained any type of government ID or the like, which would reflect that his presence in Taiwan was for a permanent basis. And in fact, when Appellate left Taiwan after a second trip to the country, which coincided with the grand opening of his Juicy Burger store in California, he did not have to abandon any Taiwanese connections except for his son's private elementary school to leave the country because he hadn't established any. Appellate is clearly domiciled in California. Likewise, it's clear that on November 6, 2009, Appellate was in California for other than a temporary transitory purpose. Visitors to California do not enroll their children in California public schools, continue to operate and start California businesses under California law, and renew California driver's licenses. These activities are consistent with the activities of California residents, and accordingly, Appellate is clearly a California resident. I just want to address a couple things that was said earlier. Um, you know, I can't imagine losing a spouse or, 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 or losing a mother at a very young, young age. Uh, but one of the things that, that I just want to point out to the board, if I didn't know, the death didn't happen directly you know, in, in, in the same time frame as the events here. It's my understanding that, that Mrs. Quintan um, had passed away some five years before uh, in this incident, you know, in, in these actions here. So I just want to put that in, 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 in time per day perspective. Second, you know, the school records speak to from themselves. We have both a letter from the office manager. We have uh, the actual school data records from the um, uh, school in Beverly Hills that shows that, that, that Neo was enrolled through um, either December or, or or January, depending on 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 on, on which one of the two the, the documents in you want to refer to, and secondly, um, you know I understand moving to another country in the country is traumatic, but the Taiwanese school was a Taiwanese American school where the instruction was in English, so uh, that, and, and that's one of the things that I want to put uh, forward. And then the other thing I want, I want to at the address in, you know, when we're looking at domicile and we're looking at residency. You know, um, I appreciate the fact that um, Appellate went outside um, of the United States, but we look at it from California's perspective, right? Are you in California and are you receiving the benefits of, and protections of the state? And in this case, that was the case. On November 6, 2009, when he sold the stock, he was here and he was receiving those benefits and protections. In conclusion, Appellate was physically present in California when he sold the publicly traded stock. His son was attending a public elementary school. And all of his contact information, whether it was either his California address or his cell phone, was a California area code. And Appellate took the filing position that he was a California resident for the entire 2010 tax year. And in fact, I have the schedule here. Appellate filed as a resident from 2010 to, through, through 2014. Um, um, and I'm not sure when he bought his home in Taiwan, but his filing status in, ca in California was the day, day residence for that period of five or six years. Um, on the other hand, from October 10, 2009 to October 16, 2009, Appellate occupies a Taiwanese hotel for six nights, and when he left Taiwan for California, and when he left California for Taiwan, he knew he would return to his California home in seven days. Further, by November 6, 2009, Appellate had not established a single new permanent connection to Taiwan, and importantly, Appellate did not even have the legal right to permanently reside in Taiwan. As such, we believe that Appellate's, assess that, that <coughs> appellate's assessment should be affirmed. Respondent's assessment should be affirmed. Excuse me. Thank you. 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 Thank you
Thank you. <clears throat> now I'll return to the appellant. You have five minutes for rebuttal. It's, it's very important that true information be communicated to the board. First of all, Mr. Katan did have a bank account in Taiwan during this period of time. Second, what's also important is Mr. Katan had was a partner in this Juicy Burger restaurant that he's referring to, but he was not working at the restaurant. His partner was the operator. And, and in response to his comment about the date of death of his uh, Mario spouse, um, uh, please keep in mind that when a person's mom passes away, it, it's dramatic not only for the child but for the family. And uh, it took time for the grieving process to take place. It also was important that when Mario went to Taiwan that these businesses that he had worked so hard to create continued to operate to support his mother and his sister who remained living in Los Angeles and their, his niece and nephew. So these comments to this boilerplate checklist of what the state of California looks at, there's no, there's no law, there's no cases that say that you have to abandon your businesses and you have to abandon your phone numbers and credit cards, especially with this man trying to support his mother and sister in the United States while he's taking uh, this new opportunity to, to move his child over to Taiwan. What's also important, which uh, counsel clearly was, spoke out of line, when you have a visa to visit another country, that is the legal right to be in this country. Mario had gone over to Taiwan with the proper documentation. He had a visa to be over there. He was going in a training program with the grandparents' business. The grandparents, once that determination was made, he was going to work in this business. A work permit would need to be issued. But he had all appropriate documents when he was over there. And, and these comments about uh, he, he was there for some other reason is, is ludicrous. And, and the reason I brought Mr. Catan and his son here today because there's a difference in the factual uh, communications to the board. And I think if, if the board wants to really uh, have any questions that need better answers, I think there's no one better than the individuals themselves because we did not have examination or cross-examination of, of the individuals. Um, you know, when people plan to relocate for certain reasons where it, it is being alleged by the Franchise Tax Board was to avoid tax, um, that could have been planned for if that were the case. But there's, there was no planning here. This was to relocate to another country that he didn't need a car there, he didn't need a driver's license, he did have a bank account, but he needed his businesses to support his family. And the businesses that he maintained in California, he was not operating these businesses. He had another individual partner, so he didn't have to be there. And if there was a grand opening of a restaurant, a, a, a burger place, if it's coincidental that he was there, uh, he was not working in these businesses. He had, he had created these businesses for his family to live on while he was abroad. Uh, to, to make these kind of allegations that this was purely uh, a short-term visit, uh, when they went to Taiwan, and you can ask Mr. Katan, uh, there, were, there was a condo, a family condo that Mario and his son were going to live in. Uh, Mario had indicated to me that they, they, it wasn't ready when they got there. It was too dirty and it was too dusty. So Neo stayed with the grandparents for this period and Mario stayed in a hotel. With credit cards, with currency, with having a bank account in Taiwan, it wasn't necessary for him to establish any further type of legal documentation or connections. This is a family. This is this is Neo's grandparents. It's not like Mario was moving to a country where he needed to be established uh, for the first time. The, the grandparents had visited California several times during that year, and this was a plan that was implemented early on in 2009 executed in October of 2009. Uh, you know, another comment, um, I presented a letter to council or some of the previous franchise tax board from the school district. Um, the de-enrollment process began, I believe, in October of 2009. Um, the letter that I had provided, uh, you know, is not clear enough, um, but 
you know, you apply for school, which Mario did for his son at the end of the year. October is when the school semester started for his son. There wasn't going to be classes starting in December or November of the school year. Uh, going to a new school, he had to fit into the program, which was to begin in, in January. It, it wasn't a, an option or a choice. Um, we clearly understand the elements of how the Franchise Tax Board looks at these types of cases. But there was no cases that we found similar to where someone is moving out of the country um, and trying to maintain his relationships in the United States. He wasn't abandoning them. He, wa he needed them to support his family here. So uh, all the facts are true as to what Mario had tried to establish, which was to maintain business here while he was living abroad with his son. So there was no, no dispute about that. Um, there's a lot of factual comments that were made today that um, I believe if those questions remain unanswered, Mr. Catan and his, his young son could, could answer these questions. Uh, I, I, uh, that they, they came here they, from... Excuse me. They can answer. They could answer any of them, but you've taken up their time. So if you want to turn it over to them, please feel free to do so. Um, I'm not sure how much is His left. time has expired. Okay. Time has expired. Thank you. Um, <coughs> Okay, thanks. Thank you very much, both sides. Uh, is there discussion, members? Yes, Member Runner. Just a couple of quick questions. Um, the uh, the bank account issue. Tell me. I mean, I, I think we must at least in my briefing, and I think from what the uh, FTB said, um, and then what we're hearing today seems to be at least a, a little bit in conflict. I have the reports um, here. Okay, let me let me go back to first the FTB. Where where did we get the information in regards to bank account? Um, I, I believe that they've argued it that 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 they didn't need to open up a bank account in Taiwan because um, we had suggested you have a bank account like we typically do when we do a mm -hmm. a residency audit. We ask for for at least when we when we're talk, when we're discussing a change in domicile at, at least the, the the traditional indicias of change of domicile, which is driver's license, uh, property transfers leases, um, uh, bank accounts, and the like. They didn't provide anything. Um, um, uh, and, 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 in, and in saying they didn't provide anything, they were like, they, 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 and they were alluding to, and I, I, in given time I can find it, and I think they even briefed the fact that, that, and that they hadn't opened up a bank account. If they had, it's news to me, it's the first time I'm seeing anything. But the, the, the implication was that um, uh, 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 they were receiving basically uh, 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 housing and food from the in-laws and no money, and there was no need for a bank account is what is, is the position that they were taking, at least early on. Okay. Okay. We have bank account statements from when they were over there. Uh, these statements were provided during the course of the communications with the Franchise Tax Board, and they're black and white. They are, they're here. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, let me just ask. Um, where 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 is your current residence? Right now, mm -hmm. in China, and in Lebanon, we also travel a little bit to Lebanon, but uh, we are we are in China most of the time. Because my understanding is, in some discussions that we've had with your representative, that you were identified as a Lebanese resident. Yeah. We travel to Lebanon a lot of times. You do you have a house in Lebanon? Yes. Okay. Um, The um, on this, if we were to take it, let me just the FTB sure. uh, on the um, <coughs> the time consideration that that you all are looking at and arguing is this is this time frame between October and the end of the year, December 29th, I believe. Uh, 2009 is a tax year at issue, and, yeah, and, right. and specifically, and we're looking at just November 6th, whether, whether or not they were, he was a, a a resident of California on, on, that on November day. 6th when he sold the stock. And and the facts, in terms of some of the other facts in regards to when he entered into a training program, all those mm -hmm. other things, um, may indeed help an argument for residency starting in December 29th. Or yes. whenever that take took place, except for the fact he took the filing position that he was a resident of California for 2010, so that he, would be a little inconsistent for on his part. Okay. Yeah. 
Let me ask about that. That was an error that I made. I'm a, I'm a CPA and I'm also uh, an attorney. Uh, I prepared that return for Mr. Catan, and that was a mistake. It should have been a part-time uh, return. Um, there was no prejudice to the state of California because they would have gotten the benefit of that, but that was clearly a mistake that I made, and uh, it shouldn't be held against Mr. Catan. Um, when our office does tax returns, our administration gets information. They put a return together. It gets in front of me. I take a look at it. Um, Mario was already back in the United States in 2011. That is when the return would have been due the following year. Um, it was just a, it was a mistake that I made um, because we didn't ever have this issue about the, fr the, the sale of the stock. It, it wasn't even a thought because there was never a discussion about the selling of the stock. And Mario has been a friend of mine for a long time. Mm -hmm. So there was it was just a mistake that I made, and um, it was due to the fact that the, a year had gone by and, and I, I, we didn't even think about it because we're, we're now talking toward the end, probably the end of October 2011, when the return would have been filed. But uh, that was by my era completely. It had nothing to do with uh, Mario. Okay. Um, you know, I, I can get the idea that visas, you may need some, some transitional visa work, you know, because you, again, you, you may intend to actually move somewhere, but you, you have to do that through a series of visa approvals and whatnot. I, 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 I get that. You don't automatically get a full-time residency visa when you decide to move somewhere. Um, I can even get the issue of some driver's license issue. If you indeed you're going to be coming back to the United States and you live somewhere else and driver's licenses aren't important there to maintain a driver's license in a place that you are going to be coming back to occasionally um, almost can, can make sense. Uh, the issue of businesses, you know, the fact is that you're not required to live in the state of California if you have a business. You certainly can operate a business and li live outside the state. Um, my concern is that the problem that I'm having is that the other side of that ledger, in terms of just activities of residency, um, just seem really thin to me. So that's kind of where I'm observing that um, in that issue. Thanks. Thank you. Members, is there any, are there any other questions? Uh, just a question, Ms. Madam Dowell. Chair. Just one question to the appellate. Um, you indicated you have bank statements in front of you. Yes. What's the dates of those bank statements? Some of this is in Chinese. I'm sorry. We're, we're trying to decipher the date from here. Um, this looks like. Give us one second. I'm, we have the statement, but I'm trying okay. to. I'm also going to ask, um, Mike, you might want to be ready to um, let me know when those accounts were opened. Okay. And does FTB have copies of those accounts? Give us one moment, please. Chinese. These are Chinese to a large extent. We're just trying to figure out which, which which would be the date. While, while we look well, while through they look, that, I, while we ponder, are there any other any other board members that have any comments? No. Okay. Um, well, uh, that, that's that's okay. Um, 
that's okay, sir. Um, I, I, I take your word for it that you do have obviously some kind of bank statements. We just don't know when they were opened. Um, just an observation on my part. Um, when it comes to a change in domicile, the burden is on the on the taxpayer to prove that they actually changed their domicile. The burden of proof is placed on them. And understanding your testimony and what the plan was, was to for Mr. Katan and his son to move to Taiwan. But based on what I'm looking at in the file, I'm not seeing that that burden of proof has been established. What's, you know, I understand that a, a, a individual does not have to abandon all of their business interests in California in order to change their domicile. As a matter of fact, we would like for your business to continue to grow. <coughs> um, but what's really looking, what I'm really focusing on is that um, the individuals, your clients were only there for a week and by your own testimony, Mr. Canton stayed at a hotel and my reading of the law analysis of various cases when you stand at a hotel, that's more of a temporary and transitory purpose. And then to couple with the fact that the actual school records indicate that the minor child was still enrolled in the California public school and returned to that school after the one week trip and was attending that California public school when the stock was sold, benefiting from California. That all leads me to the conclusion that the domicile continued to be California when the stock was sold in November of 2009. And the residency was also California at that time. That's my comment. Thank you. Members, any other comment? Is there a motion? Move to sustain the Franchise Tax Board. Second. Any objection? So moved, uh, I regrettably, uh, we've moved to, to sustain the Franchise Tax Board and uh, the record will show so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Richmond, will you please introduce the next item? Since B2 has waived their appearance, our next item is C, Sales and Use Tax Appeals Hearings. Item C2, ISA and Estate, Inc., please come forward. Mr. Anjija with appeals, will you please introduce the issue in this case? Good morning, Madam Chair and members. The appeal before you presents one unresolved issue, which is whether relief from the 40% penalty for failing to remit collected tax reimbursement is warranted. Thank you. To the petitioners or appellants, um, welcome to the Board of Equalization. You have 10 minutes to make your initial presentation, and you will have five minutes on rebuttal. Please introduce yourselves for the record. Uh, Chairwoman Harkey, my name is Mark Brandeis, CPA representative for the petitioner. To my left is Mr. Greg Reynolds, CPA, also representative for the petitioner. And to his left is Mr. Ted Garcia, the petitioner in this case. The matter that we're here to protest is the application of the 40% evasion penalty under Revenue Taxation Code 6597. We believe that the penalty is unwarranted in this case, that the petitioner never intentionally underreported uh, his taxable measure. Uh, we were not the initial representatives in this case, and so we weren't involved until after the decision of recommendation was issued. So unfortunately, we didn't attend a lot of the hearings and a lot of the uh, meetings between 
uh, the taxpayer and the board. So for that reason, we brought the taxpayer with us, and I would like to have him explain in his own words what the facts and circumstances were leading up to the issuance of the DNR. So Thank with you. that, Mr. Ted Garcia, Mr. Garcia. Um, hello, members of the board. My name is Tony Garcia. I'm the owner of Spoon's Restaurant. Um, I'm going to try to keep it within three minutes just to give you a, a series of events that happened during the um, audit period that eventually that's what I'm here for. Um, when I bought Spoon's Grill and Bar, it was a, it was a franchise. I, was a, I bought it as an investor. It was a franchisee. Um, um, so um, when I bought it, I had all the support from the franchise store. Um, they helped me build my team, my CPA. Um, they already had a manager in place at that particular store because I basically took over one of their stores. They, they had 18 restaurants at that time. And, um, and so it was very, very convenient for me just to take over, I pay them, and things were good. Um, like I said, the CPA kept all my, my, um, my numbers in place. So what happened after two years, um, you know, things were doing, like I said, things were going great. Um, I had a strong team, sales revenue were good. Uh, after two years, uh, the uh, franchisor filed for bankruptcy. So they basically um, took all the support away from me. Um, at that time, I had just uh, had my second child, and um, everything just started kind of going downwards for me. Um, so after they, uh, after the franchisor uh, couldn't support me anymore, I basically, uh, I basically was forced to uh, get involved as an operator, which was not basically my intent when I bought this place. Um, and so it was very difficult. Uh, the, the recession started right around that time, 2009, and I'm in a hotel, my, my address is on Hotel Terrace, which is I'm in a hotel plaza. Uh, I basically, I'm surrounded by seven hotels. And so when the uh, recession started, uh, it, was very, it was very hard on the hotels as well because uh, their occupancy rates went down tremendously and 85% of my business depends on, the ho on those hotels. So here I am, um, my early 30s, a young family, all of a sudden forced to get involved in the business. And obviously I had to do it. I had no problem doing it. I had paid a lot of money for this restaurant and you know, obviously I didn't want to lose that. So when it came to um, you know, survive, uh, survive the, 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 the recession, I had to eventually start doing everything myself, run the restaurant, do my books, uh, report my sales tax and everything. And, um, and basically that's what I thought I was doing. Um, when, when it was time to report my sales tax, I was going off of my POS reports that I, uh, that I was printing from my, from my restaurant. And at any uh, moment, I intended to under-report uh, my numbers. Like I said, I was just going off of those numbers uh, that were on the reports. Uh, whether I didn't know, maybe I, I might have just uh, not reported the right numbers off of those reports. But I, like I said, it was very, uh, it was very difficult for me just trying to survive. And, and that POS system, Aloha, it was something that I was not really familiar with because like I said, it just happened so rapidly. The, the franchisor uh, went, went out at the same time as everything was just collapsing. The Great Recession, the hotels were down, and so it was very difficult. So I had to let go of my CPA at that time. I couldn't afford him anymore. Um, and like I said, just things were just looking bad. And it was a scary situation because like I said, I, I had friends that, you know, um, were managing other restaurants, uh, big restaurants like El Torito and um, uh, Black Angus, and I mean, and those restaurants were closing left and right too, and I was just really freaking out. And I remember I even had to um, uh, just, uh, I, I have, um, I'm from Mexico, so I remember I had to go to Mexico and just talk to some family members I had out there to get some advice as to how I can just stay afloat. Like I said, my, my wife and 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 uh, and I were just trying to keep it going, but to make it uh, short now, uh, it was very difficult. But again, um, I um, I reported off of my POS reports, and when I got the audit letter, uh, the first thing I did was to gather everything they asked for. Um, 
all the POs reports, my bank statements, my tax returns, everything, and I submitted everything. When I was uh, review reviewing everything with my uh, tax lady, uh, we realized that obviously the the amount that we had reported on our on my tax returns and the POS reports were not were not obviously matching. But again, it was just due to the fact that I was probably not experienced enough with those reports, and I and I we we, we realized that it was uh, it was not matching the numbers. But again, at that point, I, I never intended to uh, underreport. Uh, the first representative that I that I hired, um, I had to get this friend. Uh, uh, actually, this this person was referred to me by a friend, and when I met with them, I basically explained to him everything that had happened. And so I, I never uh, I was not there when he met with the auditor. So I don't know if he missed. Uh, I don't know why it was stated that I I intentionally underreported when that was not the case. Um, um, At that time, I had uh, 23 employees. Um, I, I can honestly say that I didn't have to lay anybody. I, I did have to reduce some of the R, uh, some of the hours because I, I, um, I understood they had families and kids and everything. So again, I, I did everything possible just to survive, and I think I, I did a good job. I'm still in business, but uh, I'm here to humbly uh, humbly request to uh, obviously remove the 40 percent. Uh, penalty because, like I said, I, I never intended to underreport. I, I just did everything I could to stay to stay open, based on all the circumstances. Thank you to the department. Uh, do we? Do we uh, still oh, excuse have, me. I'm sorry. Is our time up? Do we have? No, time? your time's not up. Okay. Um, I just like to know. sort of add, add on to what Mr. Garcia had said. So when he gets the, the audit notice, he does like what any taxpayer would do. He's trying to prepare for. The initial meeting with the uh, with the auditor, and as you heard in his testimony, it was during that time that he realized that there was uh, uh, underreporting, a significant underreporting, and so he reached out for professional representation. And um, again, I wasn't there. I don't know how things were conveyed to the initial representative. That initial representative went to the uh, meeting, the initial meeting with the auditor. But their intention was to disclose all the underreporting. It wasn't intentional, but they went there for the purpose of saying, here's our POS re reports, here's our records, uh, and it wasn't intentional. And I mean, it's inconsistent with fraud to keep good records. And Mr. Garcia kept ex excellent records. Um, but again, we don't know how it was conveyed. Uh, when we look at the comments in the 414Z, we provided you guys a copy of the comments in the 414Z. Uh, it says here that the taxpayer acknowledged that there was um, underreporting, intentional underreporting. But we don't, you know, that word acknowledge bothers me a little bit because we don't know. It's a little bit vague. Was it suggested by the auditor and acknowledged by the initial representative? We, we, we don't know. We, we weren't there. Um, but then when you read the comments that make its way into the audit report, um, specifically, let's look at Schedule 12A. Uh, I'm going to read this as quickly as possible. It says, the taxpayer's POS uh, system sales reports provide tax collected per category sold. All items sold by taxpayer were taxable. Auditor compared recorded tax collected to the tax report in the audit period. Differences were noted. Um, since the taxpayer reported the correct gross sales, it is possible that tax, I mean, since the tax, taxpayer reported the correct gross sales, I mean, these are comments that are inconsistent with fraud. This is right out of the audit working papers. The verification comments under reporting method, a point of sale system report is printed out for each quarter. Taxpayer uses the report on the sales and use tax return. That's inconsistent with fraud. If you're committing fraud, you don't use the point of sale reports to report your numbers. You, you do some other method. But whatever that intentional other method was, not only is it not documented, but, the, but how the reporting is completely inconsistent with evasion. We get to the report of discussion of audit findings of BOE 836. Staff's position. 
This is under staff's position. According to the taxpayer's representative, the taxpayer used the summary information from the POS system to report sales on the sales and use tax return. But there's no mention of any, any other method. The DNR it says largely the same thing. So basically all, all along the appeals process, the board is acknowledging that the taxpayer is reporting based off their POS reports. There's no other method, uh, reporting method documented or even asserted. One of our other concerns is that the taxpayer is treated uniformly and fairly under the laws. The Taxpayer Bill of Rights says that the taxpayer will be treated fairly and the law will be administrated uniformly. In our research, we came across a case that was about seven months ago, a case with Kabir, where in that particular case, there was very similar circumstances, and the taxpayer was assessed a 10% negligence penalty, which was abated at the hearing. In this case, there's a 40% penalty with the allegation of fraud. If we compare, and I think we handed out an exhibit between the two cases, if we just go down quickly and look at the two cases, this helps to show that there appears to be an inconsistent application of how audit methods are employed as well as how the law is being applied by the department. In the Kabir case, the books and records were not provided. Mr. Kabir said he did provide uh, guest checks in little envelopes one month at a time. In our case, all the records were provided, including the point of sales information. The unreported tax of my in the Kabir case was 703 thousand in our case it was 1.3 million the percentage of understatement in our case is 48.61 in the Kabir case it was 61 percent and Mr. Scott Lambert said that there might have even been more under reporting if they would have used the credit card cash ratio time's expired okay thank you okay to the department you have 10 minutes Please introduce yourself to the for the record. Good morning, Chairwoman, board members. My name is Monica Silva. Too far away. There you go. My name is Monica Silva, and with me is uh, Mr. Robert Tucker and Mr. Kevin Hanks, and we're representing the department this morning. The department is in agreement with the recommendation of the appeals division that it has met its burden with respect to the application of the penalty for failure to remit collected sales tax reimbursement, and there's no reasonable cause or circumstance for relief of the penalty. Section 6597 provides that any person who knowingly collects sales tax reimbursement and fails to timely pay that tax reimbursement to the board shall be liable for a penalty of 40% of the amount not timely paid unless the liability for the unpaid tax or tax reimbursement averages $1,000 or less or does not exceed 5% of the total amount of the tax liability collected for the period. Additionally, Section 6597 provides that the penalty shall be relieved if the person's failure to make a timely payment of sales tax reimbursement is due to a reasonable cause or circumstance beyond the person's control and occurred notwithstanding the exercise of ordinary care and the absence of willful neglect. The 40% penalty constitutes an evasion penalty and requires proof of fraud or intent to evade. Fraud or intent to evade must be established by clear and convincing evidence and is applied if it can be shown that the petitioner not only failed to fulfill certain duties, but such failure was intentional and for the purpose of evading part or all of the tax amounts required to be paid. In this matter, upon audit, the, the department examined petitioner's books and records and determined that petitioner's sales and sales tax reimbursement as recorded in its point of sale system were accurate for the entire audit period. There is no dispute that the petitioner relied on its point of sale system to calculate sales tax reimbursement during the audit period and actually collected the amount from its customers. Specifically, for purposes of applying the 40% penalty, petitioner collected $207,032 in sales tax reimbursement for the fourth quarter of 2009 to the first quarter of 2012, but only reported $90,589 in sales tax reimbursement. This resulted in unremitted sales tax reimbursement collected but not paid of $116,443. In fact, Mr. Garcia has admitted that sales tax reimbursement was collected during the audit period and that he knowingly failed to pay the full amount that was collected to the board. Specifically, that after the second quarter of 2009, petitioner reported and remitted less tax reimbursement than it collected because it used some of the 
tax reimbursements for business expenses and Mr. Garcia's personal expenses, which appear to include auto, travel, and mortgage payments. The explanation petitioner offered for underreporting petitioner's taxable sales was an economic downturn and that Mr. Garcia's wife had lost her job in 2009. As a result, Mr. Garcia prepared sales and used tax returns and intentionally understated petitioner's taxable sales. These facts established by clear and convincing evidence that notwithstanding petitioner's knowledge of its obligation to record and report its sales and use tax accurately and knowledge of the correct amount of petitioner's taxable sales, petitioner consistently and intentionally failed to report and remit all the tax reimbursement it collected from its customers. The department has met its burden and properly applied the 40% penalty. Petitioners contending that the penalty should be relieved due to reasonable cause or circumstance beyond its control. Section 6597 does provide relief from the imposition of penalty in those circumstances, and it sets forth in that section that reasonable cause or circumstance beyond a person's control is includes but not limited to serious death, an emergency, a national disaster, the board failed to send returns um, to the correct address, uh, failure to timely remit only occurred um, in small amounts of time, or the person voluntarily corrected errors in remitting sales tax reimbursement and remit remitted payment of the liability owed as a result of those errors prior to being contacted by the board regarding errors. Contrary to petitioner's attempts to show otherwise, petitioner did not voluntarily correct the error and remit payment until it was contacted by the, or the board regarding the audit. Petitioner received an audit engagement letter dated June 13, 2012. That letter informed petitioner that its account had been selected for a routine audit, and the letter provided that the audit would involve a review of petitioner's books and records for the period uh, second quarter 2009 to first quarter 2012 to verify if petitioner had neither underpaid nor overpaid its sales and use tax li liability. According to the BOE assignment activity history, petitioner did not inform the department of its failure to remit the sales tax reimbursement until the department visited petitioner's location and reviewed petitioner's records on July 17, 2012. That was a month after the audit engagement letter and after the department spoke with petitioner via telephone on June 28, 2012 to schedule the audit appointment. Petitioner simply did not remit all the tax reimbursement collected because it used the monies to pay business and personal expenses. Therefore, the facts do not establish that petitioner's failure to timely remit the sales tax reimbursement it collected was due to reasonable cause and circumstance beyond its control. In fact, to the contrary, the facts established that for nearly three years, petitioner had every opportunity to voluntarily correct its underreporting of sales tax reimbursement, and it did not. It appears petitioner only volunteered the information when it became apparent that the discovery was imminent. Additionally, there's no merit to petitioner's newest argument that the previous case, the Kabir case, somehow establishes that there's unequal and inequitable treatment of taxpayers. First, the Kabir case is not precedential. Second, the facts of the case before you today fit squarely within the statutory requirements of Section 6597 and are not similar to the Kabir case as petitioner would have you believe. The cases are different. The Kabir case involved inadequate sales records, the audit liability was established using a credit card method, and a negligence penalty was applied. Fraud is not merely an error ratio, nor the amount of records provided. The department examines each case to determine if a penalty is warranted. With respect to an evasion penalty, the audit manual provides that evasion is a step beyond negligence. When negligence penalties are recommended, the facts should indicate that the taxpayer failed to exercise due care. The evasion penalties, on the other hand, are to be applied if it can be shown that the taxpayer not only failed to fulfill certain duties, but such failure was intentional and for the purpose of evading part or all of the true tax liability. Here, Mr. Garcia failed to fulfill his duty to remit all the sales tax reimbursement collected, and such failure was admittedly intentional and for the purpose of evading part of the true tax liability and any comparison to another case does not diminish the fraudulent con conduct. For these reasons, the department is in agreement with the appeals division's recommendation that the 40% penalty was properly applied in this manner. Thank you. On rebuttal. First of all, uh, when a taxpayer is, generally speaking, engaged in committing fraud, uh, tax evasion, they don't keep good records. Anybody who's been an auditor knows that, that generally speaking, you don't get any records. Um, in this case, the taxpayers kept excellent records. He discovered the underreporting when he was preparing for the initial meeting with the auditor. 
There was no intent during the period of time that he was reporting to under-report. He's not an accountant. He was overburdened. He was wearing too many hats uh, trying to run the business, and internal controls broke down. But fraudulent taxpayers don't meet with board members, but board auditors and provide excellent books and records and lay out for the board auditor the underreporting. This audit was done in lightning speed, four or five weeks. If you look at the 414Z, that's unheard of. Why was the audit done so quickly? Because he turned over excellent books and records. The audit is based entirely on comparing uh, the POS reports to the reported amounts. This isn't the act of a fraudulent person. This isn't the act of a person who's trying to commit evasion. Second, I will concede with the department that there are significant differences between Kabir and ISA. The first difference is that he provided books and records. He cooperated with the board. He tried to do the right thing. And his reward for doing so is a 40% evasion penalty. Is that the message that this body wants to send to the public? That if you cooperate with us, you're going to be severely punished? That is unjust and unequitable. The board put out, when the legislature created this, this new penalty, back in August of 2007, they created a special notice, the new 40% penalty. And in that notice, they state the penalty will not be assessed if any of the following apply. We've provided this special notice to you. If you look at the fourth bullet point, the taxpayer voluntarily reported or corrected errors before being contacted by the BOE. Now some will say, well, wait a second. He only did this after he was contacted by the BOE. And that's true. Why did he only became aware of it after he was contacted and in, in his attempts to prepare for the meeting? But at the time that the BOE contacted him, they had no knowledge of this underreporting. They had no, no knowledge that this had occurred. And he could have played a game with the auditors like so many taxpayers do. I don't have the records. Catch me if you can. He didn't do any of that. He, voluntarily, he volunteered the information. This is not the act of a fraudulent person. The department has made a, a statement that there was admitted fraud. And we've just heard Mr. Garcia, Tony Garcia, state that uh, he was not aware that there was none reporting. Uh, he was in error when reporting from his POSs. So, you know, we take exception to that claim. And it appears when Mr. Brandheide has gone through all of the various reports that were prepared by the agency up until the DNR, that most of the comments that were made concerning this issue were from the audit staff and seemed to keep going on and on from the original audit verification comments and were also made by the taxpayer's representative rather than the taxpayer himself. The taxpayer has maintained that um, he did not act intentionally in the underreporting. So we find that there really is insufficient direct evidence in the way of any kind of a confession. And we would also claim that there is insufficient circumstantial evidence to render a decision of maintaining the 6597 fraud penalty. Thank you. Members? Yes. Member Mo. Yes, thank you. Um, who is Mr. Ted? It's Tony. Ted no, Beaver. Ted, oh, Ted Beaver. Oh, I'm sorry. Ted Beaver is the uh, person I hired to represent me when I first got the audit letter. Okay. So I guess in the audit work paper, it's assignment activity uh, history. It said, Ted acknowledged that the taxpayer intentionally unreported gross sales. Yeah, like I said, he's the person that I met with uh, uh, initially when I got the letter, so I explained my situation. So like I said, I never intended uh, to for him to say that. I don't know why he said that or how he got that, but I was not there. Okay. So he, you no longer work with him? Um, okay. So um, when you talk about your POS system, did you report consistently uh, when you were filing your sales taxes? Did you use like a certain 
line off of your POS or um, explain to me how you filed your sales taxes? Well, like I said, uh, I basically just took over the restaurant. The restaurant had been there since 87, so it's, uh, it's an old system. Everything's old. Uh, printers, POS, the terminals. So uh, when the franchisor uh, was not around anymore, I basically just opened the, uh, every time it was time for to file my taxes, I would just open and then, you know, uh, there was a section that said um, sales or something like that. I can't remember what it was because I changed the system. It's been a while, but I basically just went off of a number that was on one of the reports there. So was it consistent that you used the same that number same off number, of the report? That from that same line or, yeah, it was like that. a section there, and that's what I would go off of every every tax filing. So that's the number that I would go. I would go up in their report and, and then just get it from that line. Okay. Um, did you guys review it? Is that consistent? We, we, we have not seen it. We haven't seen it. Okay. Um, Okay, so, so that's what you thought was correct, whatever was on your PO system. Yes. And um, it said that the tax rate changed in second quarter of 09 from 7.75 to 8.75. Um, were you aware that the tax rate changed? No. Okay. Okay. That's all my questions for now. Yes, Member Brunner. Yeah, a couple of questions. Um, uh, uh, that I'm trying to get understanding is kind of some of the some of the testimony here versus what I what I have in my notes. Um, one is did I hear? I thought I heard somebody say that the correct a gross amount was reported. That's that's correct. Where was that's, that reported? It's in one of the audit. The correct comments. gross amount, I believe, was reported on the federal income tax returns. Okay. But that the sales and use tax returns were not reported. Okay. The same. So is that is that my, your understanding too? Just make it clear. No, so. if you go to uh, Schedule 12A, uh, the auditor's comments, mm -hmm. it says on in the auditor's comments, since the taxpayer reported the correct gross sales, comma, it is possible that the tax rate was not changed in the system yet. These are the board. This is comments. in reference to the. Well, let me don't answer. This that is question. in reference to the second quarter of 09, not the entire audit. This little comment is is commented to the tax rate change in the second quarter of 09. It's an explanation. Okay. Uh, maybe Mr. Hanks can that's, go ahead. That's, go ahead. Co that's correct. And, and that's not the period where the 40% penalty applies. Okay. So, second so this quarter particular of issue is, is in irrelevant. terms of that statement in regards to the, to, to the um, gross sales reporting is not subject to the issue of the 40%. Correct. Correct. Okay. correct. In fact, there's no taxable difference for that quarter. Okay. Okay. So do, you, do you agree or not agree with that? You know, that that's that's probable that it, that it does apply just to that second quarter. But again, we we don't know. We weren't there. But when you read the so I need do I need to ask the taxpayer then if you weren't there, who can answer he, that? He wasn't there either. He wasn't at any of the in any of the meetings until until the DNR. Well, let me ask you this way then: Were the gross sales correctly um, addressed in the BOE filings? He did not report the correct gross receipts. Okay, thank you. that's all I needed. Okay, that's that's fine because that's what I was getting confused about, and now we've established they weren't cor correctly. Except okay. for second quarter or not. Right, right, right. Okay, so let me go back to that if uh, to that issue. Um, when was it that the taxpayer discovered that he was getting the wrong line off the POS reports? When I turned in everything to uh, the, the person who um, was doing my taxes. And how did you discover that? Well, I, it wasn't me. It wasn't me. It was mainly the uh, CPA at that time. Who, how did he discover that it was the wrong amounts that were reported on the Well, I guess uh, when, they, when she compared the, the tax returns to the, uh, to the POS, uh, POS reports at that time, that's when she took the time to analyze them and say, you know, wait a minute, you know, that's... That's why they're saying, you know, that or we're, we're under, we're, it shows how, it was Ooh. clear at that time that it was. So they, sh so basically they looked at the tax return and saw that that was different than the BOE reports, so therefore there was a problem in reporting. So I guess for the federal tax returns, everything was reported correctly, all the sales, everything, uh, based off, you know, the, I guess the reports that she was getting, but mm -hmm. when I was re filing mine, I, I was not aware that I was not 
inputting the right numbers on the. Okay, did you keep a, keep a separate bank account for this particular restaurant? A separate bank account, bank account. From, from what? For the restaurant. How did from you my keep? Personal? Uh huh. Oh yes. Okay. Yes, yes. When you were doing that and you were reporting your sales, and you were depositing then this money into your bank, did you not? Un see in your reporting that there was a, that there was significant difference between what was putting deposited into your account versus what you're reporting. Now I know, understand not all things are reportable, but by the most part, it's a restaurant. Uh, did you not notice the difference as you were doing that? You mean the amount of money that was going into the account, right? Versus what I was reporting, right? Well, to tell you the truth, I I was on a survival mode. Remember, I, my business was, my, my revenue dropped 85%, the recession hit. It was during that time where it was out of control. Like I said, I was just basically thrown in there, go and do your best to keep your doors open. I was out of the picture before that, because again, it was a franchisor that was there for me. The CPA was there for me every day. I had two managers. So it was an investment for me. So I had no, I had no clue as to, oh, you know, my bank statement says this. and. But I'm reporting. I, I had no clue that I was doing it Who's, wrong. Who who was kind of writing the checks to your employees? Uh, for payroll, you mean? Mm -hmm. uh, I think we had ADP, a payroll company. But who was approving them and sending them to the payroll? The manager, a manager that was there before. You weren't involved with I any of the payments involved, for anything. I was not involved at all. With your checks, we weren't, weren't signing checks. Uh, I was probably signing just the vendor checks. You know. Uh, People that delivers our grocery or uh, stuff like that, but not. Did you take a know. draw during that time? How did you get paid? Um, I think I was on payroll too. Based on my corporation, I have to get a small. Okay. Okay. Let me ask you this: When, when, so this was discovered at a certain point in time. Um, when, when did, when? Well, let me go back to the department. Do we know when then that there was a when, when all of a sudden say the the. The uh, reporting was corrected, and correct amounts were then identified and paid. There were no um, return returns filed. There are no amended returns filed. No, this is a audit liability, and they have made some payments on the audit liability, okay. but they never went in and corrected and and filed um, new returns. So through the the end of the audit period, through the first quarter of 2012, the petitioner was was underreporting still. Um, he was underreporting as he had already identified the fact that they were underreporting. I mean, they had when. So from the period fourth quarter of, of 2009 through the first quarter of, of 2012, the center reporting averaged approximately 50 percent mm -hmm. uh, for each quarter that, that the taxpayer was reporting to us. The information that, that was supplied to us at the time of the appeals conference was that the taxpayer was reporting amounts from his bank statements, not from his POS um, reporting. We understand the POS reporting, however, captured correctly the the amount of sales tax reimbursement that the business was charging okay. and collecting. Okay. Do you have a Do you have a copy of your POS report as to where it is that you got your numbers or where that came I from? I have a copy now. Yeah. No. no. When we did the audit, um, we went back to the POS system. Yes. Yes. We examined. And that's the, the where POS it is. System. The auditor got their numbers. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions, members? Uh, yes, Chairman. Thank you, Member Stowers. Um, um, to the department, um, could you clarify the, we're looking at 409 to March 2012. So the period prior to April 2009, was there any understatement? Was tax collected? No, 100% resubmitted submitted to the department. For the second quarter of 09, it was. For the third quarter, it was not, but it did not meet the 40%, um, the requirements for the 40% penalty. Okay. It started with the third quarter. It started with the third quarter. And at the conclusion, after March 31st, 2012, was, did you guys have that, have those periods been looked at? Was there any underreporting for those periods? After, the, after this audit period. Right. I didn't look for periods following um, 2012. I'm anticipating the, the taxpayer 
started to correctly report after after that period of time, but I can't tell you for sure. Okay. And to the petitioner, um, you provide us with your exhibits, and I see there are some comments from a previous representative. Now, he was the authorized representative, authorized to represent um, Mr. Garcia here with the signing power of attorney? Yes. Correct? Am I, yes. is that? I believe that. You're talking Mr. Ted Beavis. Yes. Yeah. He was a previous uh, authorized representative. Authorized representative. So um, when he was representing your client, he indicated that some of the collected taxes was used to pay business expenses. Do you have a comment on that? I wasn't privy to any of those conversations. Those were conversations between Mr. Garcia and Mr. Beaver, so he might be better to answer that. Mr. Garcia, can you speak to that? I'm sorry, can you repeat your question again? Um, your, your prior representative who mm -hmm. had a prior attorney authorized to represent you mm -hmm. indicated that some of the tax collected um, from the transactions were used to pay some of the business expenses during this time of economic downturn. Will you speak to that, please? Well, from what I recall during that time, uh, I was trying to keep just my doors open. So I, I was paying, yes, my vendors, my suppliers, my meat vendors, my grocery vendors, payroll. I mean, I was just paying all my business expenses with uh, with, with with my bank account. With, the, with your bank account, with the available funds in your bank account? And you mentioned this bank account. Well, I got you know it was it was crazy. Like I said, I got behind. I got behind everywhere with vendors, but I was making payments to just keep them providing to me. So, uh, but yeah, I was making payments to some of those. Uh, to some of those okay, vendors, yeah. through, but through your business bank account. Yes, the business account. Yes. Through your, best, your, yes. your business account, yes. and that would have been the same bank account where. Um, your sales would have gone through as as items were sold. Yes, that was the main account that, that I was. Paying all my business related transactions. Yes. Okay, great. Okay, thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Um, I, I have a few. I just, um, if the taxpayer discovered uh, under reporting after being notified in the audit, would you have accepted amended returns? Ms. Herkett, we typically don't accept amended returns at, at, upon notification of uh, an audit, commencement of an audit. Thank you. Uh, the next question, and this is this troubles me a lot. I, I don't say I don't think the department did anything wrong here, and I think they've dotted their I's and crossed their T's. My, but my big uh, question is, if the taxpayer would not have provided any books and records, what would have been the maximum penalty? Ms. Harkey, I don't think that the the outcome would have been any different. Um, the auditor would have would have performed the same sales tax accrual reconciliation that that was conducted. Um, so I think the the same examination of records would have taken place. Um, taxpayer was under an obligation to to disclose those records pursuant to Regulation 1698. So I, I think it was it would have been apparent to the department that we had large underreporting. They would have investigated, asked questions regarding that underreporting, and and um, when it was disclosed that that was intentional <laughs> underreporting, they would have likely recommended that that same. 40%. Okay, I, I think we see cases here all the time where there's no books and records and so we can't accuse of fraud. So explain that to me. Well, well, one point that should be considered is that there's nearly, it's $1,690,568 difference between what was reported on sales and use tax returns and on um, income tax returns. Right. So there, I mean, that's a basis right there. So. In some cases, perhaps what you're referring to, we've seen cases where no books and records are provided, but there may have been no um, income And no tax, tax returns. returns either? Correct. Okay, do you have anything to say to that? Because this 40% this penalty, if somebody comes clean, exactly. does trouble me, but I'm not sure, you know, if, if what we're hearing is, come on. M Mr. Garcia didn't prepare the income tax returns. His accountant did. And so the reason why the gross receipts on the income tax returns is more reflective of what um, is in the POS system is because he didn't do it. He hired professional uh, accountants to do that. Um, he, in retrospect, he probably should have hired professional accountants to prepare his sales and use tax returns, and he probably wouldn't have been in this scenario. Um, but to your comment earlier, when we look at Kabir, Kabir 
had no books and records, allegedly. According to the department's own assertions, the taxpayer didn't provide books and records. And his underreporting was, as the department picked it up, 61%, with comments by Mr. Scott Lambert that we'd conducted a secondary method and the uh, likely underreporting was even higher. We calculated, based on his comments, at 64%. So, again, there cases come before the board all the time where taxpayers don't provide books and records, give an excuse or a reason why. In this case, in, in the Kabir case, a far higher per error rate than, than Mr. Garcia's. And again, Mr. Kabir got no penalty and Mr. Garcia is facing a 40% evasion penalty. I'd like to add too that in the Kabir case, the taxpayer actually said they had guest checks so that if they, the department wanted to look at those guest checks, they could have added them up to see if it tied out and they could have ascertained whether the tax was charged and being collected. One of the essential elements for the 40% fraud penalty. The department elected not to do that. The department just said that in this case it would have turned out the same way. In other words, there would have been a 40% penalty because they would have looked at the books and records. Well, you stipulated there were no books and records. And the department said, well, we would have looked at the general ledger and we would have tied the thing, which means there would have been books and records. So that answer was, was not correct. They would have had to use an indirect approach and they've also said the taxpayer admitted to underreporting. They've said that over and over again, where the taxpayer clearly said here that there was no intent. And this is coming from the taxpayer, not a secondary hearsay from the taxpayer's representative. Well, how would Mr. Garcia benefit by um, admitting to intentional underreporting? There'd be no benefit to him whatsoever to do so. And, it, and, and as such, Taxpayers who are generally engaged in that activity don't cooperate with the board. They don't keep good records, and if they do, they certainly don't show them uh, to the board, and they certainly wouldn't confess to it. So based on that, it's inconsistent that his actions were intentional. The comments all, all over the audit and in the appeals documents are inconsistent. They could repeatedly point out that the reporting was based on the POS data. I don't know how you make that comment and then assert fraud. I, I just don't, that's, those are inconsistent statements. Okay, uh, answer for me. We keep hearing about this POS data in one column versus another. Now, I have not audited, so admittedly, this is new turf to me, but how, how do you pick a wrong line? I wasn't there, I, di I didn't Well, the you've returns. seen other POS reports? Okay, give me your best guess. I'd like to hear what, how somebody could go to a wrong line. I'm not very familiar with the Aloha system. Uh, when you run a report, you would generally put in the dates, the start date. If you're running a summary report, you would generally put in the beginning date of the period that you want and the end date. Is it possible he put in the wrong dates? Possible. Is it possible he read off a wrong line? It's possible. I mean, there's. There's a few possibilities here, but I wasn't there. He didn't. He didn't maintain the reports. I don't have them. I don't have them for. Re he didn't have. He didn't keep. Uh, uh, you know, if, as an accountant, if I were preparing a sales and use tax return, I'd create worksheets. I'd create worksheets that tie from the point of sale system to the numbers on return. He's clearly not an accountant. He didn't maintain worksheets. He didn't maintain the printed reports that he used to file the returns. So I don't know if he put in incorrect dates. He's not familiar with how the Aloha system works. I don't know. Okay, to the department, what did you review? Did you ever find a line that was, because it, it does say in the audit reports he reported from the POS system, but it doesn't say wrong line, good line or not. I'm, I'm trying to figure out what he would, might have picked up. Do you have any idea? Ms. Harkey, I, I don't think that the taxpayer necessarily reported from his POS statements, although, you know, he's, he's in the, best position really to, to address that question. What we know is that the POS statements were, were detailed enough to provide information where he could have correctly reported to Board of Equalization. Um, he did so in, in reporting his income tax obligation, but, but not to the board. Um, moreover, um, 
It was admitted during the appeals conference that actually he was not using the POS statements to report amounts. He was instead looking at his bank statements. So I think <coughs> the, the amounts likely were derived from, from another source of information as bank statements, which didn't necessarily capture all the, the sales generated by the business. Okay. Um, to, this is a question to appeals. We have a 25% penalty. We have a 40% penalty. Can you describe where each is applicable? <clears throat> Both are evasion penalties and fraud penalties. Uh, the 25% penalty does not have relief provisions to it, and the 40% penalty has minimum thresholds. So the 40% is essentially to be applied for the most egregious fraud. And if the relief is warranted, you could find relief. But if you're finding relief, you still have fraud. So the 25% is the lesser included. Unless you find no fraud at all, I'm I, you know I I can see the lack of remittance. I'll just let you know I can see the lack of remittance, and I'm sure that money was somewhere it was being collected. Um, what I'm having a little bit of a problem with is establishing uh, that he. I mean, if he had not provided books and records, he would be not facing a forty percent fraud. Would he have been facing a 25% penalty, I guess? I don't like to speculate. I'd like to decide cases based on the facts that right. we've got. Right, but if, if there were no books and records, could we assess a fraud? Or we a have still assessed fraud in the absence of book and re books and records, but when there are books and records, and especially for the 40% penalty, I guess I'm answering yes. In a 40% penalty, we've got to show that they knowingly collected the sales tax reimbursement and failed to remit it. That's often <coughs> a high hurdle to cross when we don't have books and records. Doesn't mean we can't do it. We could have other sources, um, but absent books and records, it's harder. Right, going on. Okay. Um, I'm I'm just I'm troubled by the forty percent penalty, but I do know that there was money. I, I it was he was self he self admitted and brought the books, helped the department. The audit was done quickly. It was not something that dragged on and on and on, and. Um, I, per I, I would make a motion to reduce the penalty to 25 percent uh, and otherwise accept the uh, staff recommendation. Is there any second for that? Mr. NGJ, can you re repeat what the 25 percent penalty, what's the difference between 25 and 40? For one, the thresholds. The 40% the penalty has to exceed a minimum amount, which off the top of my head, I can't remember, uh, $1,000 per month. Um, so it's for a more egregious type of fraud, if you will. Um, it does include relief provisions that the 25% does not. Those are the basic differences. But they're still, both are <coughs> evasion penalties. Both are specific intent to evade or not pay the tax. Um, I think I've answered your question. I, okay, I, I, so I, I want to not argue the case, so I, I'll stop. <laughs> right, right. So, um, but it seems like the forty percent penalty is for the most egregious cases. Like, yes. um, you know, maybe they didn't report um, anything. They didn't, you know, have a POS system. Um, they didn't cooperate with the audit. I mean, w w I think it goes to the examples. intent. It, I think it goes to the intent itself when you're collecting tax reimbursement from customers and knowingly use it to pay other expenses, that's about as egregious as it gets, I believe. And I think that was the intent behind the 40% penalty. And when you do that to the extent of these thresholds, the law imposes that kind of a penalty because it wants to deter that type of conduct. Mm -hmm. Chairman? Okay. Um, yes, Ms. Stowers. You just said something that put it together for me. You said the 40% penalty applies when you collect the sales tax reimbursement, normally collect it, and do not remit it to the board, and use the sales tax reimbursement for other purposes. Yes. And based on my reading in the DNR and the uh, petitioner's own statement, the reimbursements were used because there was one business account, and that's the account that was used to pay the vendors. That's my observation of this case. So although I uh, understand, um, Chairwoman Harkey, where it's a little harsh to go with the 40% penalty because he did, after being notified by the board, 
Um, he did um, basically say, here's the, here's the error in my reporting. But because the, the sales tax was used to pay bills, that's where I'm, where I'm struggling with joining you on, on the second on that one. And just for me, is a 40% evasion. Member Runner. Yeah, just, um, just to clarify on that, um, on the 40% use further, um, <coughs> wouldn't that also be the same, st the same standard applied to the 25%? They are both fraud. The board has declared them both to be fraud penalties, so the, the and they intent are both, is the same. And, and the intent would be the same. You used that you used your revenue or, or your reimbursement and paid for other things. Yes, and there's okay. not a lesser standard of fraud for the twenty-five. Right. I just want to make it clear that 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 standard applies to the forty, and that standard uh, that that standard also applies to the twenty-five. Yes, that's okay. correct. Okay. Uh, that being said, tell, let me ask the taxpayer real quick. Uh, you said you could continue to take draws or paychecks during this period of time. Um. Not personally. Um, I said my, I, I remember myself being on payroll just because I remember my right. my CPA would say, you know, you have to be based on Right, so you took a payroll check. Uh, I believe so, During yes. all this period of time. But I think I still have them. Well, I well still that, have that's a, okay. Yeah. But you, you did take a payroll check during this time. I was on payroll, yes. Um, so during this period of time when there was under, when there was collection and non and, and, um, payments not made to the BOE, you were still taking a paycheck? I was on payroll. I was not cashing those paychecks. Okay, hold on. That's two, different, that's two different things then. How do you, you, you were actually taking a paycheck and putting it in a drawer and not cashing it? I, yes, because I, I knew that I, I had to pay other stuff for the, like the vendors and stuff like that. So, and I, from what I recall, I might still have some checks at, at you know, in my possession from that period that I didn't cash. I'll tell you where I come from on this, and that is I, I'm, I think 40 and 25 is an interesting issue to talk about. I personally draw the line, and this is where I would probably feel a 40 is more appropriate than a 25, is when somebody personally enriches themselves in the process. Um, and, and so my can, that would be kind of a, a level of issue for me. On the other side of that, the 25 is when it is that you're doing something, you're using the money incorrectly, you should be reimbursing. But my concern is if you're personally enriching yourself in that process. So let me go over back to the department and identify the fact. Did we find that during this period of time, either through his income tax or other ways, that he was indeed, during this time, not only paying vendors that he needed to do to stay in business, but he was also basically enriching himself through the process. We did an analysis of the business um, bank account statements for the period of April 2009 through March of 2012 um, for possible withdrawals for personal expenses, and we found withdrawals for countrywide mortgage, no, numerous withdrawals, GMC financing, BMW financial, and lots of travel and food, or excuse me, travel These were done out hotel. of his personal bank account or well, out of the business? This is his business bank account. So during the business count, he was not only taking a draw in terms of a paycheck, but there, were, uh, there was evidence that he was also being, his, his other personal expenses were being covered. That's what it looked like when we did our analysis of the business bank account, yes. Can the taxpayer explain that? You know, um, I feel uncomfortable by the comment that I was enriching myself when, you know, I, I was just trying to survive. I was okay. trying to stay open. Okay. I inherited a business from a franchisor. I lost the support. I had my second child. My wife's a teacher. She um, she took a leave of absence because we had our second child. When she tried to go back to work during this difficult time, the school districts were not hiring. As a matter of fact, they were laying off teachers all day long. And um, there's no way I was enriching myself. I was just trying to live. I mean, what was I supposed to do? Not well, again, pay I, I mean, don't don't get too offended by the phrase "enriching yourself." I don't necessarily well, mean that it's you just are, that and I don't mean the mean by the fact of that that there was, you know, uh, you know, a, you know, bank account the set honest aside, truth. money transferred to 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 some island somewhere. I'm just feeling like if it's tough times, Jen, I just want to, would want to see a reflection of that. So let me go back. Indeed, were there payments out of that account when you were not paying the BOE that were paying for, for instance? travel and cars and things like that for yourself i had my uh, car that was con that i consider my work car coming out of the uh, bank account as a payment um you know like i said um i had to continue leaving i still had to drive i still had to you know 
do my my stuff so uh, those car payments that uh, they're they're talking about those were part of my you know i consider them part of my business i, I needed them to move around and buy stuff and and just keep the doors open can i interject i've looked at the list of expenses that they're claiming are personal in nature and I've gone over the, the, that list with Mr. Garcia. And some of the items that they're claiming, for example, there were host hotel stays in Santa Ana. Those hotel stays were for bands that he hired because they have a, a dance floor with live entertainment. Okay. Mm -hmm. Those are business expenses. The bands come from other areas and they have to have a place to stay overnight when uh, they're performing at the restaurant. He was trying to do these things to increase the sales right, to get right. the business going. Trying, he's trying to generate sales. Uh, there were some travel expenses. He went to Las Vegas, I believe. Quickly that, tell me, really, what about a, a, a countrywide mortgage issue? Uh, that was probably the mortgage, personal mortgage, yes. I think there was like maybe three or four of those. Yeah, there five. was only about three, three or four of those. This is, this is not pervasive. Okay, thank you. Well, I still have a motion, <clears throat> and if I have a second, we can talk. Do I have any seconds? Okay, do I have another motion? Um, what does, what does that mean? Can I say? Um, Chairwoman, yeah. move to um, adopt staff recommendation to, the, to deny the petition of hold the 40% penalty. Is there a second? Second, but um, comment, Madam Chair. Yes. I think it's important that um, uh, The, uh, are you, you're still in business, right? Well, you know, I think it's important that the uh, taxpayer, uh, that the staff uh, explain this penalty to the taxpayer because it appears that the discussion is centered around the condition of the records. And uh, the condition of the records is, is not really determinative of fraud. It is the intent of the taxpayer and it's not a malicious intent necessarily, and, and that your intent may not have been malicious. Uh, your intent may have been solely to survive and to do the things that you needed in order to keep a house above your uh, family's head and to pay your bills and so forth. And uh, that too is not necessarily a factor in determining the fraud. It's when the funds are used, when the tax funds are used for purposes other than remitting them to the state, and that's done intentionally. Intentionally paying your vendors, intentionally using those funds for purposes other than remitting it to the state. So this is not, um, uh, not a reflection of your activities to survive, or, or even a discussion about whether or not that's right or wrong, at least from my perspective. Um, and the 40 percent, I agree with you, Madam Chair. Uh, <laughs> uh, when the legislature passed the 40 percent, I thought it was a little bit high, but it is the law of the land. So therein is where the dilemma lies from my perspective. Okay, well, from my perspective, we have the same criteria at 40 or 25. I, I'm going to object uh, here. Uh, now, let me, let me ask the appeal. Uh, yeah. Maybe. Uh, I haven't necessarily read it, but w when a taxpayer cooperates in that process, um, not the records, I mean the records were uh, revealing of the fraud activities and uh, not necessarily deposit, but when they cooperate, is there any provisions uh, in the law for, for that? Other than as defined in the 40% penalty, if they voluntarily come forward and pay, but otherwise, the, the conduct that occurred during the audit doesn't get negated or absolved by conduct after the audit. So to answer your question, no, other than as specifically defined with that one that's at issue. I also wanted to clarify, I missed the obvious in my answer to Ms. Ma, the 25% penalty does not require the collection of tax reimbursement. Right. It has the same fraudulent intent, but does not require collection of tax reimbursement, whereas the 40% penalty does which is part of what makes it that much more egregious. You, you could fraudulently not charge tax to your customers and not pay it to the state. You're getting a competitive advantage right. or otherwise among your peers. So you could still be fraudulent and not collect the sales tax. You'd get yeah. the 25, not Good. the 40. Okay. Yeah. Can, can I add something? The, the board's own special notice 
dated August 2007, states, the penalty will not be assessed if any of the following apply. The taxpayer voluntarily reported. That, that's pretty much what he just said. But he, well, he's added and paid. It, it, it's it, in there. Okay, I, I, think the, I think the time for debate is actually over. I just wanted to make a point. I do object to the motion, so is there, uh, Ms. Richmond, please call the roll. Chairwoman Harkey? No. Mr. Renner? Aye. Mr. Horton? Aye. Ms. Ma? Aye. Ms. Stowers? Aye. Motion carries. Motion carries. Such will be the order. Thank you very much. Richmond, please introduce our next item. Um, would you like to take up item B2? This was a way of the parents, or would you prefer to take it up later in the day? We can take up B2. So item B2 was Bozina B. Warbell. Okay, let everybody get to their book. Let's see what B2. Okay. Um, Members, is there a motion here? Yeah. Move to sustain the Franchise Tax Board, deny the claim for refund. Do we, need, do we need to have it introduced? I'm sorry. Did I step out here? Do we need to have the items introduced? Uh, I, I real don't real. recall whether we... Well, let's just do it for do the that. record. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, good morning, uh, Madam Chair, members of the board. Um, the issue before the board in this appeal is whether... The appellant has shown reasonable cause for failing to reply to the demand for tax return. Thank you. And you made a motion. Um, I restate my motion to um, sustain the franchise tax board, deny the claim for refund. Second. Any objection? Such will be the order. Thank you. Okay, now. So now our next item are special presentations for the Employee Recognition Award Program for 2017. And I'd like to request a short um, break for staff to set up five minutes. Thank you. We will break for five minutes. <laughs>
Okay, Ms. Richmond, please introduce our next item. So our next item are special presentations for the Employee Recognition Award Program for 2017. Thank you. Good morning, Good members. Uh, David Gao, Executive Director. I am pleased to present the recipients of the 2015-16 Employee Recognition Awards. Uh, today we will recognize the recipients in the categories of customer service, extra mile, innovation, leadership, and supervisory excellence. So at this time, if the board would, uh, I'd like to invite the members down front to uh, hand out the awards. First off, I want to apologize. I didn't realize who was in the room there. I'm just running around, but I saw Lisa, and I, I went, is that her? But I didn't stop, so I apologize. Where do you want? Right here? Order of the board. Order of the board. Oh, Ms. Harkey, you're <laughs> Apparently, we're not the word of the board. Right here? Yeah, you mean the first one? Okay. Wherever you want. We're good. I just take the shots. Very good. And here to announce the recipients are Rob McPherson and Brooke Jones. Thank you. Good morning, Chairwoman Harkey and members. My name is Robert McPherson. And I'm Brooke Jones. Receiving an award in the customer service category. Brian Harold, Business Taxes Representative, <laughs> District 3, Norwalk District Office. Brian provides quality customer service to the BOE's internal and external customers. He demonstrates a genuine interest in serving the needs of others and has a positive attitude while doing so. Lance Jackson, Associate Tax Auditor, District 3, Irvine District Office. Lance has consistently demonstrated exceptional customer service with taxpayers. His courtesy and exceptional customer service has been noted in taxpayer emails, audit surveys, and field visits. Lance earned the nickname, The Closer, by volunteering to step into and assist on the most difficult of cases. Brian and Lance, please join the members for a customer service category group photo. Are we going to take a picture with yeah. the yeah. customer service? Yeah. 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 Receiving an award in the Extra Mile category, Ana Caratero, Associate Tax Auditor, District 1, Fresno District Office. Ana is always taking on extra assignments and going above and beyond her normal work. She has participated in several public speaking events, presenting in both Spanish and English, and has presented the sales tax seminar in the district office. John Yanni, Associate Tax Auditor, District 4, Riverside District Office. John is the go-to person on his crew. He is the resource person for QuickBooks and shares his experience as a certified public accountant with his coworkers. He has also been recognized by the district principal auditor every quarter for achieving high statistical outcomes with his audits. Anna and John, please join the members for an extra mile category group photo. Receiving an award in the innovation category, Linda Barcenas, Business Taxes Compliance Specialist, <laughs> District 3, Glendale District Office. Linda took the initiative to create detailed instructions with screenshots for several reports used in scope, one of them being the Accounts Not Inspected report. 
She has also created a list of commonly used NAICS codes as well as a list of retailers that are considered large enough to do minimal inspections but not large enough to classify as large retailers. This new list helped the team streamline inspections. Linda, please join the members for an innovation category group photo. All right. And a close, receiving an award in the Supervisory Excellence category, Anna Martinez, Business Taxes Administrator 1, District 3, Ventura District Office. Anna's dedication to her employees helps them to develop their work habits and understanding of the board. She actively mentors and develops her staff to be qualified and successful candidates for advancement. Tina Bynum, Supervising Tax Auditor 2, District 4, Riverside District Office. <laughs> Tina always takes the time to help when her auditors have a question or need input on an audit or a personnel matter. Tina respects her staff and always gives them her undivided attention. Her outstanding service, professionalism, and commitment have made her an excellent role model for all of her staff. Anna and Tina, please join the members for a supervisory excellence category group photo. Mm Congratulations to all the awardees. I'd like to invite the members to come back up to the dais and then we'll get another group photo with all of the awardees standing behind them. Bring a side to the middle. Yeah. Yep. Oh, my chair is down too low. I look really short now. <laughs> I'm in this place, so I don't want to use my place. David. 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 Good. Don't cover your face. Don't cover yeah, your right. face. Well, not that much. Not that much. <laughs> it's a little too high. Um, tilt your ears down just a little bit like this. Like tilt it. Yeah. But then bring it up. There you go. Thank you. Uh, cool. That's looking good. Everybody smile. All right. We'll do a couple here. One, two, three. And do a couple more. One, two, three. Big smiles. One, two, three. And do one more. One, two, three. All right. Cool. Thank you. Members, would you like to make any comments regarding the special presentations? Um, I just want to thank you all for your excellent work. 
especially at the time when I think it's very easy to be demoralized. I quite honestly think our district people do an outstanding job, and I want to thank you all for your support. Uh, the job that you do and the job that you do daily without any acknowledgement or recognition, you just go and work and do your job. And I really do appreciate that you, that you conduct yourself with such professionalism and uh, achieve great results for the state of California. Thank you so very much for what you do for all of us. Yes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, to each and every one of you, thank you uh, as well. I want to echo the thank you. You guys are just fabulous. You embody the essence of this organization and your leadership, your commitment to this organization. Uh, uh, I, you know, I, I could go on and on, but the employees of the Board of Equalization are among the greatest, I believe, in the nation. And I thank you so very much for making it so. Appreciate it. I, uh, you know, it's the, the, the fact is, as we do recognitions like this, obviously um, you have been uh, singled out and chosen for your accomplishments at that point. As you well know, you've got others around you all the time that are also doing superior and great work. And uh, not only are you to be congratulated, but certainly for those around you who support you, who also do that same kind of work throughout the, 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 the BOE. Um, and uh, integrates carefully and, and I think in a, in, a, in a wonderful way the responsibilities that we have as a state in ensuring co the proper collection of tax, but also the respect that's there for those businesses that are out there um, that are in the midst of, uh, of uh, struggling through the daily activities that they go through and then uh, helping them through that process. So again, thank you very much. And I would just like to add congratulations to everyone. Uh, lead by example, and I encourage you all to uh, mentor others um, to achieve that same standard of excellence that you all are displaying within the organization. So thank you. On behalf of Controller Yee, I would like to say congratulations and thank you for your excellent customer service, innovation, leadership, and supervision. And most importantly, thank you for supporting California taxpayers. All right. Ms. Richmond. Our next item will be closed session. The members will now go into closed session to discuss settlements and personnel matters. Thank you.
Josh is ready. Okay. Ms. Richmond. The members met in closed session and discussed settlements and personnel matters, and there are no announcements to be made. Thank you. We will now okay. recess until what, 1 30? Until 1 30. Thank you. All right. So, okay. 1 30.
you. We are now we are now going to reconvene the um, State Board of Equalization meeting. I think that's what I'm supposed to say. I don't have my script open, but you guys can handle that. <laughs> 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 Will you please announce the uh, the next item? Good afternoon, members. Our first item on this afternoon's agenda is item C, Sales and Use Tax Appeals Hearing. Item C5, Cactus Productions, Inc. Please come forward. Thank you. Mr. Angija, will you please introduce the issues in this case? Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members. The appeal before you involves one unresolved issue, which is whether additional adjustments are warranted to the amount of disallowed claimed exempt sales. Thank you. Welcome to the Board of Equalization. You have 10 minutes to state your case. At the end of the department, we'll, we'll make their case for another 10 minutes. You will have five more minutes to rebut announce your name and for, for the record this, thank you right? yeah. I think it should be on it's on okay. pull, pull it close to you hi there you go there we go my name is Fida Atia um, and I'm the owner of Cactus Productions well which is now suspended I started Cactus Productions about um, gosh 20 years ago and immediately um, got into a, a business relationship with various film studios um, when I started this relationship, the studios all said to me that, um, that basically the way it worked is it was a three-way relationship between the studios, their distribution houses in California, um, and, um, and, the, and, and myself. And um, they, the studios said to me that they use um, only 20% um, of the items that are purchased um, in California. The rest, obviously, they, they're theaters and all of that, so they're countrywide, and they would go to a distribution house in California and then be shipped out to the rest of the country per the distribution list. Um, the distribution lists weren't always available straight away, and um, the studios informed me that, that all my the way they worked with all my competitors and had been for years is that um, they had estimated overestimated actually that only 20% um, of the goods um, were used in California and I you know I charged them the tax accordingly on the 20% um, um, subsequent to that there was a um, it definitely was a relationship between the distribution houses and myself because if the, the the goods arrived late the distribution house would call me find out where they were um, and we worked closely together um, however um, what I didn't realize at the time is that um, to the absolute letter of the law that I needed to actually get that distribution list before I delivered um, the goods to the distribution house in California um, and that I only found out once I was audited and was told that that was the case. Um, when, when I gave the, the initial sort of um, 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 sampling um, to the district supervisor at the time, who had actually, I believe, had worked in the entertainment industry before, and he had said to me that he actually doesn't believe, he believes it was more like 14% is used in California and not quite 20 um, and a lot of the stuff was for international um, distribution as well that went, because I worked with DreamWorks International, New Line International, and all that stuff, just all those items just went directly to the, the international markets. Um, it hit the distribution house and it went directly to the international markets. Um, when we did a sampling um, of, of, you know, in, in one quarter of the stuff, it actually did come to less than 20% that was used in California. You know, that being said, um, you know, that was something that I just wasn't aware of. I mean, I was just trying to do the right thing. And, um, you know, we, 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 you know, we, we had a lawyer and we, we tried to argue the case. We lost it. We went to appeals and we lost it again. Um, the, the, the gentleman that was in charge of our appeals was retiring and he ruled against us just literally the day he retired. 
And by that time, um, you know, the film studios had said to me, all we can help you with, we don't use the stuff in California, so we're not, you know, we don't feel like we should pay the tax. And the best we can do is just help you, you know, argue your case. At that point, um, they said to me, I just, we just believe that whatever we say, it's going to be a no. So, you know, have a nice day. You're on your own. <laughs> um, so at that point, it had been going on for so long, I didn't know what to do. So I went to offer and compromise and tried to work out a payment plan. Um, I then paid, I tried to make payments, um, and I, made, I paid about $55,000 out of my own money. Um, just to give you some background on me, I'm, I'm an only parent of a 10-year-old daughter, and um, sorry. <laughs> anyway, I made the payments, and um, it, it then forced me into personal bankruptcy, and I just couldn't make the payments anymore. And um, anyway, um, so that's I found myself here, and I've recently had to move to Colorado because I can't afford to live here anymore. And I'm just living with thanks, living with friends <laughs> in Denver. And I, I was just trying to do the right thing. And obviously, I didn't know to the letter of the law exactly what was needed. And I honestly, at this point, don't know what else to do. I, I, I tried my best to do the right thing. And here's where we find ourselves but I believe I really believe in my heart at the end of the day that that stuff was not used in California it really wasn't and you know I guess it's form versus substance so substantially the state isn't owed the tax but to the absolute letter of the law I guess they are and you know it's it's a technicality and and I but I I've, I've just tried every avenue to try and do the right thing and I just I I don't sort of have anywhere to go at this point. So I'd find myself here. I'm, I'm, I can't sit and argue the, ex, uh, the, the letter of the law because clearly I completely misunderstood it. Um, I have an affidavit from the, stu from the film studio saying that they did inform me that it was 20% that was used in California. All my competitors um, did the same thing. They, they build the same way. Um, and honestly, I, I, I didn't think that I was doing anything wrong. Um, you know, and we were, as I said, it was a three-way relationship. I was in touch with the distribution houses. When I asked for the distribution list, they gave them to me straight away. Um, it, it was never, there was never anything underhand going on. Um, and that's pretty much all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. To the department, please introduce yourself for the record. You have 10 minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Chairwoman Harkey and members of the board. I'm Andrew Kui with the board's legal department, and with me today is Robert Tucker, also with the board's legal department, and Kevin Hanks with the business taxes and fees department, uh, and we will be representing staff. So Petitioner was a retailer of promotional items including hats, sweatshirts, dental floss, t-shirts, mouse pads, and similar items that were typically used to promote movies. Uh, a typical transaction would proceed as follows. First, uh, petitioners sold the promotional items, typically to the film studios. Uh, next, the film studios then directed petitioner to ship the pro promotional items to specified California distribution centers. For example, for purchases made by New Line Cinema, petitioner would send, uh, would ship the promotional items to New Line Cinema distribution center. Um, the purchase invoice would specify dis um, shipment to California at the distribution center in California. Um, next, the distribution um, ship the distribution center would then ship the promotional items to movie theaters, radio stations, and other third parties free of charge, um, pursuant to instructions that were received from the film studios. Petitioner um, never obtained the distribution list from its customers at the time of the sale. During the field audit, petitioner explained to the auditor that petitioner was not made aware of the specific address to which did the distribution centers ultimately shipped the promotional gifts. P um, petitioner also did not provide instructions or have authority to provide instructions on who ultimately received the promotional gifts from the movie studios. So in summary, uh, petitioner's involvement in the transaction was that petitioner shipped pursuant to the contract of sale the promotional items to places in California as directed by the customers, the film studios. 
Um, as discussed, uh, petitioner only reported 20% of these transactions um, in California as taxable. That is because petitioner estimated that 20% of the promotional items that it sells and ships to California film studios in California are later gifted by the film studios to the in-state movie theaters. So as relevant to the application of tax, there are two different types of transactions. The first um, type of transaction is promotional items that petitioner shipped from a point in California to another point in California, the California Distribution Center. That is a sale in California. Of the 10 uh, disputed invoices, two involved in-state sales. The second type of transactions is purchases subject to use tax. These are items that are shipped from outside the state to a distribution center in California. And there are eight of these types of transactions where property was shipped into the state. So first, for the first two transactions, the first two invoices, uh, sales tax applies because title and possession transferred in California. And um, although petitioner contends these are exempt sales in interstate commerce, the regulation specifically provides that, in pertinent part, sales tax does not apply when the property pursuant to the contract of sale is required to be shipped and is shipped to a point outside the state. Um, here, petitioner shipped the promotional gifts to petitioner's distribution center in California, and there's nothing in the sales invoices or the purchase invoices which indicated that the promotional gifts were required or even contemplated to be just transported outside the state. Further, for all 10 of the transactions, when sales tax does not apply, Use tax generally applies measured by the sales price of tangible personal property purchased for storage, use, or consumption in California, and petitioner would be required to collect the tax. Here, the distribution centers send the promotional gifts via a common carrier in California, such as FedEx, to movie theaters, radio stations, and other gift recipients. The California Court of Appeal in Yamaha versus the State Board of Equalization has already concluded that use tax applies to this specific scenario. And specifically, the court concluded, quote, delivery of property to a common carrier in California for delivery to an out-of-state donee shows an intent to make a gift, which is a non-exempted use of the property. And the court concluded that use tax applied in that scenario. Um, therefore, use tax applies because the petitioner shipped the promotional items to California where the taxable use occurred when the distribution center placed the gifts in the mail for shipment to movie theaters, radio stations, and others. Therefore, um, no adjustments are warranted, and we concur with the Appeals Division's decision and recommendation. OK, thank you. You have five minutes to rebut any information. The only two things that stand out um, in that is that um, the distribution houses were, in fact, not part of the studio. Um, they didn't belong to the studio, they were independent contractors, I don't know if that makes any difference, but they were, they were contracted by the studio, they were independent contractors, they weren't part of the studio. Um, and the second thing um, um, I respectfully say, and there is an affidavit to this, um, that I was not the one that estimated the 20%, um, the studio were the ones that told me that it was 20% and um, I have, there are affidavits from the studios saying that that is what they informed me it was. It wasn't my estimation. Thank you. Members? Member Renner? I have a question. Let me, let me go to the, uh, to the department. What would the structure need to be? How would that? How would the sales need to be done? So, right. So um, in this case, there were transactions which actually were shipped um, outside the state, mm -hmm. and um, and then from outside the state, the distribution center distributed either to California or to another location. And in those cases, we allowed this in its entirety. We only picked up the transactions where. The property was shipped into California. The purchase invoice, the sales invoice, all indicated delivery in California. Um, so then that's why we saw um, that you know the use tax applied because it was delivered in California and consumed in California at the time it was um, gifted, um, basically, which is placement in the mail um, to a common carrier for delivery, either outside the state or inside the state. So we're not looking at the place it ultimately ended up. We're looking at where the use occurred. Right, right. So how would, it, how, would, how would it have to be structured? How would a business person structure this differently in order to avoid that exposure? Yes, yeah, so she could, um, I'm sorry, so a petitioner could ship it outside the state. Um, and in that case, we wouldn't have picked this up. 
okay, she could have she could have dis, she could she could have shipped her she herself could have distributed it or just shipped it outside of the state. Uh, they could have yes, they could have used an out of state distribution center. So if it was shipped to an out of state distribution center, then it uh, and then it then it would not, then it would have therefore then it would not obviously be taxing California. Yes. But because of the structure that was set up by the studios, this di this distribution center is in the state, and therefore that's what triggers the the liability. Right, because uh, when they delivered it, um, when the distribution center delivered it to the common carrier to make a gift of it, the making of gift was the tax of a gift was the taxable use and triggered the imposition of the tax. Could there have been any kind of structure that could have allowed that to be, I mean, gone to this, I mean, if the, if the studio just collected it and then used, I mean, they, they took care of the shipping. You know, you, you send this to me, then I'll send it out of state. Um, is there any structure there on a contract that would make clear that relation? Could the contract have helped clear that up? Um, I, I don't believe that that is, um, like, Basically, the fact that it was shipped into the California and used in California, I think, um, is, is what we were looking at. And I don't think that a contract would have remedied the use tax, of being in, made the use tax inapplicable. Um, so long as they're making a gift in California, that's why we we're looking at this as tax line. When you um, say they made a gift in California, help me understand what that phrase means. Or mean. Okay, so the California courts have um, ruled that um, if you're giving property away free of charge, and that would include um, if you place, for example, this is the promotional product. If you place it in the mail, uh, at the time you place it in the mail, it is considered a gift, and that is a taxable use, um, even if the, the recipient. But she's is not giving state. it away. Right. The film studios are giving right. it away. Right. Right. So why? Uh, help me understand. So she's not giving it away. Right. Um, so the gift is being made. Um, so the distribution centers here, they were um, receiving the property at the direction of the film studios and right. acting on behalf of the film studios. And the film studios provided the um, distribution lists as to where the property would be shipped. And that is considered um, when they are acting pursuant to those instructions and delivering it to the um, FedEx or US Mail to ship it to those um, movie studios or radio stations outside the state. That is the making of the gift. And that was the application of the use tax. So the use tax here is imposed. Um, on the movie, um, um, on the movie studios making the gift, and petitioner as a retailer um, is required to collect the use tax. So we're not saying that she is storing and consuming it. We're saying that the movie uh, film studios are the ones making the taxable use. But as a retailer engaged in business in the state and operating in the state, that petitioner would. Why aren't the liable. film studios themselves responsible? I mean, if they, if she, if they, you know, if she, for instance, if she, they were to. I mean, in, in essence, if they were the re, the wholesalers, they were you know the, they were using it, they were taking it in as a non-taxable item with the intention of them giving it as a gift, whether they were going to give it as a gift or whether they were going to go ahead and 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 sell it, the studio would be responsible for that. Right, and and they would also they could also be held liable, um, but it's both petitioner as the retailer is obligated um, under the Revenue and Taxation Code to collect. Uh, the use tax from cus from customers for this for the sale to the in-state cus California customers, and the customers also have an obligation to report use tax. So you have in a scenario where you have two people, which ultimately could ultimately could be liable um, for the tax, if that's what you're asking. So the studios could be liable for the tax uh, for the for the eight transactions where it was a use tax transaction. Yes, the film studios could be held liable for the use tax. There you go. And but we're holding her liable here. Right. Um, because why would we assume that why would again have we how, well let me ask you this did we audit those studios to find out whether or not they did pay the tax right and there is no indication in the file that um, we had audited the film studios for the so those tax taxes could have been paid by the studios mr. Renner we did check on that and we found that those film studios were not audited for this particular time period okay now because these so are those studios sales could have paid the tax because these are sales tax transactions, though, um, the studios wouldn't have been under any obligation to report these amounts. Mm -hmm. um, and so we would be looking just to the retailer to, to report those, 
those taxes to us because it wasn't a, a sale for resale. So the studios aren't technically reselling. Well, again, the I, 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 you know, I mean, here's the situation. I mean, I'm trying to work through this. I mean, the fact is, here's a here's a California business that was trying to do the right thing. They clearly did the estimate as to what they thought that you know under their scenario of thinking they believe that they did it right because they said this this 20 percent is going to be used in the state of course and again that was not that was not the the my understanding is that was not the taxpayers estimate that was the estimate of the people receiving the goods um they said this is how much we're going to do that so so in, in essence then they instructed her as to how much tax they were going to pay because of their use and then it seems to me that she's kind of, in, in one sense, at least, in my, again, I'm trying to figure out how, to, in one sense, fulfilled, tried to fulfill her responsibility. Now, again, nuance that or, you know, trying to figure out with, if everything was done right. She at least, she, you know, nobody, there, this is not a collection of tax that didn't get paid. This was, a, this was an individual who, who basically tried to collect the tax based upon what it is that the studios instructed her to do so then because why wouldn't she necessarily think that maybe the studios were going to pay that if they indeed could be liable why wouldn't that be her thought oh well I think that's fine that's now the studios problem because they're going to decide what to do with this whether they sell it whether they gift it or whatever that's their deal not mine right and I um, mean California the gross receipts of the retailer the sales price is um, you know presumed subject to tax until they provide evidence to the contrary like accepting a resale certificate in this case right. I think it was understood that you know th th this was not for resale this was intended to be given away so then I don't think there was evidence that the or indication that well how about the, how about the evidence that from the from the from the studios it said this is what we believe is, I mean I, again, it wasn't. It wasn't. It may not have been a been a, um, a a certificate of resale, but it certainly was a communication from the from the from the uh, Budio Studio, telling her what their use was going to be. Right. Um, I, I see what you're saying. It's just that um, it, what they conveyed is not something which would have made the tax inapplicable. The tax. Uh, based on the facts of what happened here, unfortunately, the tax does apply to these transactions. We just don't know who should have paid it, and they are both. Oh, we don't. Liable. Excuse me. We we we. The tax applies, but we don't. But either party could have paid it. Either could be liable. party could be. Um, either part. They're both liable. Um, petition, um, but only one of them has to pay it. That's correct. Yes. Right. So if indeed the studios paid it, she wouldn't have liability. That's correct. Yes. And we don't know if the studios <coughs> paid it or not. I, I believe Kevin Hanks just received confirmation from the department that we verified uh, that we had. Um, I'm that sorry, Kevin, did you want to? So it said we so didn't we audit. No, we had no audit history, and actually, a couple of those companies are, are closed out now, also. Um, but yeah, so we don't have any knowledge that that they reported any of these amounts. Nor do we have any knowledge that they didn't. That's correct. Okay. Thank you, manager. Yes. Um, maybe if we. Uh, could, could you um, describe the uh, transaction again and where the tax is triggered and uh, distinguish between the sales tax versus use tax and your response to the hypothetical, whether uh, shared by Mr. Renner, whether or not that applies in this particular case and, uh, and if the consumer, which it appears to be, had uh, paid the tax to the board, would that have been an excess tax that they paid? And, but, and would there have been, would the agency, the law, have allowed the agency to offset those two liabilities? Right. And um, so to, that's a good question. Thank you. And to clarify, there were the two um, invoices which were sales tax transactions and the eight invoices which were the use tax transactions. So for the sales tax transactions, uh, the tax, the sales <coughs> tax applies because title and transfer, title and possession both transferred in California. And in those scenarios, um, it does not matter that the use, uh, I mean, the 
the uh, storage and use of the um, film studios with, that's in California. If that's not in California, you have the South Sac supply and because title and possession transferred here. Um, the only way that would come in is if for whatever reason the sales tax was not applicable, then the use tax then kicks in. So you have, I guess, the two hurdles. One is showing the sales tax is inapplicable and then showing that the use tax would be inapplicable. Um, and then what, for the eight use tax transactions, um, those, the taxable transaction, that the taxable use occurred, it's not, not when it was, um, the, not when the radio stations or the movie theaters used it outside the state. That taxable use for our purposes is when it was um, delivered um, to the common carrier, for example, FedEx, for shipment to the radio stations or to the, um, to the movie theaters, whether they be inside the state or outside the state. And that is because the California's courts, California Court of Appeal has already concluded that um, for purposes of use tax, the use tax applies the, when the gift occurs, and the gift occurs is delivery to the common carrier for shipment, whether the shipment ultimately be inside the state or outside the state. And so the, those are the two distinctions between the sales versus the use tax arguments. Um, did that answer your question? And, and can you make it specific to the, to the case in, that we're con discussing? Right, so, so in this case- I'm not case, really asking a hypothetical question. Right, I, I see what you're saying. So, so in this case, the petitioner sold promotional products, and petitioner um, had uh, so the film studios directed petitioner to ship the promotional items to specified distribution houses in um, California. For example, New Line Cinema would dis um, would direct petitioner to ship the product to New Line Cinema Distribution Center or TDS. Um, and I have invoices showing that. Um, and I can give you, if you would like, a, a sample copy of the um, purchase order no, no, submitted I, I, by the I'm um, not questioning you. Um, film studios. Um, OK. So then after um, the film studios directed petitioner to ship the promotional items to California, um, the distribution center um, would later, um, upon instructions from the film studios, they would ship the promotional items free of charge to radio stations, um, movie theaters, or other third parties. And um, these are promotional items which were basically used to promote like movies, like a film with a logo on it. Uh, I mean, sorry, yeah, like see, a cap I, with a logo I, you, on you, it. You're not really being clear to me. Um, okay. And you're not necessarily following the, the two paths of the law. Uh, so you have a, a California retailer Yes. That is doing business with an in-state um, manufacturer or out-of-state manufacturer? Right. So um, California, um, so the petitioner, yes, they have in-state manufacturers and out-of-state manufacturers. Two of them were in-state uh, for the transactions at issue. Two of them were delivered from a point inside California to another port in California. And Eight those are, in the department, considered those transactions? Sales tax. Sales tax transactions. And there are other transactions where the, um, the manufacturer is outside the state. Correct. And the product was shipped from outside the state to locations outside the state and into California, so or they all came into California? So all the remaining disputed transactions were shipped into California. There were three of them that were and shipped outside. One second. And so they, um, they shipped the product from outside the state into the state of California yes. at the direction of a California retailer. At the um, at the direction of yeah yes okay, and the department is taking the position that when the product is shipped from out of state into the state of California, that that's a use tax transaction. Oh no, the the use tax applies at the next step. The next step is the distribution house will then make a gift of the product to a radio station or a movie theater. So well, wait wait a minute. Uh, then if that's what you're doing, then, 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 then I don't agree with that. So, so um, maybe you want to clarify what happened. We agree with you that when it comes from outside the state to inside the state, then it will become subject to a use tax transaction. Okay. And when is the use tax triggered? I'm sorry, I didn't hear. When, when is the use tax triggered? So the use tax is triggered at the point where the gift is made, and that occurs in California. The gift occurs when the distribution center so drops. The, so the use tax is not triggered at the point that the common carrier picks it up from the out-of-state? The, the use tax is triggered 
at the point it is delivered to the common carrier in California um, for shipment uh, to how, the how do, uh, Wait a minute. You, 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 in that case, I disagree with you as well. <coughs> Maybe somebody want clear, to clear, clarify the law here and so, what happened? So um, the California Court of Appeals has determined. I, I know what the California Court of Appeals says. I'm just asking you, when you have an out-of-state uh, distributor that's distributing product at the direction of an in-state retailer, and when that out of uh, uh, let me go to uh, appeals. Uh, apologies. Um, I think everybody's on the same page. They're just describing the actual use. <clears throat> You've got a out-of-state shipment to a California consumer who's making. Yeah, let, let me be let me, to be mindful. I I really <coughs> want the taxpayer as well as oh, us to it. understand the flow of the transaction and what no. triggers this so uh, triggers the tax and what actually occurred as opposed to saying well it's a, they, they owe the tax you know because it went from here to here it's effectively a retail sale by this taxpayer to the California consumer they've been describing the subsequent use by the California taxpayer which is not wrong that's a sale for any purpose. It's a use for any purpose other than resale in the regular course of business. It so happens that it goes to a uh, distribution center, gets given away to various other movie theaters, things like that. But the dis let's call it New Line Cinema, I think you said as an example. They're receiving it. They're making a use of it other than resale in the regular course of business. So the sale from this ta taxpayer to New Line Cinema is a retail sale subject to use tax instead of sales tax because it's coming from outside the state titles passing outside the state so we don't have sales tax we have use tax and a use tax collection obligation by this taxpayer under section 6203 oh, he, um, he, he did it so if you want to make it more confusing uh, mr member horton if i may clarify so the distribution um so petitioners custom with the film studios are directing that the product be shipped to the distribution center. For example, New Line Cinema would direct that it be shipped to New Line Cinema Distribution Center. And New Line Cinema Distribution Center, the fact that they're giving it away in California, that is the taxable use in California, if, if that clarifies. No, it doesn't. <laughs> the, you, you, Ma'am, you seem to disagree. Can I, can I just once yeah, again please. specify that, that New Line Cinema contracted a distribution house named TDS. So and, and where are they located? They're located in California, but they contracted, TDS is not, part, well was, they, they're no longer, but they, they were not part of New Line Cinema. So New Line Cinema would, would contract at, at a huge fee, um, and there are other distribution houses like that called Deluxe Media and, and Technicolor and all of those places. And the studios have contracts with those distribution houses to send the, 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 the goods outside of California. So basically, I'm invoicing the, the studio, the studio is paying the distribution house, and then the distribution house is just sending all the stuff outside of, well, a good 80% of the stuff outside of California. So it doesn't, it, it literally lands at the thing, they pack it and they send it out. And, and who has the contract with the distribution house? The you? contract with the distribution house, the, the, the studio pays the distribution house to do that for them. Do you have a contractual relationship at all with the distribution? No. No. And, and can you describe what happens when you're interacting with a, um, an out-of-state distribution house? Well, m most of the distribution houses are based in California, and uh, the, uh, the, the, the way our business works is we have distributors all over the, the country selling different items. It's part of the American Advertising Institute. And um, they, you know, there are different suppliers all over the country. And then basically, if the studio wants to buy a certain item, they'll say, well, I want whatever, a hat or a T-shirt or whatever. And we will then find the, 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 the particular hat or T-shirt or item that they like. It could be from a factory in New York. It could be from a factory in Atlanta. It could be from a factory in California. Um, and they would then contract us to, to have this item produced and delivered to the distribution house, um, a new, line, a new Line's distribution house was TDS, um, uh, DreamWorks' distribution house was Deluxe, um, and they would say, send it to so-and-so, and, and then 
it would literally get there and they would ship it out of state. So it wasn't it wasn't the distribution house that was making a gift of the item. In fact, I I, I have a suspicion that the, the studios weren't getting these the the the, um, the movie theaters and all of that weren't getting these things completely free. Right. Otherwise, they would they would just. Mr. Njiju, um I understand that that under the use tax scenario um, that the retailer has primary liability for the tax. Um, what happens if both parties pay the tax? So the use tax <coughs> is the primary responsibility for the use tax is on the consumer. The retailer, such as this retailer here, has a use tax collection obligation under 6203. There's a court case, I believe it's branch and inclusion. I don't know the site off the type of my head. Not that a retailer would do this, but it gives you the right, a cause of action. You would literally, you could sue your customer to get the use tax back that you paid on their behalf. So if both paid at once, we'd in theory refund it if there were still a well, claim for refund and still timely. We don't want to collect it twice, obviously. Right. All right. No, I thoroughly understand the law. I just wanted to get it on the table. Do you have? Yes. Ms. Ma. Member Ma. Can I ask a question? Um, so could this, in this situation to um, the BOE, could that letter, that 20% letter, be almost considered like a de facto resale permit? No, we have a, so generally the res gross receipts are presumed subject to tax unless they accept the resale certificate and there's a form and content um, of what could, is required to constitute a resale certificate. And in this case, because they did not do that, that's why we were saying that tax applies, it's presumed that tax applies and then we know that ultimately that they did use it in California because of the use. Right. So but, but I'm saying if the studio filled out the form 230, right. California resale certificate, saying, you know, I, Studio X, um, you know, only sell 20% of the products here in California, therefore I only want, you know, her to charge me 20%. Um, it, right. I, I is understand. that what they were supposed to do? So no, because um, a resale certificate is issued when property is purchased for resale, and in this case, they're not reselling the property, so that it was not it would not be proper for them to issue a resale certificate uh, for the film studio to issue a resale certificate to petitioner on the purchase of these products. But a gift, they gifted it, yeah. right? Presumably, well, what's the difference between gift and selling? Once they take possession of it. So so. Um, for the sales tax, uh, so um, when you're making a use, that's uh, applicable to the use tax, the storage use and consumption in California. Um, and that's when the, the taxable use occurs when the purchaser makes that storage use or consumption in California. However, there's the presumption that in absence of the resale certificate or other documentation showing that the tax is inapplicable, that the tax does apply. And I, I was just clarifying that, one, um, they did not receive a, a form or certificate, and two, that under these facts that it would not be proper because this is not an exempt either from sales tax or use tax. Um, I cannot think of an exemption that would apply in this spe specific scenario. So. But if, if, if they said, I mean, the sheet of paper says, we the studio ship 20%, you know, we use 20% in California, we ship 80%. Um, and it doesn't matter whether they use it, they gift it, I mean, that's the studio's um, Declaration, right? Right. The the complication here, Ms. Ma, is that every sale is subject to tax unless it qualifies for some sort of exemption or exclusion. The typical exclusion is a resale certificate. Someone purchases an item for resale without making any other use. The complication here is gifting it is a use and would not allow it to be purchased for resale. And the mere fact that you're placing it in the mail in California, sending it out free of charge to wherever it might be, it, that is when the use occurs and that's when the um, event becomes subject to tax. Just this. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, and uh, yeah, and so why isn't that the studio? Because under these circumstances, Mr. Runner, it was the sale to the studio that was subject to tax, unless she That's had, it. unless she had received an exemption okay. or exclusion. Okay, well, let me ask you this way: Who we've identified that some of these are use tax transactions? Correct. Right. Okay. Yeah. 
who is primarily, who's firstly and primarily responsible for use tax? The consumer, the person who uses it. However... Okay, so again, that in that case, that is the studio, correct? Correct. Okay, so the studio. And we haven't established the fact, we still live into the possibility that the studios did indeed pay that because they were primarily responsible. However, under um, Revenue and Taxation Code 6203, the retailer under these circumstances is required to collect the use tax because they are engaged in business to do so unless they receive um, notification from the their purchaser their customer and and under these well just take it one step further well didn't they receive that by that letter that that doesn't the, 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 the taxpayer but that's that this not is how we do business that's not an exemption or exclusion certificate so that no, would not, not really. okay so the the, what we have here is a circumstance in which we have a retailer who's required to collect the use tax. Right. The avenue for the retailer is that um, there is a decades-old um, court of appeal case which states that it's her customer is primarily liable and that the person who makes the sale to the per, to the consumer has the option to go to court to recover that use tax. But the way 6203 is structured, it requires the retailer to um, remit the tax. Right, right, right. Let me, let me ask you this. Um, the gift, the distribution never had title to these, to these, to these goods, right? Distribution center? The um, shipping document did not um, specify like a t title transfer, uh, well, uh, it did not so the default is FOB shipment and in this case the um, title um, I, 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 yeah I, I mean I, I think the trans title transferred to the film studio not okay the okay center. so right so my point was the same right yes distribution center never had title um, so so the the issue of the of they took title not the distribution center they took title so then Again, I'm just hung up on this idea that it seemed to me that they are the responsible party for the use tax. And if they're the responsible party for the use tax, and, and therefore they may have paid it, and then why would we assume that they didn't? There were declarations from the movie um, uh, studios, the film studios, uh, stating the facts. If, if they had paid the tax, I, I think it's reasonable to assume that they would have stated on no, the No, 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 you can't assume the what they didn't say. Right, I mean that you can't assume that they would have included that. They, 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 you know, they, they. I think, in fact, they were asked the qu the question was never about that. Right, the declaration was always the questions that they were responding to were specific in regards to how much that how much that how much sales tax was due in that transaction. Nobody asked that second question, so to assume that they should have included in their letter doesn't make a lot of sense to me. But again, I, I, I I'm. I'm just, let me let me ask you another issue real quick because again I'm at this point I'm willing to can, I'm willing to say that we don't know if the use tax was paid and at that point and at that point then if I don't know the use tax was paid it may have been paid and therefore I'm not necessarily asking a taxpayer to pay the tax and then go sue the studios in order to get their money back I know that that's what they could do but that doesn't seem like a very reasonable issue to ask let me go, okay, go ahead, go on that, on that I, point. I, I, I'm not disagreeing with you. I, unfortunately, that's the way the law is structured. Well, I, I get that, but again, the law is stru structured in such a way that where the studio could have paid the use tax. If I may, um, right? I, I just want okay. to point out that uh -huh. there, there were um, two audit items. One of them is, is not related to this. Um, it's the differences between the um, federal income tax returns and the sales and use tax returns. And then there were two um, sales tax transactions. So I just wanted to clarify, make it clear that not 100% of the transactions here are the use tax Right, right. I get that. I, okay. I, I get that. I'm, I'm just dealing with, it, with the use tax portion of the, of the issue. Let me ask you just another quick question. That is, did we review? This was a really long, this has been in the pipeline for a long time. Right? This is, it's what, uh, 60, uh, 13 years old from the first audit. Um, have we reviewed anything in regards to the process here as to whether there should be some relief of interest? So, um, has there been an analysis done? I, 
just last week we did briefly review the timeline and we um, don't think that there was um, an unreasonable error or delay by the board. So what happened was this so was actually... So all the error and delay was on the part of the taxpayer? I, I, that it wasn't. Um, to clarify, this was in um, settlement for five years and um, that the board had actually approved a settlement agreement. Um, but what happened was that the taxpayer breached the agreement and then that's why after five years this was pulled out of settlement. Um, and then as, there were also um, the audit and the revised audit. Initially with the initial audit, there were not records provided, so we had to go and get the first quarter of 2006 records, and then we did a revised audit based on that. Um, I, so I think that we were working, or we were, there was a, a reasonable explanation for basically the Can you the tell time. me what the breakdown is between the use tax liability and the, and the sales tax? Um, the the um, liability was projected based on an error ratio, and I have not calculated the specific. I don't think we have calculated the specific amount allocable to sales versus use tax. No. no. Okay. I, we have an overall error factor that was calculated, but it incorporates all the transactions that we're discussing today. So there was an 85 percent factor of error related to. So our test uh, here's my, here's my question. I guess so. If if again. We could, if we did determine that 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 the sale use tax transactions could have indeed already actually been paid by by the studios, we don't know what amount that would leave for liability on the behalf of this taxpayer for the sales tax portion. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Um. Members, uh, I mean, I, I think the eight, <laughs> I think the law is relatively clear here, but um, it seems to be getting confused in hypotheticals that don't seem to exist here. Um, and so, let me see if I can give this another try with Mr. Njijim. Um, um, the um, the use tax liability when it's shipped from out of state, can you distinguish the use tax liability when a product is shipped from out of state to a end consumer versus the use tax liability when the product is, uh, uh, is just is purchased by that consumer himself and, and a retailer is not involved? So as in this case here, <coughs> you've got title passing from outside the state. Let me back up. <coughs> sales tax requires two criteria. You have to have title passing within this state, and you have to have local participation by essentially a brick and mortar, a place of business inside this state. For the transactions at issue, the use tax transactions at issue, they were shipped from out of state, title passed out of state. We also don't have local participation, although the absence of either one is sufficient. So we've got use tax applicable. So at the point that title passes out of, sh out of state and the tax is triggered, Who's liable for the tax at that point? Consumer. It's almost as if, to follow your question in hypo, it's almost as if that consumer called a Nevada retailer and that Nevada retailer shipped it. You've got local participation outside and title passing outside and you've got use tax applicable to the consumer. The difference in this case is the retailer's involvement. She's still a retailer engaged in business in this state under 6203. And, and what does that en engagement, how does that affect the transaction. It gives rise to a use tax collection obligation, which is essentially they've got to collect it even though they don't owe it. it, it as unfair as that is, I mean, I've never really liked this section of the law, you know, because of the inequity of holding a retailer liable for collecting a tax that is actually do to by consumer. the consumer, uh, inherently challenging. Um, but because I don't like a law, don't mean doesn't mean that I can. It okay, was meant it. to protect California retailers. Imagine. I, I know. I know from, from so the California retailers. The, the, I know the whole creation of it was that the retailers would argue that uh, California retailers would argue that you having these shipments coming in from out of state and no one's paying the tax, so you've got an unfair advantage yep. in it when you've got a California retailer participating, that gives them an inherent advantage over other retailers. Um, and so the law was created years ago, I get it. Um, 
any evidence that that uh, I mean, uh, well, I'm gonna leave it alone. I, I have I have a question. Yeah. Um, just just. Madam Chair, I'm just going to kind of paraphrase what you guys <coughs> just said. So on this use tax transaction, the retailer is required to collect it because the retailer is shipping it out of state? Because they're in, <coughs> in, shipping it they've, in state. They've made the sale and they're engaged in business in this okay. state. Okay, <coughs> okay I, I think I understand what you got to say in there. I just, I just want <coughs> to just take my time and ask just one question. Madam, in your testimony, you indicated that the business is now closed. The, I, I had to um, suspend. I suspended the corporation. Um, it's not closed because this debt exists in it, so I haven't been able to shut it down. But it is not operated not in operated. over five years. Yeah. Are you still being. living in California? I moved. I had to move out of California a month, uh, two months ago. Okay. It's my understanding that this was a settlement, and we don't talk about settlement um, to the department and to the appeals, but <coughs> it's now out of settlement. And that's why it's back before us to to, to, to decide on the liability. Um, so is there anything, if 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 for some reason we don't rule in favor of the petitioner, is there anything that would prevent this from going to offer and compromise? No, that's if that's exactly where it could go, and okay. perhaps should go. Okay, let me let okay, me thank just you, ask a question. Since the corporation is not around or, or only staying alive because of this liability. Is that how I understood it? That's correct. You can't close it. I can't close it because of the liability. It's a corporation. Does a corporation have any assets at this time? Nothing. Whatever, whatever funds were paid, I paid out of my own, you know, out of my own pocket. And once again, as I said, I'd, it forced me into personal bankruptcy and I, I just can't afford to live here anymore. Okay, so she's personally bankrupt and and she has uh, a corporation that's not functioning. Um, I'm just saying. <laughs> I, I, I do understand the law. I understand it totally. Um, so um, I think we're a little bit stuck with the law other than what you might want to carve out for use tech and, and potentially um, Anyway, um, yes, do question. anybody want to make a... Just a quick question, though, uh, first. Um, so this, when we said it was in settlement, was there an agreement in settlement? Yes. Oh. Uh, you can't, can't uh, ask. No. Can't ask. Uh, okay. Actually, that part... I, uh, help, I me, help me understand. I'm, we, I was given permission that it, because it's procedural, we could talk about this much of it. We can't talk about okay, the other details. Okay, tell me what we could talk about. That we ha there was an agreement in place, uh -huh. and then when they fell out of compliance with the agreement, it got kicked back okay. into the appeals process. Me, and again, you're, you're going to have to, you know, beat me up here if I'm going down a path I can't go down. But normally, when settlement deals with the agreements, settlement is like you make a, a, a you know, the you, you negotiate. Oh, Chief counsel's just staring at me. <laughs> um, <laughs> you can let me know. Let me know when I do this. Um, but I, I'm, here's my. Let me actually. I'll, I'll tell you what my assumption is, and I won't apply it to this case. Um, but I would assume if something is in settlement, then there was an a, there was an agreed amount, a contract, and amount, and then and that would be paid and board approved, by the way, and the board approved, um, and and so that was an agreement that went on for a period uh, that could uh, I won't talk about this case that could be an impairment, uh, an agreement that then goes on for a period of time, okay, and then the person does not comply with the agreement, okay. And then, we, th which brings us to possibly something like this, to where then the obligation comes back, and it's the full obligation. With it's not the settled amount that's if true. indeed there was a different amount. I believe that's true. <clears throat> so her, again, well, uh, so a taxpayer settlement could be less than the liability. That's exactly right. And that's if a taxpayer falls out of a settlement agreement, they're it goes up, up to the whole amount. That's exactly so right. And they give up the benefit of the. So settlement. a person that, okay, so a person goes in good, good intention to, to go into settlement, goes into settlement, and then they go bankrupt. 
So they can't make any payment. And so, so what happens to them is all of a sudden they hold the, the whole, they now owe the new, the old amount. That's exactly right. And they have wow, to come that back doesn't seem right. into the appeals process. Well, I think more to the point is that not why we have offers and compromise. If this is a bankrupt corporation, there's no assets in the corporation. Uh, the settlement's gone belly up. We don't necessarily have to circumvent the law or make any twists and turns in it. We merely just rule to send her to OIC um, and that kind of ends it. By the way, yes. the corporation can is not operating right now. No, it's, it's not operating. No. And and can I say can that I did I yeah. did actually pay fifty four thousand or whatever yeah, exactly. it was. We, 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 uh, we, we have we that. have that information. Yes. So I am going to make a a a motion to deny the petition, but to send it to offers and compromise. Second. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Is there any objection? objection. One objection. Please call the roll. Chairwoman Harkey? Aye. Mr. Renner? No. Mr. Horton? Aye. Ms. Ma? Aye. Ms. Dowers? Aye. Motion carries. Okay, will you please um, meet with, and um, I think you're probably going to be okay. Let me just put it that way. Okay? I'll meet with so. you and go through the process. Who do I meet with? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. The appeals person. Okay. Thank you. That was interesting. Uh, Ms. Richmond, please introduce our next item. Our next item is the Customer Service and Administrative Efficiency Committee. Mr. Runner is the chair of that committee. Mr. Mr. Runner. Runner. Thank you. I will call the committee to order. And uh, we have, I believe, a staff presentation. Yes, Chairman Runner. Good afternoon. My name is Mark DeCio. And I'm joined today with, uh, by David Gow, Executive Director. Mr. Chairman, at your request, the Customer Services Committee brings forth four proposals today for discussion so that they can be addressed in the next education and outreach plan, which is currently being drafted. The four proposals are as follows. One, impose a moratorium on all conferences pending their approval as part of the 2017-2018 outreach and education plan. Two, Create and implement an approval, an approval process for any event in which more than five BOE employees are requested to attend. Three, direct staff to draft an issue paper and propose a policy on loaned slash redirected staff. Four, establish a clearance process for videos, webinars, and town halls, similar to the clearance process utilized for print and in-person activities. That concludes my presentation, and I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Um, let me just say that th these are issues that uh, I uh, that our office worked together on with staff in order to identify these as potential um, good, helpful, good government guidelines. Um, not wanting to hinder either the organization nor members. Um, I think I'm going to go right off the bat and just go to the to. Uh, to Mr. Gao, and uh, as as ED, um, let me just ask: Are it, it, again? We're going to implement. We're going to go through and discuss these one by one. But I want to just a general view, um, you know, from from the ED's point of view as to 
the um, the helpfulness of this in regards to administering the agency is that a fair question mr. Gow uh, yes it is a fair question and I'll do my best to respond okay. I, I think that uh, uh, these are the kind of issues um, and I'm sure there are others that other members will have as well but the kind of issues that uh, to come before the board and have an opportunity for the board to, to uh, discuss are beneficial it help it helps give the agency guidance that uh, we need that that is board directed so um, I think uh, this was I know your your uh, attempt to start that uh, I guess some of the, what I might call self-reform or whatever uh, in along those lines. So uh, I, I would say okay. these do help. Um, I'm, and again, I, I just as soon at this, you know, go ahead and start dealing with these one at a time. Um, you know, as we start going through and just decide. Now, the uh, the uh, again, my observation here is the only one that we really are. Uh, number one is really a specific decision that's before us. Um, I look at number two, three, and four more as asking um, the uh, staff, the ED specifically, to come back and do their, their report and come back, or not, no, actually not come back to us, but actually make the policy uh, on these. So that's at least in my thinking the process, so, but we can certainly discuss that. Member Harkey. Hi, thank you very much for bringing these forward. Um, the conference issue I think was raised initially we, the reason it came to light was because of the the evaluation by finance and I know I have put my one conference on hold yes. moratorium so that was kind of self decided mm -hmm. yes. and um, I was asked why I didn't tell everybody that well I'm not into press releases for doing what I think makes sense mm -hmm. so <laughs> it was real easy for me um, the next, I, and I think I think because those were made such a big deal of, I, I do want to say that they were uh, available to all, um, and in larger districts, the large events I think make sense. Now, how to quantify that? I think we can probably do that. I believe there were over 1,500 people at the one event I had in um, in uh, Temecula, or no Escondido. Pardon me, Escondido. And uh, so they are well attended, and people do stay all day. But we we have to make I you know, and the agenda seemed to in, you know evolve involve everything. I didn't think the members were responsible for a lot of this, but since we're being targeted for it, I think it's very important that we really understand the way it functions, and uh, you know from from nuts to bolts, because I don't want to be held responsible for something I don't understand. And I thought this was under the purview of the department that offered offered the events. So that being said, um, now the, appro the approval process number two, I think is, uh, I'm, I'm just, my question is how did, we, how did we reach five? So maybe Mr. Gao can answer that one. Um, on the third one, the loaned or redirected, those are two separate, very, very separate issues and I can see the MOU for 60 days for loaned, but redirected a one-day event. Um, I don't know that that's something that we can do an MOU for. I think we just need to ferret that out and get into more of what I think we all have discovered are Provision 1 guidelines. And I think maybe draft a policy and, a, and be sure that everyone in the district uh, is aware of the BEAM policy for for the uh, provision one, um, which I think was the, the case that was brought up in the audit. And so I would like to know, I had never heard of provision one before, and I understand it's not just a BOE issue. FTB also has provision one, and That's I'm not sure who else might have provision yeah. one employees, but it may be that this provision needs to be explained better statewide. Um, so I think that's something that we should look at and and draft a specific outline for and be sure that it's an educational and I would actually like that to be brought back before the board mm -hmm. 
uh, so that we all understand it, so that we have a public hearing of it, that we, dis we discuss the BEAM policy. And I, I think you'll find that I'm going to be requesting more of these BEAM policies coming forward because they're supposed to be Board of Equalization Administrative Manual sections, which wouldn't necessarily involve board members, but I think it does. It's mm -hmm. obvious by this audit that it does. Um, so uh, the next item, um, the clearance process. We have a clearance process for these items currently. As I understand it, everything did get cleared. I think what we need to do is define, rather than, rather than establish a clearing process, we need to redefine, again, through a BEAM manual, if that's how it's supposed to be, through a BEAM policy, and bring that back so that board members and everyone is, is, understands what the policy is. And I do think probably all of these items need to come back to the board um, just for input and, and come in the way of an issue, issue papers which is what I used to see at the council were staff reports so that I could get my best advice from my most knowledgeable people. Um, and I think we've been lacking those up here. We tend to make decision by whoever decides to ask for something first. And I think that's been a problem. So I do believe that Mr. Gause was going to implement more uh, issue papers. And I think these are all ripe for those sorts of things and policies to go with them. And your recommendation, one, two, or alternatives. Um, because you guys are the experts. Staff is the experts in their field. We just take what you give us, add whatever, decide the priority that the board wants to, wants to establish. But I do think we need more of these. So I want to thank, uh, thank you for bringing these forward. I think they're very, very important. I, I do wish to see, though, you know, full analysis and, and policies in place because we've got them. Oh, one more thing. One more thing. I have been asking for, and I'm not sure that it's how it's, how it's divided, but the budget that we have for outreach, for mail, for everything all conclusive seems to come from a variety of different pockets. And so when it gets reported that so much is used here and so much is used there, and there's a big, huge number that appears in this report, I'd like to know how that is all, how that's taken into account, and maybe it would be wise for us to have one budget for all and just segment it rather than um, apparently there's a different policy for the outreach people in the district that do the little events, the smaller events. There's something for them. Um, and there's a, we set a budget limit on ours. But I think there's a comprehensive. There might be a separate mail budget, a separate. And you know, you would know, I think, ahead of time what, in fact, the department needs to get out the notices, mm -hmm. the mail that they do, what, in fact, the uh, educational mail, you know, for, for events or, or for sem seminars, uh, business seminars and whatnot. And then, then we might have more of a comprehensive look at this. Because I, what I fear is that, you know, there's, there's been little pockets somewhere that somebody's moving around, and we don't want that to come out somewhere. We just had a, a severe um, issue <laughs> reported in the press on a lot of a lot of things, and so I just want to be sure we're budgeting, or at least that we know where this where it is. And I'm not so sure that we do. <coughs> so I, I think that you. ought to be included as we come back with the with the 1718 uh, uh, outreach plan. I'd like to know ahead of time well, what we have, what well, what, it, what categories. So that's what I'm asking for. What categories does our money come from for outreach and education, uh, BOE wide? Because some some do mail out of a certain area, some do events out of a certain area, some comes from here, and I know that the seminars have been questioned as to where the money okay. is for those. So I'm just trying to, as long as we're doing this, I want I want little confusion as possible. So it can be, yeah. I mean, it, it seems to me it's going to be, and and it ends up by nature being included in that, and that's going to be coming up uh, in June. Um, but I, but in between, I guess if, if members if have requested, if members have requested a specific idea of of where pots of money come together for outreach events, that seems like a reasonable report to give back to members. Okay, certainly. Um, okay, let me let me let me let me again let me come come back a little bit because I think I, I if we can I, in order to get through these, can we go through these one at a time and then be able to then make a decision? 
Right. <laughs> I know <Yeah>. that. <laughs> I know that. Um, well, since you're asking for reports, you probably don't need to, I mean, you can handle it any way you want, but I just wanted to hit all of the sure, issues. Sure, sure. So let's, um, can we, can we, can we, uh, item one, let's talk about, can we talk, talk about item one first yeah. and we go on yeah, to sure. the next one? Okay. Member Horton. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, members, I, you know, I, I think the, uh, the legislature is clear, was clear in relationship to provision one, which is related to item one. The concern here uh, is the use of revenue generating positions for tax administration activities or any other activities relative to that. And so as we begin to sort of deal with this issue, I think it's a, this gives you an opportunity to address that concern immediately and identify all of the revenue generating positions that are currently being used for tax administration activities. Uh, on the marijuana project, we're using uh, cross, we're using uh, revenue generation. So throughout this agency, we're using hundreds of revenue generating positions uh, for tax administration activities. So I think it's important to begin to develop that list, submit it to the Department of Finance, and go through the assessment and the cost-benefit analysis to make the determination if it's appropriate. Uh, the issue before us is actually rather simple uh, now that I've learned about it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been around since 1991, which was really surprising to me. Uh, but now that I've learned about it, the, as I understand the, the Budget Act, it's just simply if you're going to use revenue generating position for tax administration activities, just notify the Department of the Finance. Let them know. Let them weigh in and determine if that use is appropriate. Or, and at the same time, notify the legislature. I think there's a lot of wisdom in doing that expeditiously as soon as possible. Uh, the, the item one re relates to uh, uh, moratorium on conferences, but the issue is not the size of the conference. The issue, that, that's, that's irrelevant. Uh, there is no incidental use of Provision 1 employees. One, two, three, that's not how the act works. So if we're looking to assure ourselves that this isn't happening as it relates to the conferences, uh, you've got Provision 1s that are being utilized on uh, going out as tax experts, small business conferences. They're utilized in the various different fashions within the agency. And if the moratorium is the solution, the moratorium should be on all of that activity into, into such time that we can submit to the Department of Finance a summary of those positions and get their sign off. Otherwise, we continue to be in violation of Provision 1. And I think the curing that should be most expeditiously, and I would be supportive of a moratorium on everything where Provision 1 employees are being used for tax administration activity. Just stop it, freeze it, and then submit it to the Department of Finance and let's get a sign off. Historically, uh, large seminars, the Board of Equalization has been doing these since 1998, where you have a combination of federal, state, and local governments having attendance up to 3,000 individuals. So, uh, uh, so, you know, so, and it's been, you know, and there is history after history. The way that we, the other part that I find relatively interesting is that we're, we're, we're acting as if though there's no policy in place, which, which seems to mean to me that maybe we don't know there's a policy in place and that may be the inherent problem here. Mm -hmm. And so there may be a necessity to begin to educate folks about the existing policy. The existing policy uh, in BEAM, which says that all outreach activity, all outreach activity has to be, has to go through an approval process. It has to be approved by the external affairs, then reviewed by uh, legal uh, for, uh, to assure that it has a governmental legislative purpose. And then the executive director has, or, is, or, or their designee has to sign off. That's the existing po policy. Whether it's five individuals, four, 10, 15, again, the numbers and significant. That's existing policy. So you could just simply make a copy and send it back to us if, uh, unless you're gonna modify the uh, existing policy. 
So I think another wise thing to do is to begin to, to set up or incorporate in the training of all of our uh, staff as well as the executive team the existing policy so that line management is made fully aware of what provision one says fully aware of what a governmental activity is and what what it is not and began to sort of educate folks about our existing policy and I, you know if you can improve upon having legal review it the external affairs person review it and then sign off by the executive director and the ed i mean that's pretty pretty thorough analysis um, as it relates to the loan position the board has existing policy as it relates to loan as well you can find it in uh, beam when it comes down to career advancement career development and so forth all of those policies currently exist the challenge we may have is the inherent turnover and the lack of awareness of what the existing policies are so I mean I look forward to 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 to, to a policy uh, uh, but let me just encourage staff to take a look at the existing policy uh, it's pretty thorough it's pretty thorough uh, it basically, and, and the challenge that we may have is that the existing policy exists from silo to silo. In the legal department, they have an existing policy where they, I, I can't recall what it says exactly, uh, in, in loaning positions maybe up to six months and then they'll review it again. Loaning positions uh, to other departments from department to department, uh, the department that is providing the loan has to sign off on the loan to assure it have to has to do a workload analysis to make sure that their workload is not affected before they sign off on releasing that individual to the party that's going to receive the loan that in, that information historically goes up the channel and has to be signed off by the chief of field uh, historically I you know so when we begin to ask for something that actually exists it tells me that our issue here may be education because we've had these huge turnovers uh, in the various different um, silos in the in the agency and I'd be more than happy to provide uh, the administration with a uh, uh, with references to to this uh, in 2011 we we visit this again it was the state it was called by a uh, thin board member uh, we'll strike that it has been 2009 it was called by board member chain at the time it was his concern to distinguish between um, board sponsored events versus non board sponsors event and a whole policy was developed by the legal department I would suggest that we we, we take a look at that policy as well external affairs um, has submitted uh, plans and, and this information is also embodied in law that draws a clear distinction as to to to, to what should be done and uh, so um, I, I mean I look forward to it uh, to, 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 to what staff brings back but I really think uh, we should have spent more time and took a look at what exists this way staff could have advised the members here's what exists and here's what we can work on uh, and here's how we can improve that so uh, but let me just close by saying if our objective in doing all of this is to solve a problem one the problem has been solved and education may be education of that solution may be helpful Two, the problem that we face is 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 the violation of the 19 99 budget act the use of provision one positions and we ought to expeditiously expeditiously begin to address that instead of you know kind of working around it you know kind of work around it we shouldn't pretend that it doesn't exist we should just deal with it and um, and uh, resolve it Member yeah. oh, thank you um, chairman um, focusing on item number one <clears throat> I do agree that when it comes to conferences, um, the, the evaluation by the Department of Finance did highlight that provision of one positions were being used in a violation of the Budget Act. Um, and that provision one positions are uh, for all state agencies, including our sister agency, the Franchise Tax Board. 
which do not use provision of one positions, by the way, for the record, to support various tax seminars that they may come out for BOE. They use um, their taxpayer rights advocate positions. They may have previously been in the classification or in the classification of auditors or program specialists, but the positions that they hold in now are not revenue regenerating positions. I just want to make that for the record. But with respect to what's before us, um, it is our understanding that in addition to the provision of one position that was used at some of these conferences, the issue was raised that some of these conferences had limited or any nexus to the core mission of the Board of Equalization. So with that being in mind, I want to get clarification on how are you defining a conference, first in of all. Well, I'll okay. tell you, in our, in our ed outreach pro plan that we was approved back in January, in January, uh, conferences were defined um, and approved by the board. Okay. I looked so at I, we can go back and read that out. I don't have it in front I of me. I have it in front of me. Actually, I do. Actually, I have it in front of me. So. Okay, there you go. <laughs> actually, I think I do have it. They do. They, my yeah. staff did give it yeah, to they, me. Yeah, and they saw a conference is defined. I wanted to put Mark on the spot, but okay. <laughs> I got it here somewhere too. Uh, conference. We've all conference seen it in the book are, are four-day events on a larger scale than a small business tax <laughs> seminar. These events focus on business owners and topics covered in general sessions and breakout sessions that deal with a range of business development issues and tax compliance. Example of past conferences include Connecting Women to Power and International Trade Expo. Yeah. So based on that definition of a conference. If, in my hypothetical, if there was an all-day tax seminar that had a, a general session or a breakout session that dealt with um, taxes at the Board of Equalization and Ministers, and it also had one or two general breakout that dealt with non-BOE events, non-BOE tax administration, would that be something that's covered under this pending moratorium so that that type of event could not take place? Again, let's be clear here what just timing wise, okay? Mm -hmm. This is the, the, the idea of this particular item is to put a moratorium until we can establish then the, um, the, the, the 1718 outreach plan. Which comes out when again? Uh, in June. So we're only talking, you know, so at this point I think we're, so I mean, I think I think those are good discussions, and I, and I'll, certainly the mem uh, staff can can respond to it. But the reality is, if those aren't on the books right now, I mean, you know, it, it's not relevant because we're going to get to discuss this again. We get to talk about it by the to? time by the time we would do that. So, but I'll let staff respond to that. Well, I guess based on the reading of the memo, the way I would I would just respond is that it's a moratorium, but the standard small business and nonprofit seminars may continue. Mm -hmm. So that was where our, my impression of was the direction, was right. the intent. Well, I, I, members, I think it's helpful that we continue that because we've got a lot of staff. But again, those, those activities, and, and I certainly love to continue, those activities are uh, currently you know, in violation of provision one, it, when it, when a when an office conducts small business uh, classes in the board of equalization offices, which is somewhere around 160 of them that occurs uh, throughout the state, they're using tax auditors and tax compliance people to do that training. Uh, in, in in according to the budget act, mm -hmm. that's a violation of provision one, and so uh, the the evaluation that was done. It just the valuation selected examples, but the vi the the evaluation was clear, is that this uh, the 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 use of revenue generating position for non revenue generation or tax administration activity is throughout the entire agency, and so I, I, whereas I think there's wisdom, you know, in isolating this, uh, but by far is it solving uh, the problem, and so. Um, and I think we can probably uh, resolve this uh, expedition because everybody, the Department of Finance wants to participate, everyone wants to participate in the solution and just trying to Maybe we, to I think, I, actually I think there is, there is a solution in place even on those 
Yep. And so let me go, I'll go back to the uh, executive director in okay. regards to current processes of communication right. in regards to provision one. Right. So I believe Member Horton is correct. Provision one is paramount. That is what we need to deal with. And as of last week, put a we uh, request to do exactly that. Identify, and it's a universal issue. It's not just related to education outreach. It is. It's a. It is broad. So we are. We are doing a haul of hands on deck as we speak. Staff are working on identifying uh, any of those positions, and uh, so that that's uh, that is our prior to address right now. Yeah. This week. Well, Member I mean, Ma, which chairman? I'm, I'm sorry, I Member Ma. I'm I just wanted speak. to close up my thought, and then. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. And I'm done. Okay. Okay. Mr. So, because I was talking. Um, You're right. I want to make it clear that I, I do support um, putting a moratorium on conferences until we re deal with the 1718 education outreach plan. But with the understanding that I would like to, when we get there, be prepared to have some questions about conferences or whether or not they support the core mission of the BOE and be prepared to, um, and I, I, know, I know you guys are working on it, having a, a, a matrix in the budget showing the benefit for these various conferences to make sure that you're getting a high return on the investment. Yeah. Member Ma. Well, I, I think we've had um, a lot of legislative oversight and uh, the governor has weighed in to uh, restrict some of our um, delegation of authority. And are we talking about June, like next month? June? Two I months. Mean, I, well, two months. In two exactly. months. Well, you know, I, I, I think it would be wise and prudent um, if we just stopped everything until you all get a chance to go through every single program we have and make sure that we are not in violation of uh, provision one, even with our in-house uh, sales tax seminars in the offices, you know, our one-on-one -on -one consultations, um, you know, everything that we offer uh, to the public um, even our small business seminars, I only do the three, you know, hour small business seminars, but, you know, I would like to actually get clarification that we are not uh, in violation of, of those and that it passes muster because, you know, doing this like just big conferences, small conferences, it seems like there's more uh, things that are happening at the BOE and you all should get your hands wrapped around everything, get approval uh, from the powers to be that we are doing it correctly, that we have gotten all the sign-offs, gotten all the check-offs, um, you know, because that's what's been getting us into trouble is that we haven't been following exact protocol, in, in my opinion. So if, um, we, if we added in that line that along with the first part and review all, all seminars. Everything, um, everything. Well, well, again, the, again, everything's everything is everything. I don't know what everything hey, I, is, I, but I, hang on just a minute. And so we review all seminars. It's, well, I can tell you. Go back to the out, out back to the outreach plan. We called them. What was that category of seminar? The other category that we have. I think we was talking about something. But members, when we reduce it down hang to, on, hang on, hang to on. seminars, I, I, there on, is no on. de minimis rule in in provision well, one. Well, no, no, no. Hold on. It you didn't, you it haven't heard exist, Jerome. Provision you haven't heard what I've said wait, yet. Wait, wait, I wait, apologize. Wait, okay. Wait. What if we were to if we were to include all of our seminars? Okay. All outreach. Don't, don't we have that as a specific issue? We do. Okay. So if we were to go ahead and add in the language that would just say and review all seminars to ensure that there's not a violation of provision one employees, wouldn't would that solve the problem? Well, I, I think I think here's all, what I think okay. all the outreach seminars and events. Perhaps. Okay, seminar and events. events. Yeah. Okay. I'm now, now, what about do the webinars or the town halls? That doesn't violate provision one. Well, it's part of the plan, and it depends on who's working them. The town halls. Can I? So I, I mean, I'd like you all of our them. outreach events to be out. There. And okay, sure. that's my preference. Okay, so all outreach events before all outreach events. Yeah, outreach Everything. events. Everything. And then, in terms of make make sh in clarity that there is a proper use of provision one. Now, again, that means a couple of things to me. That means number one, we may determine in ourselves that it's an improper use and not do it. Or we may decide that we believe it's a proper use and therefore get go through the permission process. 
in order to use the provision one employee. Is that yeah. correct? Yeah. That would be okay. my understanding. Okay. 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 Member Harkey. Let me just let me just say what I'm what I'm really fearful of is that everything that's on the books is going to be ground to a screeching halt. And so what you don't want to do is that. What you want to do is just examine if there's any provision one staff attending any of these. And I think that can be done by just reviewing your, your outreach and yeah. asking right. the question of whoever is involved. Right. I don't, what I don't want to see is the things that are planned that the staff already has out in the mail and other things come to a halt. And I think we're getting kind of little, a little bit uh, over the top mm -hmm. with this. So what I, what I think is really important is that you you know, look at the provision one. I doubt that on the regular general business tax and things you're going to find provision one people. You may, but you know, I mean, I'm thinking that should be an easy find. You, you merely just check down the list mm -hmm. of who's attending, go to the IO supervisor who's attending, check them out on their, it's a general site that you can see every employee and what they're categorized and just check it out, be sure that they're all A-OK, -okay and give them the go-ahead. But let somebody do this and uh, certify it to you mm -hmm. so that you're not checking every event yourself. I, I, We're getting kind of yeah. bottlenecks at the ED level uh, for minutia. This is a big job, a big organization, so everybody just have your direct reports uh, report to you that they have verified these people and they're uh, um, you know or that or that you verified. I think people. member member Harkey's intent is important because what we wouldn't want to do misconstrue that concern to be all of a sudden creating problems for our outreach to taxpayers and not provide them the kind of education that we should be doing. Right. So I think most so of I the think that that's are not provisional. Right, one. right. Yeah. So I think that's important for us to review yeah. and ensure and, and with the intent of that discussion about review, <laughs> meaning to expedite so that we don't indeed create a problem with not being able to do outreach. Right. Member Horton. Thank you, Mr. Runner. Uh, members, um, I think what may need to happen is that legal and the executive staff make this decision and they take a look at provision one. Uh, my, yeah. my understanding of provision one is there is no de minimis rule. There is no rule that says if you use one, uh, use them for a day, you use them for a minute. Uh, and, and my understanding of provision one is that it's simple, you know, that all we have to do is take, for example, um, the marijuana project. Uh, my understanding, we may have four or five uh, revenue generating individuals on that project. Uh, make a list of them, send it over to Department of Finance, ask if this is okay. And uh, clearly, given Proposition 64 and uh, the other issues surrounding marijuana, that I would think that there's a cost benefit associated with that. There are 160 classes conducted in the Board of Equalization districts. Make a list of those classes, uh, send it over to, I'm not saying halt them, send them over to the Department of Finance, right. Right. have them take a look at it. Clearly, if you look at the Harris, uh, Harris uh, uh, study and a number of other study, it says that for every dollar spent in education, you have a five or six dollar return. And uh, the reality is the Board of Equalization, 98% compliance rate at the Board of Equalization collecting $62 billion, which is not a tribute to the few tax orders that we have out there. Our tax program generates $1 billion. So the other $61 billion is being self-compliance as a result of taxpayers being educated and comply. We need to make that argument expeditiously. When we participate, when you have a conference, a number of conferences are coming up, when uh, a tax uh, revenue position participates in there, that's a violation of, of the project. On the, when you have tax auditors come up to give advice to, on the cross project, or you go around and you talk to them, uh, if you visit the tax auditor and distract them from doing audits, that's a violation of Provision 1. As, as unreasonable as it may sound, uh, it is the Budget Act and, and something that can be fixed relatively simple. So I think, uh, again, that in the interest of being in compliance with, with uh, the Budget Act, that we uh, allow the agency uh, under the direction of the Executive Director make a list, do a cost-benefit analysis, 
have the discussion with the Department of Finance um, as to the, the benefit of those and, and then move forward. Isolating this to uh, large conferences says we're not aware of the, the minister's rule. Uh, we're not aware of the provisions. It says that we are putting a bandage on this problem. Um, we need to be clear that that's not the case. We also need to be clear that it's not conferences, it's not seminars, it is throughout the entire agency. Loan positions are throughout the entire agency. And so uh, the challenge has been is that uh, we've isolated this to members. Uh, when the agency uh, has far more usage of loan positions, far more uses of, of, of revenue positions than any member or collective members on the board. And quite frankly, I think that, that the assessment that was made by the agency was that it was a benefit, is that education has one of our greatest enforcement tools. Um, and so I don't, I don't suggest members that we, I mean, if you, we can put a moratorium on, on conferences they ain't solving the problem, and it's, it's not necessarily com communicating that we're serious about solving the problem. Uh, if we're serious about solving the problem, identify the problem in its totality, uh, and identify the solution and begin to move forward in implementing that solution. When we isolate ourselves to try to point fingers one way or the other, we don't get to the larger issue. So I think, the, the, as I understand then what was been requested, is um, and I think it accomplishes all of that and that is you take number one and then you add to it review all outreach events to ensure the proper use of provision one staff I think that accomplishes all of that right and that and then right? the, the rest of it is for policy we, we want to see the existing and the staff recommendation mm -hmm. on how we're going what we're going to do on well, the other three items no, well i mean i'm just dealing i'm, I'm getting i'm only being methodical i know about but this we don't have years. all day <laughs> well we have as much time everybody's we, everybody's muddled no, right no, now no, you're right so we have as much time to do this right as we had need so in in number one in number one then the idea of using number one with that review is with that is that under i just need a motion so you need to well, move well, forward yeah sure, sure, if Hold I on. may, sir, I, I also think, I mean, I, I would defer to, to, to the executive team, but I, I also think that the 160 conferences, education things that we do in the district, yep. uh, to hold those for a month. Uh, That's not to, what's being said. To, to, allow, to allow us to go through that process of, of determining if that, making sure that we're in compliance with provision one. I mean, I don't necessarily see anything wrong with that. Well, uh, the small business conferences that we do um, may be a little bit different. So I agree with Member Harkey that we've already expended um, possibly uh, notified people. People are aware they're coming. Right. Counseling may be more expensive right. than actually. So those small conferences maybe should go forth. Uh, we're already, excuse the expression, uh, we're, we're, the ship is already you know, sailed on that, and and so the large conferences. I've I've also uh, put that on hold as well. So if that's a concern, uh, let me relieve you of that concern. Um, in order to try to get to uh, solving the problem, one, let me just be clear: uh, the 160 education thing uh, thing we do in the districts on a regular basis. They're not 160; it's 160 annually. We should hold off. Uh, if there's any provision one person that is visiting uh, or going out to speak at a conference, even though I think just speaking at a conference or going to a conference, it, you're going there strictly for tax purposes, but it appears that that participation in conferences where other non-BOE activity may be taking place, well, you know, we send expert speakers all over, all over the state. Uh, we should probably hold off on that as well if they're provision one. Uh, employees we should you know probably hold off on that the provision one employees that are are on special projects uh, within the agency uh, we you know it's, it's just a month uh, projects not going to be hurt because the auditor can't give an advice and so forth as much as I love auditors and compliance people which I really do um, we can hold off that for a month 
Uh, I, I just think that when, when we go in and say we're not prepared to deal with the larger problem, but we want to isolate this to the conferences, anyone that reads the evaluation w will, 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 will understand that it's, it's a much bigger issue, as simple as it is. And, and for the life of me, I don't know why. Uh, back in 1991, or Ford, why we didn't comply? Because compliance is so simple. Um, uh, to comply with this is relatively simple, and we have an excellent reason for doing it in hindsight. Uh, but to not comply going forward when we know, had I known Provision 1 existed uh, to the extent that it does, and you know, I don't know how I missed it after spending so many years here, uh, uh, many of us. Uh, but um, uh, we, we could have put in the qualifications, get Department of Finance to sign off. In fact, it has a negative sign off. If you send it to them and they don't respond within 30 days, you can move forward. They got 30 days to respond. You send it over 30 days and they don't respond, you can move forward with your project. Uh, anyway. Again, it seems but to me that the that. it seems to me that the item covers good all that. Um, you know, if we review, where again the instruction is, or the motion is to review, or there hasn't been a motion yet. If there is a motion to this item that was added, to review all outreach events to ensure the proper use of provision one, I think that covers it all. Well, my, my right? motion. I mean, why, my, why, why my, don't my you motion, think it's my motion would be to to put. Uh, with the exception of the events, uh, put all the large conferences on hold. With the exception of the events that uh, the small business conferences that, that you've already advised taxpayers of, they're aware of, they're coming up, allow those to continue. Uh, also put on hold all the business uh, classes that occur at the district office, the e-filing and so forth, where Provision 1 is involved, or use non-Provision 1 employees in order to accomplish those objectives. All uh, expert visiting uh, where you're participating. Don't put, write everything down yet. Put, this is no, I know. I'm just, to it. So <laughs> just pay attention. I'm trying to hit the highlights. Up. No, that's okay. Put, 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 put those on hold as well. Um, and uh, for, for a month or so, um, and again, let me, let me just say, um, I don't want to, um, I would defer to, to, to the executive uh, team uh, and the legal and say that I mean, my ask David position one question. is to solve the problem. And, and my advice is to put it all on hold, and uh, as, I've, as I have articulated, until such time that you can report back to, 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 the, to the board, individually and collectively, that we've got a handle on this, and we're aware of what our exposure is. Let me ask the executive director. Here, here's what my concern with a broad issue like that is, number one, the issue that we're trying to get around, I think, is the proper use of Provision 1. That's okay. correct. That's yes. the issue. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me that is our objective, is the proper use of Provision 1. Well, globally. S globally. Yes. So again, it would seem to me if we go ahead and talk about the fact that all outreach events are supposed to be evaluated to ensure the proper use of Provision 1 staff, we've accomplished all of that without putting a moratorium on on, on, you know, without saying next, all of a sudden out of this meeting, if you have a conference scheduled with some taxpayers next Thursday, you can't do it. What we can do is decide that, that the proper employee is dealing with that in issue, or we go to finance and get the approval for them to be using that employee. That to me is, would be the better proper way for us to do this, and also then not disadvantage taxpayers in the process. So well, I think I we're trying to get to the same issue I in regards to the, the proper thing, use, Mr. Runner, except it w it's not just conferences. Uh, let's be clear. Here. No, no, I said all. I said all. Hold, it's not business seminars. It is they're used in in the agency for a number of different reasons. Other than that, you've got to evaluate as as uh, Mr. Gal, our executive director, indicate. This is a global issue for the agency, and and I agree with everything you said, Mr. Runner. I concur. I, I would second that if you would if you would expand it to a more global assessment uh, that uh, encompasses uh, all the current uh, potential misuse 
uh, Provision 1 employees. Well, I, I don't have any problem with adding to the issue. In addition, making sure that all Provision 1 employees are used in the proper way. Okay, Kent, let's... Does that, does let's that let me, I'm just asking, is that, would that accomplish that? Yes, because I, what I'm hearing is uh, we're talking about uh, a subset of the global Provision 1 issue here mm -hmm. when we're talking about conferences. So, you know, with with uh, uh, the uh, the attention and and our uh, need to comply with provision one where we aren't, that uh, certainly any whatever the board's direction is with respect to small businesses uh, seminars or conferences, that anything that comes through, Mar Mr. DeSalo or my offices, I want to make sure we're not using a provision one person at an event. But I think that's Mr. not Hart appropriate. Mr. But Mr. Horton's talking about a broader and aspect, and we are doing that as well because I th we are inventorying our agency as we speak to identify where we may, if we are out of compliance, identify it, and then if there is a conversation that we in education and a, co a conversation uh, and decision making we need to have with the Department of Finance mm -hmm. to. Um, uh, are they a pr are there any that we need to feel like we need to go forward and ask for an exception to or or, or cool. sign or are those Remember that Harkey, we're just not Harkey's been we're just taking the these back you know? okay I I think we need to separate these things I think that provision one is a huge global issue yes so I think that first pose impose a moratorium until June till we figure out what we're doing on the large conferences and. Um, I think that's a that's a separate issue. We've done that. I know Mr. Horton has. I have. We're, that's done. So that's probably the one. And the second subset of that would be review all outreach events uh, as simply as possible. Like you know, get to your people mm -hmm. and review all yes. outreach events and ensure the proper use uh, that the, you know if provision one employees are being used that management is aware and can can justify somehow is that a motion the the use of it yeah that would be the second part is that, or a motion? Th that could be a motion second okay then then the i'm then i'm not then the, just a the minute just right, just right. just a minute please because we've had a lot of discussion on this Ooh, there well, is a larger the first and second the first and covers. second well i'm still discussing <laughs> okay there is a larger global issue on provision one right. in uh statewide I believe and yes. even though maybe a uh, certain angel agency isn't doing something in one direction they might be doing something somewhere else I think if if there if everything's perfect at every other agency in the state then I'm very happy with that and we're the bad guys but I somehow I think that the BOE is not unique in a lot of what it's a lot of what's gone on I just have this feeling so you know I, yeah, I can be proven wrong but I think that we need to look at for the BOE globally provision one employees and I think you're doing that now and then that's something you need to report right. back to the board with what you've discovered when you discover it um, and uh, so to get us through this particular item to get us through this particular item the and to also was. the motion is there's two parts to the motion one is to impo you know impose a moratorium mm -hmm. on all conferences to the 2017-18 outreach has been approved by the board standard uh, uh, you know standard and small business nonprofits tax seminars may continue and and any other outreach may continue pending review of appropriate uh, Alloc allocation of employees are uh, pending review of compliance with provision compliance with provision one guidelines. That's good. Okay, so that's number one. Number okay. two, the second well, subset. Can we can we dispense that? Because that's a motion on that. Or are you going to add to the, that? that I was going to add. A, I was going to add. A, I was going to so. bifurcate yes. my motion. That that's part one and part two, to keep to be sure we we don't lose track of it is to have staff review all provision one within the Board of Equalization and report back to the board at a date as soon as possible, maybe by next board hearing, let us know where you are, um, by next board hearing as to what the situation is with Provision 1 employees and what we might need to do to go forward. Let me ask, uh, I, I, I'm fine with those. I think those are good, good ideas. The only thing I want is I don't want to be misconstrued. I'm concerned in regards to a report. What I'd like, and because and I, I think this is what we're doing, we're doing an immediate evaluation and correction. Yes. So the report isn't to, my understand, just to make sure we understand, the report isn't to tell us 
what we need to do, we want to written, we want to know what they've done in terms of the correction, right? That's correct. Right. Okay. We, I don't want to wait a month to take whatever right. necessary correction right. actions that uh, no, may be necessary. You, you don't have to come so, back but we to will us report to, back what to we did. review. Right. You don't have to come yeah. back to us to review your current events and Thank be you. sure you're okay. We trust you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Handle that. To take care right. of it quickly. Yes. Handle okay. that. So we those are the, that's a part one and part two of a but motion. But the part two is to is a global okay which responds to what member horton wants to do he wants a global approach asap and mm -hmm. report back to the board now m okay so is there a motion i made a motion yeah is there a Two second parts. second okay there's a second discussion okay now there's discussion um uh, I, I, i'm i'm supportive of that although i still believe that it is it is limited i mean that it we should do a broader uh moratorium uh, on the activities oh. that are being conducted currently. Uh, and, and I think that uh, the direction to the executive team would be to the extent that they find, uh, which we all know exists, uh, violation of provision one throughout this agency, yeah. uh, that the executive director stop it uh, when it is economically feasible, there's no disadvantage to the taxpayers and so forth until such time that you can get a sign off from uh, Department of Finance or notify them e immediately. So I would broaden that to incorporate well, I think, that. I think it's. I think, it's, I think that's kind of the under. Let, I think currently that is that what's going on currently. It is, and that's what I heard as part of the mo and just to confirm of the board direction. We are doing that as well, but also the board's direction as part of that motion was that all provision ones we will deal with immediately where necessary and report to the board our Any results of that as well correction and, and yes with okay. that understanding i'd be supportive okay Mr. Chair. okay so there's a motion and a second objection no objection okay so let's tell, let's kind of walk through the next couple ones um, the next one was to create and implement an approval process to include review of the executive director with notification sent to all board members for any event which, which more than five BOE employees are requested to attend. If the executive director objects to an event an employee or employee participation, the requesting board member may add the matter to an agenda for a full review of the discussion. Um, that's... And again, what these would be would be then policies that would be done then by the administration by or by by the ED um, and create this this process um, and uh, would report back to the board then in regards to to uh, that policy. So discussion, discussion on that item. Member Runner. Yes. Yes. Um, Go ahead, uh, Member Horton. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Chairman Runner. Um, Members, I, I believe that the ED ought to have the authority to reject um, uh, any use of staff in any way whatsoever. It doesn't have to come back to this board for that purposes. Um, and, and as long as that rejection is, is in accordance with uh, Government Code 17804 through 7801 and 15623 and the others, which I'm sure we're all familiar with, um, and and so so you like to take it, the last line out it, I just don't see yes okay. to not have it come back to the okay. board uh, the second uh, thing uh, is that the policy exists uh, the policy exists where uh, the executive director has the authority to sign off on the uses of staff has the authority to sign off on any education and outreach events. We provided that authority in the resolution of conferring powers. Uh, it's also spelled out in BEAM. It's also spelled out in the policy that we passed on small and large moratoriums. I mean, small and non, excuse me, board of equalization events and non board of equalization events. So, what we may be looking for is an education where. Uh, uh, the direction would be to to immediately have a class with all of the decision makers mm -hmm. in the organization down to the district administrators and his two supervisors on the compliance and side to educate them about the uh, the rules that are applied uh, and so forth and then uh, 
maybe the formation of a team with the representative from the ED, uh, external affairs, and legal to review every uh, transaction, which I thought was currently the process, and I do it believe was. is the current process. And I do believe that there's evidence that every transaction uh, in question has actually gone through that process of evaluation, inc including a cost-benefit analysis, including a legal determination of the governmental purpose of it. Uh, and the challenge was is that the Department of Finance just didn't, wasn't aware of the process and wasn't provided the information of when the various events were approved. For example, uh, the VITA events dates back to 2004. The outreach plan has been approved from 2004 forward. They have all gone through the legal analysis, all gone through an analysis with external affairs, all been signed off by uh, the external director at the time. In fact, we actually submitted for a $4,000 grant uh, for the VITA program because we everyone was supportive of it, thought it had a governmental purpose until the evaluation came out and whoops, well, maybe it doesn't. Uh, so uh, there's a process that's there. And it's the fact that that process is not deemed to be there and not understood to be there is where the inherent challenge is. And I think it's important that we begin to make everyone aware. Well, that would be that. then, that would be, I would think, the report that would be brought back on this issue. And then whether well, or not. Well, Mr. Mr. Chair, uh, I don't know that we have time for a report to come back a month from now. I think it's important that the, uh, the, the executive director has the autonomy uh, to do this expeditiously immediately. I actually believe that we don't need to give him that authority. He, he has that authority under the conferring powers. When, when the board conferred the powers for the executive manager, uh, executive uh, director to manage this organization, uh, we gave him that power. Then the board uh, should just you know acknowledge that he has the power and allow him and his team to begin to educate folks about that. I would suggest a review of BEAM, a review by the executive team. I mean, our, our legal team is new in their position. Our external director is doing a good job, but he's new in our position and so forth. And the same thing with RD. And so that education process has to take place expeditiously. Uh, I, I welcome a report a month from now. You know, but between now and a month, you know, uh, who knows, you know, what might be ha happening. I, I think, uh, for me, you have the authority to do take the actions you need to take now to make sure that folks are aware of existing. So policy. I think we accomplish this then by simply, we don't need a report back. No. The, 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 the ED can just uh, review and uh, send out a memo and say this is what we're doing and this is what I understand the authority is, well, correct? Mr. Chair, let me clarify right. here. Just, I mean, just asking the, the That would be my understanding. And if we need to, to put anything in, a, uh, in the education outreach plan that comes right. forward in June to memorialize anything, we could do it, so I don't think, enhance yeah, it that I don't think, way as well. I don't think we need to wait a month for it. I think we can establish it now. But yeah. let me say That's this. Uh, it's just, this is our conversation. Um, uh, I mean, working for this agency 22 years before I came here, we used to get those green memos all the time. And I, I dare tell you what happened, uh, Dick, Mr. Mr. Gow, you probably know as well as I Policy what happens memos. to those green memos. Um, what needs to happen in, in my mind is an immediate calling of all the executive team to go over existing policy, education, make sure they're aware, and pull up the line management to begin to do that. We have some very talented folks within the, the agency, uh, and I think the making them aware as opposed to just sending a memo is very important. Sir. So if this board believes it has that the ED has the ability to do number two, that's fine. We're just okay. reminding I, them of that. Member Har Harkey. I think number two might need to be amended that to have the uh, have the executive director uh, with notification or not with notification, have the executive director review and uh, uh, revise an approval process if necessary. Um, which he which he has the authority to do under conferring powers and for any events where more than five employees are requested mm -hmm. to attend mm -hmm. that's good 
I'm good with that. And then, you know, I think I think it would be nice to report or let the let have everybody know. I mean, send out whatever notification right. needs to be sent mm -hmm. out, and also probably to CC the board. Yeah, that accomplishes that accomplishes number two, Mr. Chair. Yes. If I may. Um, Again, I don't see, I don't believe that there is a de minimis rule uh, that you can have one, two, three, four. You can't be partially, uh, you can't be partially at sale. You're either at sale or, or not. So uh, the five or more, um, I, I, I don't want to handcuff the, you know, the, the, the I don't want to say that uh, the agency has the authority to violate uh, the budget act when it's four, you know, uh, I think um, I think regardless of the number, um, the executive director has the authority, and I think communicating that the executive executive team has the authority. And I would I would basically let me just make it short. Eliminate the number five. I mean, I, I don't know okay. where you, I don't know where that number came from in the first place, but eliminate the number five. Period. Um, take a look at it. Uh, if it's in compliance, it's in compliance. Go through the review process, the legal review process. Go through the evaluation of external affairs, um, and and wh whomever else the executive director deems necessary to review these in order to assure that we are in compliance with the with the various provision, and make a decision. And um, I, I, you know, I for one will follow that decision. I think that's where the problem lied. You know, nobody knew, nobody understood what the rules were. Uh, although I think in, in every case we made sure that you follow those rules because we did know what they were. Let me just ask Mr. Gow then, at that point through this discussion, um, do you believe that you understand your authority well enough that that is the intent of, of uh, item number two? Uh, you know, in all honesty, I think I do, and I think that uh, <laughs> with the you. results <laughs> and the uh, weeks and months to come will uh, okay. Okay, what, prove that out. Remember Harky? One more comment on right? that. Thank you. I want and again. I don't want everything to get log jammed at the ED level, just because we yes. say ED here. Right. You can assign. You know. I right, mean, and I will, and I and okay, we we do have sure. levels of approval, and and we will. Make sure that people, that everybody understands the things to question, things to ask about, yeah. and make sure that they get asked before it gets to my office. I just, yeah, I just want to be sure at the lowest level. When I was listening to those hearings, it's like everything stops at the ED. We could just, we could just bottleneck this. It's a busy right, office. Right, right, I want right. to be sure that we're we're clear. That okay. You have number three was draft an issue paper, an issue paper, and policy and propose a policy on loaned and redirected staff, considering putting. Consider putting, and this would be the direction of what to consider, yeah. an MOU in place within 60 days for all loaned redirected staff pending the development of an issue paper and adoption of the policy. MOUs shall clearly state the purpose and duration of the loan and redirection issue. Okay. Remember, go, okay. Remember, uh, the only thing I want I want oh. to I want to kind of segment those because loaned is different than redirected. Okay, let's and, talk, let's hear. And that. I'm not good. sure gotcha. if redirected is even a proper term. Um, what what I think we're getting to in redirected is again provision one. Okay, and I think you, you uh, if I may, each of those is something to distinguish between. And so you're right. right. And so provision one, paramount of of concern is we don't violate provision one. Mm -hmm. Now, what we're talking about, I believe, where the genesis of the loan and whether you call it a redirection, um, a loan to me is sometimes of a, a it could longer be term. a little longer duration. Thank you. That's exactly what I was going to say. And we to, have... To, to stop the confusion here, would it be better if we just dropped a redirection and just discuss loan? I think so, uh, but okay. I, I think agree. redirection okay, let's do that. is let's do that, only used right. in connection so let's with let's the... So let's not worry about the right. phrase redirection, okay. but just use the word loan. All right. So I will just we will talk about loans. And what loans have uh, done, um, there have been informal loans there have been some th that have been more formal what we have modeled lately and we have not done these uh, in many months and the last one we did was uh, through a formal memorandum of under a, a memorandum and it, it modeled what legal had done uh, mr. member Horton had mentioned the legal uh, process that they had done when sometimes uh, maybe a member's office is Oh, and this isn't just member issues. We do, so, um, just so you know, we do have done loans between departments and other things. But <coughs> this is where it has really 
uh, become an issue with at some of the member offices. But we we have uh, we are trying to model that. We have a draft already <coughs> of a loan uh, process, okay. and 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 the and what you will see when it comes out is where are those. Not to say that loans can't be appropriate uh, uh, um, in certain circumstances, <laughs> but what are those cir circumstances that the board and we we will make a recommendation that you agree on will agree on is what are those uh, kind of work assignments or or training and development assignments or where there's an opportunity to gain some knowledge or maybe something and what is the duration and then we need to abide by those durations and if if it, that means then somebody uh, somebody else gets a turn or an opportunity to be loaned because there could be some value in that then somebody else gets that so that's what I would like for us to bring, uh, that I would like to propose to the board. Okay, and you could do that. And when you say propose to the board, do you mean in terms of a, uh, at, a, at, a, at, a, at our next meeting, or would that be something that you would just go ahead and do memo to the board saying this is the policy in regards to loan? It needs to be issue paper. Well, well that's what I'm, 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 what would your intent be? Well, I think that we've got a pretty good understanding of those those areas, and if I would welcome thoughts on it, and I'll talk to our staff too. Um, I I could put it out there, and if you if you uh, want to bring it to the board, we certainly can. I mean, that's mm -hmm. the, the board's progress. Because here's so here's again, I would, I'm, I would I'm, I'm, I'm with yeah. I'm with I, Member Horton on some yeah. of this stuff. I don't I don't it, I mean, if we know if we know the solution now, right? I don't necessarily think we need to wait. Yeah. Uh, okay. You know, I, I mean, and so let me, I'm, member Hart, may, oh, go ahead. Me actually, member Harkey was speaking yeah. there, and I'll go back to I, Thank you. I just, my problem is, is that a lot of the stuff we don't see again. We don't even know if it's fixed. We don't hear about it. We have public hearing. Bring it to the board. Show us what's up. You know, I mean, we have to get back to these issue papers. This is why we're doing it. Mm -hmm. This is the way we think it works. This is going to be our beam policy. And so here it is. Sorry. And I, we need to see it because yeah. we, we lack uh, communication and education. I'm right. not sitting in Sacramento 24-7 that I can just roam around over to headquarters. I need to get some information when I come to the hearings. Okay, so thank you. That is exactly, and I, and I spoke about a governance process recently at a hearing, and, and it is really starting to uh, gain momentum. Okay. And we talked about silos. This process has people throughout all departments in the agency participate so you'll get that robust input that we need to make the bring the issue papers forward with a strong staff recommendation I, th I in my heart that's what I believe we need to do we need okay. to come back and get back to s strong staff recommendations in issue papers with alternatives okay and uh, we can we'll do that okay member Horton you were thought uh, thank you mr. chair um, the members I think is a lot of wisdom and um, and 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 defining the problem, I think it's important to define the problem um, instead of allowing you know others to define the problem at the Board of Equalization. Mm -hmm. We need to define it publicly, discuss the problem. Um, and I mean, as I see it, loan positions are throughout the agencies. There are a number of areas where loan <coughs> positions, and there is a process in each one of these. Each position that has been on loan, someone in the agency has signed off on them. There's been an approval process. Uh, we have our T&D assignment, which we're all familiar with, training and development assignment that dates back to, to, to my recollection to Board Member Fong um, years ago who, who had T&D assignments in the member's office, and those assignments continue to exist. Uh, internship programs throughout the agency where we're bringing individuals in and they're actually working in the auditing compliance department as interns under a six-month program with an agreement with the universities. Uh, the legal department has a number of uh, positions that theoretically are loan positioned by the length of their term and so forth. So these loan positions exist in the agency. We need to, to identify them, put them on a sheet of paper, say here's where they all are and then make an evaluation of a cost benefit. Is it, is it beneficial for this loan position to be there? And if it's not, take it away. Right. Um, and I believe that the executive director has that authority on the conferring powers, and all that needs to happen is the execution of that authority. The board doesn't need to give that authority. Uh, it, it exists. Uh, the policies exist as well. But to Member Harkey's um, uh, comment, 
I think it's important that we discuss these policies publicly. Mm -hmm. in, in, in an informational hearing, we don't need to approve it, right. but in an informational hearing, come forth, tell us what our existing policies are, tell us, you know, what, you know, after you've corrected the things you needed to correct, um, this is the way it looks now, this is how the organization looks now, these loan positions, mm -hmm. and if you feel present to us if you feel that these positions are productive for this agency you know we're in a very fortunate position that this agency for every dollar invested in the agency we generate 252 dollars the most productive agency in the nation if you ask me most efficient agency in the nation from that perspective and so we're talking about I mean if you look at the evaluation they, look, they looked at 2.6 million dollars thousands of dollars and 2.6 million dollars certainly wasn't their intent if you keep things in perspective to say prospectively this is the real issue uh, the issue is having the governance as as the executive director in place the institutional structure which and making sure that people know about these policies you know it is it is the administration has the authority it has the responsibility if you ask me uh, to evaluate and so forth and I'm just simply saying do your thing right you know and make so it happen thank you and what I would like to, to do obviously we have issues that will be appropriate for the, the whether it's the the property tax committee the business tax committee ledge committee customer service there's also an opportunity I believe in the agenda and we'll look for uh, look, what I would like to offer is the executive director's report that make more use of the executive director's report to bring not decision maybe making kind of items but things that we believe are good policy and here and, and for the public consumption at a hearing uh, for us to, uh, for me to be able to explain what we're doing with certain things in the agency. Okay. Another direction you can go, Mr. Gow, is that you, you could utilize the, the board's policy as far as amending BEAM. Uh, although, yes. although, and so that has required to go through the board. When you're amending being to that extent, maybe one of the ways you can kind of communicate and engage us in that process and have a public discussion about it, go through that entire process and say, okay, we're going to amend being, we're going to have the interested parties. I would extend it to interested party, even though traditionally you may not, so that, so that folks who are interested, yes. you know, really, really interested in government have an opportunity to take a look at the existing policy and whatever a recommendation, then it comes to the board, another public discussion, we confirm the amendment to Beam. Um, uh, and I know I'm being redundant to this. I mean, I must have read Beam a hundred times. So I think it's all there. Yes. I think the, uh, that th this organization has been around for uh, since 1879. And, th and the issues facing this organization didn't just happen over right. the last two years. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. So uh, the structure has been in place. It's been functioning. And it's there. We just need to make sure everybody knows it's there and everybody complies with it. Yeah. What okay. I would like to, do, um, if I may, uh, mm -hmm. with respect to the chairman, if I may, uh, with respect to Beam, uh, it is a, it's a very valuable manual. Uh, there's Miss Kim Thomas is in, uh, helps head that up. I th what I would like to see us do is go through that. It needs to be updated in certain areas. It, maybe we need new uh, policies in certain areas, uh, but we need to uh, make uh, uh, do some rigor on going through the B manual. Okay, um, let me just back up there, and then then in regards to item three, um, you feel like you have adequate direction then from the board in terms of moving forward with those issues. I do. Okay. And, and we have okay. thoughts on what we okay. need to do for the one. Uh, the, the last one. item is item four. Establish a clearance process for videos, webinars, telephone, town halls, which utilize similar processes that already are in place for print and in-person activities. Um, this is one I think that um, was brought to us in regards to the concern that we we have some things are pretty clear in terms of steps and processes, but some aren't. And so this is the idea of asking, basically, this is basically through outreach, yeah. could developing a policy that would encompass these other kinds of programs and approval processes. For instance, right now, I think, for instance, on videos, we get a script approved, but there's not necessarily approval of the end product, where the end product may be very different from the script. And so we need to, uh, to me, that's why we need to come up with a policy to review that. Yeah, and Go I've ahead. heard some frustration too, Chairman Runner, that the agency can do its own webinars and where board members feel like they're held to a different standard. And we need to work on that a little bit, flush that out a little bit. So this would be, again, the staff coming back, 
uh, or looking at establishing the policy and the yes. process and coming back at either an ED report or something back to us to establish what that policy is. Yeah. Right. Any discussion on that, Mr. Members? Chair? Um, yes, Member Horton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, we webinars are communications. They all fall under the same existing policies. Uh, legal has to review uh, the initial process of, of preparing for the webinar uh, for the purpose, at that point, more for to assure that we don't get off into something, begin to expend revenue on something that has no governmental purpose whatsoever or, or does something that advertises something that we shouldn't advertise and so forth. Uh, that's, that's my understanding of the existing policy. Correct. Once the uh, once the video is signed off, uh, there's another legal review. Uh, that's my understanding as well of the existing policy to assure that the original opinion issued by legal is consistent with the final product. Right. And then at that point, the designee of the executive director, he probably needs a couple of chief of staffs, but you know, designee of the executive director uh, then has to sign off before it goes public. Um, and that's the existing process uh, that's been around for the last 40 years, to my understanding. And, and so this is another one of those where I, I think. I'm not sure that is the exact. That's where I, I, we're I'm, I'm not sure that that's that the being under, followed. It's that's not being followed. followed. Maybe it's not being followed. Or that's no, the understanding. That's but to my understanding, that, that's how so, it's So the, maybe the word, again, this is, well, let staff deal with this, but maybe the wrong word is established. Maybe it's the issue to is review and implement. Review and implement. revise. <laughs> right. So, if necessary. But again, yeah. I think, again, I would, I would just go back to staff there. Do you, I mean, at that point, is that instruction pretty clear on number four? Yeah. Um, the, the, I'm looking at Mr. DeSalle, but yeah, I believe so. Mr. Chair, if I may, Mr. Yeah. DeSalle did, did bring up a point that I, that I think it's, I think it's important. Um, the, um, the town hall meetings can go astray. I mean, it's a, it's a live activity. Yeah. Something, you know, the taxpayer comes up and say it's crazy things mm -hmm, and so mm -hmm. forth, which they're certainly entitled to, to, to say they can go astray. Um, uh, to some extent, m maybe someone should be present. Uh, uh, I forget what you call them. Um, a delay? Pardon? We, we often use a delay. A delay, but yeah. no, you, you have, the, there's an individual present that's kind of like orchestrate or facilitates a meeting or something like that at those. The moderator. Just, just to assist with some experience, knowledge about uh, the agenda, and we stay consistent with the, with the agenda. Um, and I, I think these same restrictions should probably apply to, uh, to information which may address your concern to anything that is developed by the board members office themselves that we have to submit that information for the same approval process because in effect we are the agency uh, and go through that same approval process as well which is my understanding of existing law but may be part of your concern yeah we're not far off the mark I, I would say that uh, Dan Elliott who works in my shop does a great job working with all of you on the scripts working with legal I think the key word is implementation. Yeah. Okay. Consistent. Yeah. Okay. So I think if we understand that process, then I think we're good. And we do. I think we just want to make sure you know we're consistent. Gone through our four items. The other way. The other okay. Way. Yeah. That brings us to the conclusion of the uh, CSAE committee, and um, we will adjourn. Good discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Miss Richmond, we've been asked to take something out of order because we have persons in the audience that would like to speak and so let's go to P4 so our next item is P4 the field operations department report item P41 is the cash payment acceptance alternatives okay I wanted to bring this forward because I keep hearing rumors and here again I don't know what's going on and it's really hard to remember to ask Wayne about each and every issue so I thought a Nice discussion uh, and information sharing would be good because we had some plans and I think we're implementing some of them. Some of them are not and some of them are still proceeding. And so, Wayne, with that, let's just turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mashihara. Okay, good afternoon, Chairman, Chairwoman Harkey and members. My name is Wayne Mashihara and I'm the Deputy Director for the Field Operations Department. 
At the December 14, 2016 board meeting, we discussed issue paper 16-3, cash payment acceptance alternatives prepared by the BOE Risk and Audit Oversight Governance Action Committee describing five alternatives for accepting cash payments. At your request, I am here today to follow up on our efforts to manage cash payments. Prior to providing you with this update, I would like first to provide a high-level recap of BOE's no cash policy and the services and improvements we have made to, we have implemented to increase safety. The no cash policy was issued on February 3rd, 2014. The policy calls for the staff to encourage taxpayers to pay online using their bank account information or alternatively convert their cash to a money order or check to tender payment. Recognizing this policy may pose a hardship for cash-based businesses that are unable to open a bank account, it provides an exemption for taxpayers who demonstrate a hardship if they are unable to pay in cash. The exemption request is reviewed by the district administrator or their designee for approval or denial. Some district offices continue to receive cash transactions due to this exemption. The safety measures that we have implemented including providing them with privacy screens to obstruct the line of sight between the public cashier window and the staff cashier window, an assessment by the BOE's physical security branch uh, uh, of the number and placement of security cameras in our offices, uh, the installation of additional cameras and modifications of existing uh, cameras to capture interaction with taxpayers and as a deterrent to those with uh, less scrupulous intentions. The physical security branch also executed a contract with the California Highway Patrol to provide protective services to be called upon by the district offices as needed. Uh, we have also purchased new currency counters for the five offices that have demonstrated a need due to cash volume. This improved the accuracy of cash counting and counterfeit currency detection. We continue to pursue an additional 17 currency machines to be placed in all public district offices. The BOE continues to address the acceptance of large amounts of cash payments to ensure taxpayers are in compliance with their reporting and payment obligations and to ensure the safety of BOE employees and the public. I am pleased to announce that the BOE has recently partnered with an outside entity to accept cash payments at non-BOE facilities and that is available on a statewide basis. Without specifically identifying the outside entity or locations, I can tell you that each in-state BOE field office has a, a, a potentially safer and more secure location near their office to accept cash payments. This temporary partnership addresses an immediate need for safe and secure off-site locations for accepting cash. I can also share that the BOE is nearing another temporary partnership with an outside entity that will provide another more potentially safer and secure non-BOE facility in the Southern California area for accepting cash. We are also considering other long-term solutions for accepting cash payments at non-BOE facilities, and I can provide you updates as these efforts move closer to fruition. I wanted to share an update also on the, uh, 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 an update on what we had previously discussed as involving the possible conversion of the vacant Santa Ana building for cash acceptance. After further review, we now find this site unsuitable for our needs and we will no longer be pursuing this option. At the December board meeting, concerns were raised regarding uniformity in accepting hardship exemption and requests. Following the December meeting, I had requested each district administrator to notify me whenever a denial of a hardship, con a hardship exemption is contemplated so that I can ensure that uh, we are more consistent in handling of all requests. Also, another concern raised at the December board meeting involved the possible uh, payment of money uh, issue, uh, uh, issues associated with taxpayers reporting and paying cash based upon uh, over making overpayments on returns filed and later amending such returns to request a refund. I had previously surveyed our district offices and found no indication that or pattern that this was occurring. I recently communicated with our assistant chiefs of field operations regarding this matter and again received no indication that this is occurring. BOE continues to collaborate with the state treasurer's office in researching cash collection options and opportunities from various entities that offer deposit and banking tools. And uh, we uh, are also actively cons still pursuing uh, 
the uh, off-site uh, locations to see uh, what potential facilities may suit our purposes uh, in those areas. This concludes my presentation, and I'm available to answer questions for you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Member Horton. Thank, sorry, you, ma you thank you, Madam Chair and Member um, <clears throat> This is my first time hearing about contracting with outside services to uh, do uh, tax collection. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? No, no we're not uh, contracting uh, outside agencies to, I mean, outside contractors to do tax collection. There's I mean, an outside ent entity that's collecting tax for the it's agency? Assisting. Oh, or yeah. Is there well, a, well, those uh, are, yes, other uh, governmental agencies. Maybe you can bifurcate them, and, and let me okay. see if I can do that with my question. There's an outside entity that uh, the Board of Equalization interfaces with in the, the transaction where the Board of Equalization receives the money and then transfers it to this other entity? Is that what happens in that example? Okay, that example we're talking about basically a field collection made by our collection staff. We collect the money from the taxpayer and then we have a arrangement worked out with a outside entity, a financial got it, institution. Got it. You don't have to go any further. Yes. I understand that. Uh, then um, in reference to an outside entity, tell me the other example. The other example is that uh, we are looking at trying to secure a um, partnership with a uh, state agency or other governmental agencies so that uh, we can uh, utilize facilities that uh, might be more safer and more secure for handling the cash payments. And I understand the background. I also understand the, the need for confidentiality, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, let me just share my concern with that, is that um, I, any contracting out where other people are being hired, I think should come before the board to have a decision about whether or not, you know, that's a, that's a contracting out of jobs and opportunities that could be availed to our employees. Um, that would be uh, a concern to mine. The other concern would be a, a, a legal opinion that uh, states that uh, we are we are allowed to authorize someone other than the Board of Equalization to collect the taxes and that in fact is in compliance with the federal money laundering law and um, which gives us you know the the authority somewhat because it's perceived to be uh, a taxes at the time that they report and bring it here uh, bring it to the agency the the other thing that I would encourage is is that we're working on, uh, we, there's legislation that's moving through the process um, that establishes the tax collected under the marijuana Proposition 64 and the other laws as being held in trust. I would encourage the agency to take a really good look at that, a legal department. We've asked for it, I think, for the last year. The uh, for a legal opinion as to whether or not if those funds are held in trust uh, by the entity, then is that, in a, is that in violation of the money laundering rule? And can we actually send a uh, armored truck to pick up the funds from the location because it's considered held in trust? Currently is not considered held in trust until such time that the funds is actually filed and paid with the board. Uh, the, the, the other thing, I, I want to make it clear that, you know, I'm supportive of the current cash policy. My concern is that we may not be looking at this in perspective as it relates to our employees. Every cartel criminal operation in the world is in this business. And one foot in the legal side, the other foot in the illegal side. They enter our offices with two armed guards with guns. And they have another armed guard in the 
in the car waiting on them. And so how many armed guards do we have at the time? We can call them after the fact, but we have none, none whatsoever. And so I think that the agency should give the employees, the employees who have to participate in this, an option to participate in a level of assurance, a level of security, a level of, of, of insurance that this is not your regular taxpayer walking in making a payment from, you know, the hamburger shop, you know. And so nowhere else in the world can you go and, and gain access illegally to three, four hundred thousand dollars. Uh, you can't even go to the bank. The bank doesn't have to carry that kinds of, of funds. And so I think there's a, a huge risk associated with this. And, and, and mindful, I, I actually believe that there are significant number of taxpayers who are legally complying and doing everything they can to comply with this industry. But if you look at the studies, it says that that's like 57 percent. The other percent are just pure criminals that use these funds for human trafficking, prostitution, gun trafficking, and so forth. And, and, and they have legal operations where they come in, they want to pay their taxes because, you know, they want to be in compliance if it ever, it, a system is ever actually put in place. And theoretically speaking, when you have that increased risk, for those who want to participate, there's also increased compensation to reflect the risk that you're taking. And so we, we might want to take a look at uh, talking to CalHR or whoever we need to talk to, to to assure that the employees who decide that they want to take this risk, it's their call, uh, decide they want to participate in this process, to have the appropriate, in addition to insurance, assurance, and all the other things, the appropriate compensation uh, to make sure that they're properly compensated uh, for taking that additional risk. This is not your normal, in, in my mind, you know, I, uh, it's not your normal activity. Uh, and so let me just uh, encourage that. In summary, uh, give the employees who, I don't see it as appropriate to have um, the administrator direct a cashier that you're going to take this risk and you're going to go in there and participate in that. I don't think that's appropriate. I think they need to make their call. If they do decide, I think there's a level of compensation that should be there, level of insurance, bonding, and everything else that needs to be there, whatever that security could be. And at the same time, we need to make sure the facilities are secure. These two, these two um, alternatives are good alternatives because I've seen the facility, and it's, you know you you got to go through is is secure. You know, and I and and you got to go all up these elevators in order to get to it, and that's but but they're coming into this district office. They walk in this district office right now um, with two hundred thousand two hundred thousand dollars worth of cash, three or four armed guards, and if something goes wrong, everybody in this room is at risk. And the agency that is accepting the cash, I appreciate the confidentiality. Because to the extent that I know they're accepting the cash in, the, in this process uh, and they're taking the risk of violating the money laundry rules uh, and losing their federal insurance, I'm taking my money out because I, you know, I need to have mine insured and I want to run that risk. So if you can't tell the public who they are, make sure you let me know. Okay, Member Ma. Yeah. Um, so the other 17 cash counters, um, is that for all the remaining offices? Yes, that's a plan to upgrade the currency counters that we have in the other offices. And when is that going to happen? Uh, we're working on that, and we're hoping to get approvals on that uh, in the near future. Okay, because that's DGS approval? That would require mm -hmm. DGS approval. And um, the other five cash counters, um, are they like dumb machines? They're not connected to our system, right? in terms of being able to count and then, um, you know, connecting to our system, it's still that hand counting machine, right? Yes, it's a, a, a three-step process. Uh, it's software capable. Uh, it can hook up to 
the network, and uh, but uh, some of the features that we looked at, uh, we're not certain that it's advantageous at this point to utilize those. Uh, but it does have enhanced features in terms of, of course, technology improves over time. Um, obviously, it has better counterfeit detection. It counts faster, and also it's uh, multi-pocket or two-pocket design, which uh, significantly speeds the accounting because uh, typically the money that we take oftentimes is crumpled or maybe sticky and when we run it through our existing Smells old better. currency <laughs> counters <laughs> uh, that uh, machine could jam and then since it's only a single uh, you know tray that we have to r keep on running it until we get the count uh, for the full batch that we run whereas the newer currency counters since they have multiple trays or two trays, it can still continue on by rejecting the one bill that is causing the problem and then stacking the bills that have been counted uh, uh, for the count. Okay, so when I um, went and saw a, a demo, mm -hmm. um, it seemed like it was a three-step process. So the cash comes in, it's counted, um, the uh, cashier has to do it twice, Mm -hmm. and then they have to log it on to another piece of paper by hand, and then they have to type the deposit slip on a typewriter and then put it in the safe. Um, I just think there's probably technology out there that could um, speed up and make the process more efficient instead of having you know three different processes and, and handwritten, um, there's a lot of room for mistake uh, when that happens. Um, so as you're looking for, you know, systems, I think there are some out there that could probably do everything more quickly, efficiently, and not have to rely on somebody's handwritten um, recording. Uh, also, um, to answer, you know, I, I know the Assembly and the Senate has asked whether all of our offices, district offices, is accepting cash. And are they or not? Uh, right now, the, no, that's not the case. That uh, we have uh, several offices that don't, uh, are, are applying the uh, hardship exemption uh, on a safety basis. They feel that their facility is not, uh, you know, conducive to accepting uh, cash safely at their facility and they're exercising uh, the d discretion to uh, uh, you know, uh, not accept the cash at that facility. Well, I think this is going to continue to be an issue uh, mm -hmm. with the legislature. That's one thing that they keep asking. Why is it that there is unequal uh, tax administration you know, in our different offices? And clearly this is one of the most glaring ones that they can point to. So. Um, Yes, no. that, that, yes, that is a uh, issue that uh, you know, I do want to try to uh, address. I think by finding some of these other alternatives in order to allow for a more safer, more secure way of uh, accepting uh, the cash that those district offices uh, would utilize those options and uh, allow that uh, process to be uh, uh, taken. Also, we're looking at other uh, options in the future, trying to find more partners and uh, also trying to find uh, external uh, cash acceptance sites that uh, would provide the hardened, physical, secure uh, places that uh, you know can be uh, conducive to balancing the taxpayers' needs as well as their safety and as well as the safety to the uh, public and our employees. Okay, Member Brenner. Yeah, um, back following back on Member Ma's questions on a couple of those areas. Um, the hardship issues. Have have you reviewed those hardship issues in those in those offices? Well, the ones where they uh, have forwarded to me, where they've uh, contemplated denying them. Yes, I have been reviewing them. And you're in agreement with those that those are not acceptable places. Sometimes uh, yes, sometimes no. I mean, well, uh, when you disagree with them, can they still do the hardship? Uh, you mean uh, if I disagree with them? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, would tell them, and I'll explain the reasoning and. You know, they would see uh, the, uh, you know, if we agree on the rationale, then they would uh, reverse their original recommendation and they would uh, go and accept the cash. So right now, are there offices in every district that are a that is able to take cash? I have 
in er in in all the not all offices. Is there an office in every district that's able to take cash? Uh, I believe there is an office in every district uh, uh, area. That so now that yeah. right now, because right. that to me that I, listen, I get the fact that there's different levels of security and different role, you know, mm -hmm. different, and and I, and I get that. Um, but at the same time, you know, I have difficulty knowing that a lot of the offices are a lot the same, and mm -hmm. so the the idea that like a whole host of offices wouldn't be acceptable when mm -hmm. similar offices in other places are acceptable. Mm -hmm. I'm concerned about a consistent state, statewide policy that deals with that issue. Mm -hmm. So to me, I see you as the guardian of that policy. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the fact is that then when there's a hardship denial, then my understanding is that hardship denial is reviewed by you mm -hmm. in order to ensure that we have a consistent application of the hardship policies throughout the state when it comes to this issue. Is that mm -hmm. fair? I would say that's fair. Okay. Uh, yeah. I mean, um, the only thing that I have is that uh, for the administrators that make these decisions in terms of their safety and the safety of the office and the public that they serve at those locations, I mean, I do uh, want to respect uh, their uh, ability to uh, make those type of decisions because I know- Do you believe it it's okay to have some offices that are almost identical, feel like their employees are safe and other employees aren't safe even though the offices are identical? That's a good policy? Well, I don't know if we can say that every office nearly is, identical. Yeah, nearly identical, but they serve different clientele. They may have uh, different staff perceptions. I mean, I know when we look at safety. I mean, sometimes it's very clear that uh, I can look at a situation and everybody would look at it, and the consensus would be that it's a safe situation or another situation. So right now, you if right. you if you get a denial for hardship or you uh -huh. get a hardship, you review it. Correct. You don't make an independent decision as to whether or not there's a hardship there that would require there isn't that the hardship doesn't ra that the that the I don't know, the access to the office doesn't raise to the level to where um, you would not believe that that hardship is needed and that the cast should be taken there. And if the administrator believes that to be. I would find it hard for me to superimpose my judgment over uh, what their concerns are. I do know certain facilities aren't, uh, you know, upgraded to our latest standards. I mean, they don't have bullet-resistant uh, walls or windows. I mean, is that the requirement? Uh, no, there's no requirement okay. uh, on there. I think uh, the the policy as it stands today is that the administrator has to evaluate that uh, from the context. I, I, I thought the policy was that you were to review them. Oh yeah, I do review them. Correct, right? But I, but yeah, it sounds like you just rubber stamp them to me. I think what he's mm, saying I, is I, he's not going to impose his judgment over the entire state as to whether each district administrators have a certain level of responsibility, and each district each each, each district has. Uh, and not just d not just board member district, but each district office has a different maybe clientele and assessment. And what I what I want. Well, hang on, I, this is my time, I, so let me finish. I know, but let me finish but my discussion minute, with I'm, him, and then you I'm, can take it I'm floor back. I'm interjecting. But I've got the floor because I am the chair, so I'm interjecting right here. What I what I want to say is that <laughs> in the in the well, I do. And I don't believe being and the chair lets you go ahead and inter interrupt. Yeah, it, it does because I, I think what I think what we're drilling down on is whether each and every office should be taking cash, and I will tell you why because I see. A, can, can I just uh, finish my uh, line of discussion, well, then you can come back to that? I really in, would like in, to in a moment if you could hold on. I see a legislative bill that says that so many have to be this way by this this time, and so many have to be this way by this time, and I think what needs to really be before the legislatures at the BOE is is administering the policy but not dictating to the board the issues until there's a full analysis of what we really want to do if large volumes are coming into the board. Um, so with that, I think it's, it's, and that's one of the reasons I wanted this to come forth because I did see this uh, legislative Senate Bill 148 that mandates uh, a certain it prescribes a solution for us and I think that our job is to be sure that we collect the tax and we do we implement the legislation the legislation is 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 in statute but to mandate how we're exactly to do that is probably a board uh, you know regulatory process that we need to have in place so 
I will be talking to the author and just be sure that everybody's kind of on board, so to speak, with, with the requirements that seem to be being imposed, because I don't think that's the intent. I think the intent is just to be sure we get the cash. So back to you, Member Runner. Thank you. And I'll go on record as I do believe the Chair's role is to make sure that discussion moves along, not necessarily cut members off. So um, let me go back to where I was. Um, it seems to be a bit of a concern when it is that we have then this unequal application of what, um, of what uh, you know, risk and um, dealing with cash payments um, in, in, in that way. Because, it, again, it, I, our, our job is to make sure that things are done fairly and as best as we can right even amongst the, amongst the, the state. Um, and the other, because part of the issue is, and I, I'll be real, be real specific, you have Office A who believes that this is not something that they should be doing for whatever reason. Guess what? They drive to my office. So, or they'll drive to Member Ma's offices. So, in essence, what we're doing is just shifting people around. And either, and, and in a lot of ways, making taxpayers drive a long ways seeking office to office. So it was my impression, quite frankly, with discussions with you, that you would be reviewing those and making a judgment on those, not just saying, well, I guess if that's what that administrator believes, I guess that's OK. So I'm disappointed that we don't have that kind of leadership and judgment in order to ensure that we have a fair treatment of both taxpayers and staff when it comes to the issue of collection of cash. Let me just, I'd, I'd like for you to re review real quickly for us because wh what are the protocols that are in place right now when indeed there is a cash payment coming in with uh, cannabis? Protocols right now? Right. Okay, the protocols right now is that uh, if a taxpayer wants to make a payment with cash, they are to request a hardship exemption. And the hardship exemption is reviewed by the district. No, no, no. I'm talking about when they do make it. I'm not, not, not talking about when indeed right. they come to an office to make a payment. Mm -hmm. what, are the, what are the protocols that are in place to ensure, to assist with, the, to, with safety and uh, protection of both other taxpayers and staff? What are the protocols that are in place that allows then the fact that there is some assurance that we understand that there could be risk here? Well, the protocols are that uh, they would make arrangements with the taxpayer to set up an appointment. Mm -hmm. the taxpayer would come in, uh, make sure that they're approved to uh, make a hardship uh, uh, exemption to uh, make that type of payment. Uh, they would come in, they would uh, take cash at the uh, cashiering window and uh, count the cash and issue them a receipt. And if that, uh, you know, would. Don't we have contracts with the CHP? We do have contracts okay, with the Okay, so CHP. that's another, again, I'm. Right. Oh, I'm okay, sorry. help me with yeah. all the protocols okay. for safety. Right. Okay. Well, they what else? What else do we do to ensure safety? Okay. We have uh, issued uh, private screens to the districts that have requested them. They have privacy screens so okay. that uh, they can shield the transaction from the uh, general taxpayers uh, sitting in the lobby to uh, minimize the visibility of that. Uh, we are trying to uh, see if we can't get our armored car contracts uh, modified so that we can have a earlier pickup to uh, sweep. Uh, you know, uh, to make sure that the cash is uh, picked up uh, that sa same day. Uh, we also have uh, a situation where we have the uh, now remote, uh, where we can do a field collect, uh, uh, accept cash as a payment taken as a field collection out in the field and to uh, work with, uh, uh, you know, a, 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 a uh, entities so that they can uh, make a deposit directly from the BOE that's employee that's accepted the cash into the state treasurer's account so that can be done at a remote uh, location and then also you know I would recommend to the offices that they mix that up uh, in, 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 uh, when they do these type of transactions so that there's no predictability in terms of uh, the uh, payments of cash because uh, and then also too we have protocols where we're trying to uh, ask the administrators and the district offices to make sure that when they make these appointments that they only allow uh, the staff that's on a need to know basis uh, to uh, be aware of those appointments and, and, payments. and again remind me how that CHP contract works 
Okay, that CHP contract is uh, a contract that allows when uh, the uh, district administrator uh, feels that uh, the presence of a California Highway Patrol officer is needed uh, for that. Their that they, discretion? Yeah, their discretion. They would call it in their physical security office, let them know. They, I believe that they have to let them know uh, about seven days in advance so that the CHP can uh, make arrangements to have an officer present uh, for the date and time requested. And right now, I think you said you could assure us that there were district off there were there were BOE offices in each district that were indeed kicking cash. Uh, well, it's just started, and I understand that uh, there is, I, and, and we do need to find and confirm uh, the uh, information. But uh, my understanding is yes, there is a D4 office that is now going to be using the. Uh, I, I didn't ask you in that specific well, district. Well, that's what I, you're talking about. Well, no, 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 I'm not. <laughs> um, just making sure that it's all districts. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh dear. So I just need to, I, I think that's going to be okay. important because I know that's a focus of some of the concern. Sure. Okay. And, and we need to get resolved that that's indeed the case. Thank you. Okay. It's, it's a concern to some people, but we do have an issue paper that was delivered to us with all alternatives. The board approved seeking all alternatives. And now all of a sudden, this is why I called this meeting, because all of a sudden all, all our turn alternatives don't seem to be pleasing certain members. We do have options. We set up off site locations there's there's a variety of things you can do in an area where perhaps um, it's just not as comfortable and so I, I do really feel like we're, we don't want to get away from the all options just because somebody uh, simply wants to impose their will statewide I think that we can work with all options and um, very happy to work with all options because each each is different each level of cash and also if this thing goes when it goes uh, recreational I'm very concerned that the amounts will come in in more volumes and I think that's been the point we I think you know most states have an off-site facility somewhere that they go that's you know fully secure and everything and California just to put everything in the district offices may or may not be the appropriate solution so um, that's why we've asked for all of these things and to be sure that the taxpayers are safe and the uh, Board of Equalization members are safe and that the neighborhood. I've also, I'm, I also have concerns for potential lease violations for, you know, increasing risks and other things. Um, there's just certain things you can do in a lease building and in a, in a state-owned building that you can't do in a leased facility um, necessarily, uh, you know. So I think we have to consider all of those, all of those options. And just to um, clarify, I'm not, so my, my issue is not that we make every office take cash. That's not my concern. My, my concern okay. isn't even that a whole district may not even have district offices that take cash. My concern is that they in, within, within close proximity to taxpayers, that they have access to be able to deliver their tax. That's right. my concern. And, and so my concern is if all, some of the alternatives don't work, that may have that may force us to that point, to where it is that we have to look hard at what happens in every, in, right. in each office. And and I I think I think you know working uh, collectively with FTB would might be a real benefit too because then they can collect their income tax while we're collecting the taxes. I mean you know there's there's all sorts of arrangements and I do believe that it's you know we're going to have counties involved we're going to have cities involved and so it may be that we do a collaborative effort. We do have a. 2018 deadline it's kind of a drop dead date that we need to we need to be sure we have enough in place uh, that we can facilitate and I think that's understood by all but I think there always also is a push to make everything uniform and California is definitely not uniform I can, I can go up to any of your districts and see a totally different environment and different different set uh, set of issues and and clientele so I, that's that's my point is that California is not one size fits all I think we can have a lot of options and be sure that we reward people accordingly for the risk they're taking and uh, so member Horton uh, <coughs> thank you madam chair I mean members when we refer to the legislature uh, members are carrying a bill uh, this bill hasn't gone through the legislative process yeah, we need to talk yet um, and and I think it's important that everyone engage in the legislative process. But I also think it's important that we take a step back. And uh, maybe we put the cart before the horse. 
um, given that in 2018, what we see now will increase 100 fold. Um, and so uh, there may be some wisdom in actually contracting someone other than BOE employees to take a look at the security measures that need to be in place and then put them in place throughout the entire state put the security measures in place throughout things, but have the expert come in and share. An expert that has dealt with uh, a criminal industry that is trying to convert into a legal operation. Um, I mean, our investigators tell us horror stories about this industry and other industries and what happened. I mean, they tell us stories about employees being kidnapped and then forced to go in to release the cash at their home. You know, and so the other thing is, I, I, maybe we ought to take a look at our MOU to see if we are modifying the duties of our employees to, a, to an extent that we need to renegotiate that agreement to make sure that we are in compliance uh, with the agreement that we've entered into with our employees uh, and, and uh, take a, a, a real serious look at this, but if we go back and standardize everything, make sure that every office, whether they're accepting cash or not, make sure they have all the security elements in place. I mean, they can certainly call the Highway Patrol, but you know, they get there a little late. Uh, this will be the most at-risk, the Board of Equalization will be the most at-risk facility in California as far as exposure to criminal activity. Banks don't have the same exposure because, you know, you can't take that kind of money to a bank. Uh, the maximum they can accept, you know, with money laundering laws applies to them. Board of Equalization will have more risk than any other facility in the world. I appreciate the facility is secure. I get that. Uh, and I don't think every facility is secure the same, and we may need to do that. I think Mr. Runner has a good point. Rely on the expert, then do what we need to do. but. My concern is with the employees. I don't think they signed up for this. I mean, if I was a TT1 and you're telling me I have to interface with folks that are walking in here with guns on bringing bags of money from a criminal, potentially criminal operation, I don't think I signed up for that. I don't know that I feel secure to do that. I mean, it's kind of like the general telling the, the kids they need to go to war when they're not prepared to do it themselves. You know, and I'm, I'm going to be clear. I'm not prepared to deal with this criminal operation, and I'm not prepared to delegate that anyone does. Now, to the extent that the agency wants to delegate that employees have to do this, we want to mandate that, they have to do this, then maybe we ought to indemnify them Maybe we ought to sign something, uh, have them sign something that they do this at their own risk. Because if something happens to them, and we've told them that they had to put themselves at danger, uh, and clearly this is a danger. Uh, they put, we've told them this, the agency. You got to put yourself at danger and, and interface and collect this tax, you know, and do this. Uh, I don't know if we have exposure or not, but. Maybe it's time to go back and do a real comprehensive analysis to determine what we need to do in order to accommodate the taxpayers. We've got taxpayers out there uh, who can't, don't have banking accounts. They need to be able to pay their taxes. We need to be able to help facilitate that. We also have taxpayers in this industry who have found a way to come up with negotiable instruments, and they are processing it with negotiable in in instruments. So it's not every one of them. They figured it out on their own how to accomplish this objective. Uh, but for me, and just in closing, Madam Chair, if you will, um, protect the employees, make it standard throughout the agency, where the agency has determined that there is a level of risk, make it optional, compensate those who are willing to take the risk to the same extent that you would compensate a police officer or anyone else who's willing to take the, take the risk. Give them extra, uh, extra re the police retirement. 
you know, what is it, police retirement uh, benefits. Anyone that wants to do this, they should be in that category. They get the police retirement benefits. They can retire early, get 3%, and so forth and so on. I honestly don't know, but I would really like to have some experts come back and, and tell us how to deal with this. And I'm, you know, to, 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 to all the employees in the state of California, this, I'm not dictating that you put your life at risk. Uh, I'm not going to do that. This is an agency call. If the agency wants to do that, it's on them. Thank you. Any other comment? Okay. I think Chairwoman Harkey, we do have a speaker for this item. Yes, we do. We do have a speaker. I just, I just wanted to say that I think all the comments have been very good, and this is why I brought this forward because it's there's a lot of rumor and innuendo, and I think B. B BOE tends to exist in the whisper mill. And I, I, I'd like everyone to know that you've got options. We did approve a, a, an issue paper uh, brought to the board where we said, go look at all options. And I think one of the problems we have is when somebody decides they don't like that, they change it, and then the staff is left with very little guidance. And I think we will all want you to pursue all of these options. I think they're all good. And as, as we get into really, if we do get into really large amounts um, of coming through the doors uh, for whatever reason, I think it's very good to look at off-site facilities that are fully secure, armed, 24-7, uh, you know, and and in fact prepared, like Colorado has one, like other states have. You know, this is not this is not funny. It's all cash. It's all cash. And so whenever there's all cash, there's there's just inherent risks. And I think we need to be prepared. Um, tax collections are great, but not at the expense of people and communities. You know, in being in danger. Um, Madam is Chair, there just anything a quick else policy, if I may. Yeah. Uh, I, I think it's important that we begin. I, I know we, uh, the board asked, and I know I asked uh, maybe a few months ago, uh, to do a, a, a cost analysis. What is it going to cost us in order to establish ourselves in such a way that every office can have, uh, can, can accept the cash from uh, these taxpayers? Uh, what is it going to cost? Uh, personnel, uh, insurance, bonding, all of that. I mean, I hear conversations about 17 facilities. Uh, that All that equates to, to, to money mm -hmm. and someone signing off on it. And uh, the last I heard, the legislature uh, denied the BCP just asking for 44 positions to regulate this industry. So um, we probably should should to do a cost benefit analysis starting with an expert to tell us the extent uh, working with the unions to figure out the compensation and the risk and so forth if they come out and say they well we're willing if the, if the union comes comes out and say we're willing to put our employees at risk I doubt that but if that happens uh, or they say risk compensation we need to measure this and um, and report to the legislature I mean it's their call yeah, you know. I, I think I think what we what I'd like to see come out of this is that we do do a full analysis that we send out for hey. some kind of analysis as to what we need to establish that. I know we did an informal issue paper. My staff did a lot of work, um, and because it requested positions, um, it kind of got tanked. But it did a full analysis of what's going on in other states and what they do, and actually got. The Santa Ana facility costed out, which was 300000 which we thought was a great idea, but now there's other issues with that facility. So um, if we could actually get somebody to, to figure something out as to what, what the actual cost would be, assuming there's going to be, I mean, a few duffel bags coming in. <laughs> Any, I don't know how else to say that. But in any event, members, thank you so much for the discussion. I really do appreciate all the input. Um, that's why I brought it forward. I just didn't want things to be out there in the open. I think we've got a lot of considerations. I want to be sure we get it done before 18, at least at least a real plan in place. Uh, it seems like you're on, on several footings, which is good. But if we get huge dumps of cash, we'll need to do probably a little bit more, which is why I'm thinking a couple to three off-site facilities would really be good for those extra large amounts that are coming in on a regular basis. Um, you know, I'm just saying, and, and the, the, tr the controllers got into the kiosks and things, and maybe that all works together. Okay, we do have, do you have anything else to say? I'm sorry. 
No, Mr. That, Mr. Thank, thank you very I'm much. Sure. Thank I mean, you. Um, we've got a highway patrolman here, and ain't no money coming in here. Okay. Uh, with a gun. <laughs> No money's coming in here. Maybe we ought to put one at every facility as well. Thank you, sir, for okay. your service. Okay, we have, we have one request to speak. Regina Johnson, thank you so much for your patience. I saw you sitting back there on that bus. I figured it's got to be her. Okay. Would you state your name and your title and who you're representing? Yes, I will. Can you hear me? Oh, good afternoon, Chair and BOE members. My name is Regina Johnson and I'm here on behalf of SEIU 1000 and um, we represent over 96,000 public employees across California including the Board of Equalization. Uh, we are here in support of the policy allowing BOE to collect uh, cash payments. Uh, BOE has in the past and history accepted cash payments. Uh, so we all are aware of that at this time. So SEIU believe that the BOE must evaluate the appropriate levels of resources to collect cash payments. And this includes the appropriate staffing and appropriate levels of staffing. We also would like for the evaluation of uh, safety concerns to be addressed and also additionally offices additional offices that are located with accessibility to our taxpayers especially in Northern California uh, I've uh, said I was here and I listened to everything that was going on and I just want to say uh, we do have some concerns as SEIU 1000 members, but again, I just want to reiterate that we are here to support the policies allowing BOE to collect cash payment. At this time, I'd like to thank you for your time. Thank you very much for coming forward. Really do appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Stay engaged and help us through this. Yes, I see. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Okay. Thanks a lot. That was a good discussion. Thank you, members. Um, Ms. Richmond, next item. Our next item for today is item F, public hearings. Item F1, property taxes. State Assessee's presentation on the valuation of state assessed properties. And we do have a speaker for this item. have a speaker oh we do okay thank you all right good um, oh, I'm sorry go on that's okay uh, mr. Peter Michaels do you want to just come to the podium thank you, thank you. okay thank you sir mr. Reisinger uh, good afternoon chairwoman and board members I'm Dick Reisinger of the state assessed properties division and this is the second opportunity under board rules for state assessees and other interested parties to present and comments in a public forum uh, relative to state assessment for 2017 and I'm here to uh, address any comments and answer any questions thank you very much um, are you giving your presentation do you have any presentation no we okay well then that's bad on my notes <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> mr. Michaels Thank you. Yes, um, my name is Peter Michaels, and I'm here today briefly uh, to um, anticipate the value setting session next month, a um, month from now, May 24th, I think it is, in Sacramento. I'm here today on behalf of 37 state assessees, local phone companies, long distance phone companies, wireless phone companies, gas and electric utilities independent merchant uh, power production facilities, uh, pipeline, natural uh, gas and petroleum pipeline companies, and railroads. And we have been working now for a couple of months um, on a almost daily basis with Mr. Reisinger and his staff. I've met a number of times with Mr. Reisinger and his staff. I will be meeting uh, 
next week again with Mr. Reisinger and his staff, or with his staff. Uh, and generally speaking, I think uh, uh, everything's gone very smoothly, and I'm grateful for their staff's uh, accessibility and um, uh, responsiveness uh, and uh, accommodations. Um, my uh, expectation is that for the most part, I mentioned 37 state assessees, I think for the most part, with maybe one or two exceptions, uh, there will be uh, a common ground that we will have reached between the staff and board as to what the value roughly should be that's recommended to the board for approval next month. So I think we're uh, getting extremely good service and uh, um, you have a very high level, skill level, skill set level in, on your staff Mr. who report to Mr. Reisinger. So I'm grateful for that and want to take advantage of this opportunity. We only get two a year to, um, I guess, maybe only for, for a, a compliment Mr. Reisinger and his staff, but also um, alert you that once the recommendations do come out in a couple of weeks, it's possible that we may have some follow-up uh, questions or concerns with one or two of the recommendations. Thank you very much. Yes, in uh, probably about May 12th is when we will distribute to all the board members all of our the appraisal information, summaries of each industry, and the uh, we call them the ADRs, the, uh, which for each individual of the 400 assessees. So that information will be, that's what we do every year, and that's, we'll do that again this year. Okay, thank you. Board members, any comments, questions? Okay, received and filed. All right. Thank All you. Right. Thanks for having us. Uh-huh. Okay, Ms. Richmond, will you please introduce the next item? Our next item is item G, Tax Program non appearance Matters Consent. Item G1 are the legal appeals matters. These matters may be taken in one vote. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay, second. moved. Okay, moved by Member Horton, seconded by Member Ma. Um, no objection. Such will be the order. Our next item is G2, Franchise and Income Tax Matters. Sub item 9 has been pulled. Okay, is there a motion? We can take all these in one. So moved, yes. noting uh, sub item being pulled. Okay. Second. Motion by Member Horton, second by Ms. Stowers. No objection, such will be the order. Next item. Our next item is item H, Tax Program Non Appearance Matters Adjudicatory. Item H1, Legal Appeals Matters. We only have one sub item. Mr. Angija. <coughs> this is the Section 40 summary decision. Uh, that the board heard on January 24th and unanimously decided. Thank you. Is there a motion for this? Move to adopt the summary decision. Second. Thank you. Moved by Ms. Stowers, second by Member Horton to adopt the summary decision. Any objection? Such will be the order. Next item. Our next item is H2, Franchise and Income Tax Matters. There is only one sub item. Okay. Is anyone? Mr. Epelite? Ambrose. Mr. Ambrose. Ambrose. Um, Sorry. The <laughs> <laughs> Bad <It's all> right. <laughs> script. <laughs> I, I, we, they confuse us all the time. Um, apparently, the, the, this was pulled from the calendar and um, there was contact, so that's why it's on the adjudicatory calendar. Okay. Is there a. Is there any member wishing to. or I guess, is there a motion? Move to adopt staff recommendation. Second. Ms. Stowers moves to adopt staff recommendation. Uh, Mr. Horton uh, seconds. Any objection? Such will be the order. Ms. Richmond, next. Our next item is item I, tax program not appearance matters. Item I2, offer and compromise recommendations. These items may be adopted in one vote. Members, any motion? Move to adopt. Okay. Member Runner uh, moves to adopt. Uh, Member Horton seconds. No objection. Such will be the order. Our next matter um, is the administrative session. Item N is the consent agenda. Um, item N1, we have retirement resolutions for Keith Christensen. 
Katherine Gonzalez, Tony Hernandez, and Deborah Self. All right. Okay. The first one, uh, Mr. Christensen, I believe that's I for you, that. Mr. Runner. Yep. yep. Keith Christensen retired on December 30th, 2016, after 21 years of state service. He began his career with BOE in 1995 as a BTR in the Sacramento District Office and was promoted to an AGPA in 1999. He moved to the Environmental Fees Section in 2000, became a supervisor in 2006, and then retired as a BTA-1 in, in the Collections and Section of Business Tax and Fee Department. And we want to congratulate Keith and thank him for his service to the board and have a great retirement. Thank you very much. It's on the agenda somewhere. Okay. Um, I have Catherine Gonzalez. Catherine Gonzalez is a business tax compliance specialist in the Riverside District Office, retired on April 14, 2017, after 37 years of state service. Kathy began her career with the State Board of Equalization in February 1980 as an office assistant in the BOE's Old Downey District Office. During her career with the BOE, Kathy advanced to multiple positions. In 1981, she was pro promoted to Program Assistant 1. In 1983, she promoted to pro Program Technician 2. And in 1989, she was promoted to Program Technician 3. Kathy then transferred to the Riverside District Office in September of 1991. In May of 1993, she, pr she promoted a business taxes representative. Lastly, in January 2013, Kathy was promoted to position of business taxes compliance specialist. In her retirement, Kathy is looking forward to spending more time with her family, especially her darling granddaughter, Charlotte Rose. <laughs> what a cute name. The board wishes Kathy a long and healthy retirement and thanks her for her service. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I have the honor of um, acknowledging Deborah South, Legal Secretary, uh, <coughs> Litigation Division in the Legal Department, will <coughs> retire on May 2nd, 2017, after 31 years of state service. Deborah began her career with the Secretary of State in June of 1984 as an office assistant to typing and transferred to the Board of Equalization in 1987 with the Property Tax Division Department. Deborah earned an appointment to the position of office technician in the Property Tax Department of the Board of Equalization in February of 1989 to May of 1990. Deborah went on to excel in the State Assessor's Property Tax Division in the position of Tax Tech 2 in May of 1990, then to the position of Tax Technician 3 in February of 1999. Deborah to the promoted to the Legal Secretary in 2001 with the Board of Equalization's Legal Department. She has done an exceptional job for the people of the State of California. We thank you for your service. and. Um, Wish you uh, a fabulous retirement. Thank you. And I have Tony Hernandez, Associate Business Management Analyst in the Administration's Department's Facility Services Unit, who will retire on July 31st, 2017, after over 28 years of state service. <laughs> Tony began his career with the Department of General Services in June of 1989 as a custodian. He was promoted to the positions of building maintenance worker in January 1995 maintenance mechanic in May 1996, stationary engineer apprentice in January 2000, and stationary engineer in January 2004. Tony was then promoted to the position of associate business management analyst in June 2006 by the administrative support division, business services unit, and then transferred to the board of equalizations, business management division, headquarters, facility services unit in May of 2012. Congratulations, wishing you a great retirement. Thank you. Well, best wishes to Keith Christensen, Catherine Gonzalez, Tony Hernandez, and Deborah Self for a long and happy retirement. Thank you for your service. Ms. Richmond, next. Item N2 is approval of the board meeting minutes for the March 28, 29, 2017 meeting. Item N3, proposed revisions to compliance policy and procedures manual chapters two, registration and seven collections and audit manual chapter four, general audit procedures and these items may be adopted in one vote. Is there a motion? Move adoption. 
Thank you. Member Second. Runner. Member Runner moves adoption. Member Ma uh, seconds. Any objection? Such will be the order. <coughs> okay, the next item. Item O is we'll be taking that up tomorrow. Okay. So our next item is item P, other administrative matters. Item P3 is the business tax and fee deputy director's report. Item P31 is the approval of fiscal year 2017-18 tobacco products tax rate. Good evening, Chairwoman Harkey and members. My name is Sandy Barrow. I'm with the Business Tax and Fee Department's Program and Administration Branch. I'm here today to present the proposed tobacco products tax rate for fiscal year 2017-18. The board's required to set the tobacco products tax rate each year pursuant to Section 3123 of the Revenue and Taxation Code. The rate is designed to be equivalent to the tax on cigarettes. To calculate the rate in accordance with statute, it is necessary to determine the wholesale cost of cigarettes as of March 1st and the tax imposed by California per single cigarette. The proposed tax rate, the proposed rate has been calculated using the prescribed methods in its staff recommendation that the fiscal year 2017-18 um, tobacco products rate be set at 65.08%. The proposed rate is a significant increase as a result of the passage of Proposition 56. The calculation was based upon the wholesale premium brand cigarette price as of March 1, 2017, as published by the Tobacco Merchants Association. The proposed rate, if adopted, will be effective July 1, 2017, and will remain in effect for the fiscal year 2017 and 18. I request your approval of the proposed tobacco products tax rate, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Move approval. Is there a second? Second. Sure. Okay. Um, member Horton moves approval. Uh, member uh, Runner moves second. Any objection? Such will be the order. Thank you. Thank you. I don't think we have a lot of choice in that one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, Ms. Richmond, the next item. Our next item is P7, Technology, De Technology Deputy Director's Report. Item P71 is the cross project update. Good afternoon, honorable members. I am Scott Capalong, Acting Chief Information Officer and Deputy Director for the Technology Services Department. Ms. Suzanne Bueller, Deputy Director of the Bus Business Tax and Fee Department, and I are currently serving as the leadership team for the, t the, for the CROSS project in the interim of hiring the next project director. I appreciate the opportunity to provide this month's update on our project. I'm pleased to report that the project remains on schedule and under budget. We continue to partner with the Department of Technology's independent project oversight team to refine and add details within the project schedule as well as incorporate updates to our governance plans. This month, we brought on board our independent verification and validation consultants. This team complements our independent project oversight team and provides another la independent layer of quality assurance that will look at the resources, processes, and technology for the project. They will also identify any risks and improvements needed to make the project successful. Since last month's update, the project has been very busy with activities in support of Rollout 2, sales tax, and related program functionality. Over 240 design sessions have already been conducted with our subject matter experts covering all functional areas of our new system. This includes registration, tax return and payment processing, e-services, revenue accounting, audit, compliance, appeals, and refunds. During these sessions, subject matter experts from throughout the BOE provide the business requirements for new and improved processes to administer tax programs. For example, taxpayers will have the capability to view online all correspondence that was sent to them. As requested at last month's board meeting, we will provide a presentation of the benefits-based compensation model with our next project update. Through the month of March 2017, our project budget status is as follows. For the current month through March 2017, we are 94% expended. Year to date, we are 50% expended. And project to date, 80% expended. 
That concludes this month's report. I am prepared to respond to any questions you may have. Thank you. Yes, Member Ma. Thank you, Mr. Capelong. Um, yes. I understand from the Department of Technology that you and Suzanne are doing a yeoman's job in uh, keeping the ship rolling, uh, so to speak, but um, they really implored us at the board to um, you know, make permanent um, these acting positions that, you know, you guys are doing a great job, but, um, you know, you can only do so much unless um, we make some decisions in terms of leadership at, uh, over this project. And so I appreciate um, that the project is still under budget, you know, on time, um, but the board is uh, going to, um, you know, make sure that we establish permanent leadership moving forward so that the project can continue um, as it has been. But um, I appreciate uh, you doing a great job. You got great reviews from everyone, so I just wanted to thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and we will be working with them to identify some of those qualities traits for the project director so that we can move forward with um, getting the new project director on board. Thank you. Any other comments? No, thank you very much. Okay. Um, Okay, I think we are at the end of my notebook. We are done for the day. We are finished, so we will uh, recess until tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. Same place, same time, different cast of characters. Thank you.